the October 8th, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Um, before I ask the clerk to call roll, I just want to announce that Supervisor Friend will be appearing uh, remotely under the just cause exception. And so with that, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Supervisor Friend? Here. Supervisor Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. I'd like to see if there's any supervisor who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence. Seeing none, just understanding that yesterday was the uh, one year since the attack on, on uh, Israel, I'd like to dedicate the moment of silence to the people whose lives were lost in that and to all the people whose lives were lost in the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. You'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, the God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to ask the CAO if there's any late additions, uh, additions or deletions to the agenda today. Yes, uh, Chair Cummings and members of the board, there are uh, a few changes on the regular agenda item number 11. There's additional materials. Uh, there's an additional material titled CAO Memo Financial Impact of Filtered Tobacco Ban, insert after page 143. On the consent agenda item number 29, there's additional material. There's revised memo packet page 271, which is replaced recommended actions ready number to correct accidental duplication instances. That concludes the corrections. Is there any board member that would like to pull an item from consent and move it to the regular agenda? Seeing none, um, we're gonna move into public comment. Before we go into public comment, I'm gonna make a quick announcement. Um, public comments an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that are not on the agenda or to address us on items that are on the consent agenda or the regular agenda. But note that if you speak at this time on an item that's on the regular agenda, you will not be able to speak later. So if there's folks here who want to speak, the tobacco waste item will be heard at times certain of 10 a.m. And so if you'd like to speak to that item and you can stay, I would recommend waiting until after the presentation when we open up for public comment on that item. If you're unable to stay for the presentation on that item, now would be the time to speak to us on that item. And so with that, um, I'll open it up to public comment. And so um, first person. Good morning. Before I identify myself, I have three points of order. The first being about our First Amendment rights, and that's freedom of speech. I think everyone should be accountable for what they say and what they do and what they write. But I'd like some kind of commentary. Either you, Justin Cummins, or you, the county attorney, Jason Heath, as far as when that has been questioned. And I'm recalling something that happened in November of 2019, where I had said something unknowing that I couldn't use a four-letter word, and then Drew Glover asked the city attorney, Tony Condotti, this should not be coming out of my time, I called a point of order, asked the city attorney if people can actually use a four-letter word if they want to, and I believe well, from what Tony Condotti said, and I listened to this yesterday, you were in the room, because you were a city council member at the time, the people can say what they want. The people should be accountable for what they say and what they do and what they write. And I'll skip my second point of order and go to the third. I'd like to know what it actually means for just cause exemption because Zach Friend is not appearing here in public. I'm waiting for a response. I called a point of order. We'll get back to your we'll response to your questions at the end of the okay. communications. Thank you. Then can I start my two minutes then? You're already a minute into your time. Oh, that is bullshit, dude. You are full of shit. So I called a point of order. Excuse me. I'd like to just acknowledge that there are people of all ages here and we're trying to be respectful to everybody who has a yeah. here. So I'm listening to you. We have this thing called a U.S. Declaration of Independence. We have three different constitutions, sir, and I'm using that lightly. I don't know what you identify as. 
So right now, currently, with the Hurricane Helena, there have been at least six county sheriffs that have been forming militias. Six out of over 3,100 county sheriffs. What are our sheriffs doing? And I, I disrespectfully, what you just you, did sir. was bullshit. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lizette Gonzalez. I'm a health program specialist with the County of Santa Cruz Public Health Division. I am part of the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. We work out of the, we work with the California Department of Public Health. And in October, we will be recognizing National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. This will take place October 20th through October 26th. And in order to help bring awareness towards National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, we would like to speak upon our proclamation for the Women, Infant, and Children Program of Santa Cruz County. And so I have here Dana Wagner and Colleen Wajowski with me. And this proclamation is going to recognize the staff of Santa Cruz County's Women, Infant, and Children Program for the contributions they've made to the County of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, whereas Santa Cruz County Women, Infant, and Children Program have worked tirelessly to continue and ensure access to healthy, affordable, and nutritious food for pregnant and postpartum individuals and children under five. And whereas women, infant, and children have created a shadow box display regarding lead poisoning in their Watsonville facility, Breezeway. And whereas women, infant, and children have involved the Santa Cruz County Public Health Division's Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program in outreach of Events such as their breastfeeding and chest feeding walks. Good morning, Primavera Hernandez, Health Services Manager of the Children and Family Health Branch of County Public Health. This is the branch of the Public Health Division that houses our California Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. I will continue reading the proclamation. Whereas Dana Wagner, Colleen Wysocki and other staff members have aided with putting on lead-focused bilingual parent classes at both their Watsonville and Santa Cruz locations. And whereas women, infant, and children staff continue to expand their knowledge on lead poisoning and educate their clients on nutritious foods to help lower lead poisoning risk. And whereas it, women, infant, and children continue to actively partner with the Santa Cruz County Public Health Division's California Lead Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program to reduce the incidence of lead poisoning within Santa Cruz County. And whereas October 20 through 26 is National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week 2024, with the theme of bright futures begin lead free, because we all want bright futures for our children and communities bringing awareness to and preventing childhood lead exposure. Therefore, Thank you, Justin Cummings, Chair of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, hereby honor and recognize the staff of the Women, Infant, and Children Program for their dedicated service on behalf of the County of Santa Cruz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the amazing work you all do for our community. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Dana Wagner, Director of WIC, and on behalf of the WIC program and Colleen Wysocki, Director of our uh, Nutrition Education Programs, we're very grateful for this honor, um, very appreciative of the proclamation, and grateful for the collaboration that we have with the county. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Board of Supervisors, and Madam Secretary. My name is Charlie Walker II. I'm a proud SEIU 2015 member, and I'm a Region 3 Regional Vice President. The county settled a contract with SEIU 521 county workers at 11%. It seems like the board isn't confused about what the constituents need to live in Santa Cruz County. We are aware that we are not currently county staff and that our proposal demonstrates that. We're asking an additional 25 cents. We want to remind you that whatever is spent of the, with the state, the state and federal matches that. Santa Cruz is leaving money on the table. And I say it again, Santa Cruz is leaving money on the table. The county saying no, and that is irresponsible. That is not acceptable. I'm truly, I have truly said it before, and I'll say it again. We deserve more in 24. We deserve more in 24. Thank you. 
excuse me, I'm going to ask you all, please, you can use the spirit hands, but especially because we're going to be having some uh, differences in opinion in the conversation as the meeting goes forward. Please make sure that you don't cheer or clap or boo. We want to be respectful of everyone's opinion here. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Linda Mills. I am a care provider of IHSS. I know what I'm about to say. You have heard it a thousand times. You know already that our paycheck is not enough to live on. It has to be a better way to fit our needs and concerns into your budget so we all can live without living from paycheck to paycheck. I do not want to feel like voting for this election is a waste of my time. All I'm asking is please consider our concerns so that we can have a decent salary to live on. Thank you. Hey, good morning, board. Um, Liam McLaughlin with SKU 521, political organizer. Wanted to say first, um, just appreciate your time and efforts uh, working with our membership to secure a really good contract that's going to recruit and retain um, county employees. Uh, they need it and appreciate your work on that, um, getting there together. Um, now uh, we're here in solidarity with SEIU 2015. They are also an essential part of um, our, our social safety net system. Um, without them, uh, our workers struggle. Without us, their workers struggle. We're, we're, we're part of the same force, part of the same effort. Um, so we're here in, in strong solidarity with SEIU 2015. Uh, please get them the contract that they deserve as well. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings, fellow board members, Rebecca Hurley, Deputy Director of County Parks. I wanted to make a quick comment on item number 29, an acceptance of the funds for the grant awarded by the Coastal Conservancy to County Parks for the planning component of the Greyhound Rock Low Cost Accommodations and Education Center um, project. With the support of this board, especially Chair Cummings and his staff, we have been able to and will continue to uh, successfully work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on this project and upon the completion of the planning component and subsequent construction of the project in low cost cabins and education program, it will provide more equitable access to the beautiful North Coast for all community members. So again, I just wanted to thank this board and I look forward to continuing to come back to the board and report on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board. My name is Scott Bender. Thank you for your time. Can you please speak into the microphone. I am here today uh, to help represent the group that is trying to uh, have a ban on single-use uh, tobacco cigarettes. Um, wasn't planning on speaking today. Uh, I'm a local business owner. Uh, have a family of two small kids in the public schools here, and um, I have to leave before this meeting concludes. So that's why I'm speaking right now. Um, my concern here is that uh, tobacco, uh, mainly single-use cigarette filters, uh, don't biodegrade. They end up on our streets, as I'm sure you're aware. They end up in our ocean and our marine sanctuary. Um, my kids and I, we go and we do um, beach cleanups a lot of the time. We find just amazing amounts of these things. I have to explain to them what they are, why smoking is not good. Personal decisions of mine, of course. But um, I think we have a rare opportunity here to set a precedent and to send a message uh, that Santa Cruz is more about the environment, about families, about having fun than it is about uh, litter and about uh, potentially destroying our um, natural beauty, our marine sanctuary. And um, we have a chance here to send a message to the children, not only just to the adults of the surrounding communities, that um, we care more about the environment than we do about big tobacco. I think that's important. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. I'm Don Adams. I'm a smoker and a plumber. I uh, plumb some of your houses. Nonetheless, number three, tobacco defines us. It doesn't. I mean, the carbon footprint of the surfboards they brought here has more global warming than like a thousand packs of tobacco. So I don't even know what they're talking about. And then like the other day on my boat, I was sailing and smoking. I dropped a cigarette, jumped in the water to grab the cigarette butt. So sea strolls can float. 
Thank you. Yeah. All right, is there anyone else here in chambers who'd like to speak to us on the item that's not on the agenda, that's on consent, or that's a regular agenda item? Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's anybody online who would like to speak to us today. Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Chris, your microphone is now available. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings, Honorable Supervisors. I'm Chris Berry, um, member of the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission. I just wanted to draw your attention to the letter from the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission in the written correspondence regarding the significant tree ordinance. Um, as you likely know, the significant tree ordinance does not currently protect most big trees in the county. It only is effective in the coastal zone. Um, big trees are important for habitat, carbon sequestration, and aesthetics, obviously. Um, the, the Fish and Wildlife Commission has been discussing this issue for several years. Most recently, we brought in Rich Sampson from CAL FIRE, who expressed support for expanding the significant tree ordinance outside the coastal zone, provided there's some exceptions for hazard trees, uh, trees close to houses and whatnot. Um, and with that, I'll just keep it short and try to draw your attention to that letter in the written correspondence and hope that you will consider expanding the scope of the significant tree ordinance outside the coastal zone sometime in the near future. Thank you. Caller 1628, your microphone is now available. Caller 1628, your microphone is now available. And just a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute. Caller 2000, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, and yes, we all want a healthy future for our children. I consider myself a truth teller, and there's a book here that helps do that called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canarod, who spoke at your last board meeting, and you were rudely cut him off in mid-sentence. This section is called A Brief History of Polio, page 281. Historically, the polio virus was a benign condition that was rarely associated with paralysis. This started to change in the late 1800s and moving into the 1900s when polio epidemics became prevalent during the period of industrialization. Industrial and agricultural pollution followed as a result of the innovation of pesticides that were freely used on crops and livestock in an attempt to get rid of insect-borne diseases of various kinds. One of the first polio epidemics occurred in Sweden in 1887 after the invention of DDT in 1874, used alongside with arsenic and other poisons. Epidemics occurred in areas of the world where pesticides were widely used. With the introduction of DDT in the Philippines, for example, the first polio epidemic in the tropics took place in the 1940s. The National Institute of Health showed that DDT damaged the spinal cord as did polio. However, DDT was later portrayed as harmless to humans, just as the spraying of crops and animals and even on children at play. This was based on the false assumption that polio was spread by airborne insects like flies and that DDT Thank you, Ms. would Garrett. eliminate these. Tim, your microphone is now available. Hello, thank you so much for allowing me to speak again. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, so anyways, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things here, a variety of things. Free speech, uh, it's wonderful. 
just watching everybody here in Santa Cruz and your meetings and everything, you know, people that disagree with each other and so on and so forth. Um, what you have is something that's very special and that's not happening all around the country. Just wanted to say, and it's certainly not happening around the world. Okay. So a few little things here, Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. Okay. It all goes together. And notice how all of those countries have small populations and the entities that are attacking them or thinking about attacking them, uh, their populations are rather large, okay? So it's the, the majority against the minority. And if you lose any one of them, what we're talking about here is Pacific trade, Atlantic trade, and the Middle East. If you lose any of them, our whole country is going to go down the drain, all right? It's all about the golden rule. It's about money and our way of life, okay? So think about all that. In regards to tobacco, well, shucks. I'm for selling it to our adversaries, not to the American people. That's kind of how I feel about it. And in regard, regards to viruses, keep in mind that smallpox only exists from what I understand, in two labs in the world, in a Russian lab and in an American lab. If that ever gets out, all this vaccine conspiracy stuff, it's going to hurt us a whole lot if people don't go out and get the smallpox vaccine in such an emergency. Okay? So remember that. Anyways, you folks have a fine day. Thank you so much. William, your microphone is now available. Hi, everyone. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Uh, my name is William Raveau, and I work for the Sierra Club. And I'm here to just share some facts on the effects of cigarette waste on the state of California. Um, cigarette butts continue to be the number one trash item found on beaches and roadsides, representing 34% of the total trash items collected in California. Over 4.5 trillion cigarette butts are littered each year and are made from a non-biodegradable single-use plastic called cellulose acetate. The global weight of discarded cigarette butts is around uh, 680,000 metric tons. Cigarette butts and e-cigarette butts, or e-cigarettes, have also been linked to costly destructive structural fires and wildfires that threaten both wildlife and communities. Cigarette butts may release toxic chemicals such as nicotine, formaldehyde, acetone, benzene into the environment, as well as heavy metals, including arsenic, lead, and cadmium. And in Santa Cruz County, those are even areas like your marine protected areas. Uh, toxic chemicals and tobacco waste threaten our precious aquatic ecosystems and are toxic to freshwater and saltwater organisms. Uh, children, pets, and wildlife are often affected by these discarded cigarette butts. Santa Cruz County has been given the opportunity to have an impact on these negative effects and create long lasting change for the health of its natural environment and community and will hopefully um, inspire the communities surrounding it and throughout the state of California. Thank you so much for your time. I hope everybody has a great day. Caller 1628, your microphone is now available. Yeah, good morning. My name is Richard Buckingham. I am what you might call an anti-vaxxer, and I'd like to read a few paragraphs from a book by a local author, Leon Canero. Uh, Sir, can you speak a little louder? We can barely hear you. Oh, yes. I would like to, I'm an anti-vaxxer, and I would like to read uh, from a book by a local author, Leon Canero, about so what some of the ingredients in, in uh, vaccines are. The book is called The Untruth, Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines. Okay, vaccine ingredients, aluminum. Aluminum is a heavy metal used in vaccines that has been linked to symptoms associated with inflammation of the brain, autoimmune disorders, and neurological diseases, including chronic fatigue, dementia, autism, macrophagic myositis, I can't even pronounce it, Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's disease, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. That's, that's one ingredient. Another ingredient is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a human carcinogen that poses a significant danger to human health because of its toxicity and volatility, according to the U.S. National 
toxicology program. In vaccines, it is used as a preservative. Uh, thimerosal, also known as ethyl mercury. Ethyl mercury is a toxic heavy metal that is 49.55% mercury by weight and is considered the second most poisonous element on Earth after the radioactive element uranium and its derivatives. Uh, another ingredient, uh, neomycin and streptomycin are antibiotics used in vaccines to prevent the growth of bacteria. This is uh, just to say it's it, it a form of preservative. Monosodium glutamate, another neurotoxin that can cause damage to nerve cells and contribute to seizures. MSG is found in yeast extracts used in vaccines as has been integrated in disorders such as migraine, headaches, asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, seizures, anaphylactic shock, Alzheimer's, and Lou Gehrig's disease. Thank you so much, sir. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. It looks like there may be some people who want to speak. I'll just note that if you speak to an item on the regular agenda, you can't come back and speak to it again later. So if you if you want to speak now, go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity for public uh, feedback. I'm also going to speak on uh, topic number 11 about the tobacco ban. So my name is Emma, and I've lived in Santa Cruz for the last 16 years. Um, I know some of you through my role as program director at Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship, where I've been the past decade. But today I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Coastal Watershed Council, where I serve as access director. And locally, I'm also on the Chief of Police's Advisory Committee and the California State Parks Outdoor Recreation Program Board and a lot of other local uh, community roles that give me a deep understanding and appreciation for our region and its future. So I know a lot of people have already shared and are going to share um, data and statistics on this topic. We know how serious it is and we know the complex challenges that it creates. So instead of repeating what's already been said or what's gonna be said, I'm gonna offer my personal perspective. Um, many of us in this room and across Santa Cruz, I think share a couple of common values. And one is uh, our love for our natural spaces and our commitment to protecting them. And in my personal life, when I'm faced with decisions, I often ask myself a guiding question. Does this diminish me or empower me? And in my role at Santa Cruz Trails and a lot of the other organizations I work, I have the privilege and responsibility to ask this question um, when facing my community. Does this diminish or empower my community? Does it diminish or empower the environment? Does it diminish or empower the great work already being done by nonprofits, agencies, and our citizens? So when it comes to the issue of single-use to tobacco products, I believe the answer is really clear. On behalf of the Coastal Watershed Council, we fully support the ban. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I am also here. I have to get to work, so I'm going to make, uh, make this quick. Um, just in the 20 minutes that um, I parked and spent 20 minutes uh, picking up cigarette butts right here in your parking lot, I found 100 cigarette butts in 20 minutes. So compound that a little bit and you can kind of see how big this problem is. So little, little things creating a massive problem. Um, I also founded the magazine Santa Cruz Waves and all the businesses that um, chose to do business here in Santa Cruz was because of the beauty, because of the natural wonders, um, because of the health. And uh, slowly but surely, these little things are diminishing that. Um, so this this is an issue that we can really stand up to big tobacco and we can continue to um, create a, a, a sanctuary for the people that live here, um, for the animals that live here that don't have a voice, uh, the birds that think these are food, um, and for our pets, right? So um, these are little toxic time bombs, and, um, you know, they will, if we don't do anything about it, they will, uh, they could 
really uh, diminish our amazing communities. So it's not just for the natural environment. It is also for the businesses, the visitors, the tourists, and the people living here. So please consider um, making making this ban a, a reality. Thank you. Um, thanks for your time. My name is Maya, um, and I'm on the west side in Santa Cruz. And yeah, just echoing what ever, a lot of other folks are saying, um, supporting the ban, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, I work for the California Native Plant Society, and we're all about um, restoring nature in California and the built environment and little things that we do make a big impact. And yeah, reducing um, single-use uh, cigarette filters is one really pivotal way to make that happen. Um, and yeah, I walk my dog every morning and I see all the cigarette butts and I think just this is a u unique opportunity to make a really big change in our um, built environment and the ecosystem surrounding us. So thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Austin O'Brien. I'm a community member, local entrepreneur, surfer, enjoyer of nature. Um, I think one of the Santa Cruz greatest assets is our beaches and our natural environments um, and I support the ban on single-use uh, tobacco filters. Um, I think that uh, that is pretty simple. Uh, you know, people come here and spend their money, enjoy the beaches because we have this beautiful place that we live in. So let's not ruin it. Thanks. Good morning. I stand before you not just as a voice myself, but uh, well, first of all, my name is Providence, and I'm part of the the union of local SEIU 2015. And as a member of the union, I want to speak for myself, but I also want to speak for all the caregivers who tirelessly dedicate their lives to providing comfort, support, and compassion to those in need. Today, we must have an honest conversation about respect. Respect for our roles, our contribution, and yes, respect for our work through appropriate compensation. Every day, we witness the fractures of our broken medical care system. We see how it operates under our premise without where profit often trumps over people, where the focus is less on care and more on the bottom line. As caregivers, we've often been left to navigate the landscape with insufficient tools and resources. We rely on the supplies that are of the lowest quality simply because that is what the healthcare system deems acceptable. But let me tell you, this is not acceptable. We're expected to provide the best care possible, often using, using inadequate supplies and more shocking, we frequently find ourselves reaching into our own pockets to make that happen. It's disheartening and frankly disrespectful. We shouldn't have to dip into our personal finances to ensure that our loved ones receive the quality of care that they deserve. This practice is not just a personal burden, but it reflects the systematic failure that are being forced to carry on our backs. Moreover, our dedication and commitment should not be measured solely on our willingness to sacrifice our own financial well-being. It's time that this community recognizes the gravity of the work that we do. Our roles are challenging, demanding, and indispensable. And yet, we stand in a situation where our compensation does not even begin to reflect the value that we bring to the table. I would, if I was a negotiator, call for a $25 an hour at least. But this isn't just a number. It's a reasonable demand that acknowledges the physical, emotional, and mental toll of our work that it takes on us. Yeah. This wage will enable us to continue supporting our loved ones without fear of financial ruin. Again, two minutes. My time is up. Yeah. Oh man. Sorry. I go two minutes. Should I? Can I get in line again so I can finish? You can. You can hand to somebody. Only one. Colleagues, thing. but you only get to speak once. Oh, we appreciate it. I put a mask on, maybe. You know, <laughs> put another name. All right. I appreciate you guys' time. Appreciate you too. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have yeah. a good day. Hello. Good morning. My name is Willem Banks. I'm here to support the ban on single-use cigarette butts. I've grown up in Santa Cruz my whole life and I've always noticed the irresponsible use of cigarette users. The useless and pointless cigarette butts being discarded with no remorse or thought as to where the, the litter will end up 
Santa Cruz is ahead of the curve, and we are lucky that we are having this conversation about banning the use of butts. It doesn't end with harming yourself when smoking. Butts litter our town, costing money to clean up, money that could be used for a better cause. Butts break down into microplastics, which end up in our water table and in our food chain. You saw in the multiple beautiful crafts that Taylor Lane and Ben Judkins created just how many cigarette butts can be found by a cause trying to spread awareness about the devastation this litter can bring to our environment and to our wildlife. It's an, it's an incredible that we've made it this far, so let's see what it means for Santa Cruz and for the rest of the nation if we start the trend of banning the butts. As you saw in one of Taylor and Ben's videos, cigarette filters are pointless and play and a ploy into thinking you're minimizing the impact on your health. This is not true and has been another facade that big tobacco has planted in American minds. If people want to smoke cigarettes, they should get back to their roots and roll their own filter lists. Have a good day. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much. I'm here today to advocate to the board to ban the sale of filtered tobacco products. My name is Stephanie Brown Liu, and I am a resident of Santa Cruz County and a mother to young children. And it is appalling to know that a visit to any one of our beautiful beaches, parks, trails, or even just a regular sidewalk can find these cigarette butts littered everywhere. And not only my infant mistakes them as some little treasure, but so many animals do as well. It is my understanding that filters do not provide any significant health benefits and can leach harmful chemicals. And so it's not helping anyone. I also, as a nonprofit executive, just participated in the arduous and disempowering process of applying for core funding, where over 75 nonprofit organizations submitted so many proposals to figure out how to split up a mere three million something dollars when over two million dollars are going to the mitigation and the cleanup of these filter of the filtered cigarette butts. I'm greatly appreciative of the innovative retail bans like this one that can have a potential to make lasting positive impacts. And not only would this help move our county forward, but it would really embrace equity and action as stewards of our lands and oceans. I urge you to vote yes and to approve this ban as a step forward for progress. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Leticia Rocha and I'm a resident of Watsonville and a registered voter. I'm here as a mom and also as part of the positive discipline program to voice my support in banning cigarette butts. It's disgusting and I know we can do more. Just walking over here, you can see them littered in the sidewalks and along the drain and just know this is poisoning our community and our oceans. Our voice matters, our children matter, our oceans matter. Uh, thank you for listening and voting to ban these butts. Morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. I have to tell you, you are lucky to have reserved parking over on the side. There are people out there now still circling, and um, it's it's getting very difficult for the people to come here and do the people's business. So I don't know what's the cause of this congestion in the parking lot. If it's courts, please, if it is, please work with the courts to uh, come up with a solution because many times I have had to just forego coming and doing business here. And there are people that I'm sure would like to speak to you this morning, but simply cannot find a spot. The parking extension uh, machine has been broken for over a year. And uh, there's no way for people to really have an effective solution for parking now and avoid getting a ticket. Um, what I want to say is that the city of Watsonville is looking at, they're having a community meeting um, tomorrow at one o'clock to look at the revision of their uh, general, their general plan, EIR. It will promote closing the crosswind runway of the Air Watsonville airport. I want to propose to you that this valuable resource in emergencies, the Watsonville Airport, benefits the entire county. It should be the entire county that helps pay for it and maintain it. And we should not do anything to restrict its use in emergencies, such as closing the crosswind runway, 
because we saw in the 1989 earthquake, in the Loma Prieta, in the uh, CZU fire, in the floods that, that that damaged our county and isolated us, this airport is critical to keep open. So please send your uh, comments and I tomorrow uh, the EIR comments close on October 15th. We must keep the Watsonville Airport open and we all should be supporting it Thank you. financially. Thank you. Hi, Mary Lou Sams Wiley for um, South County. I agree for keeping that crosswind um, runway open. It's needed, it's necessary, because once something goes down all these roads, we have no way for any of the other vehicles to come in. Someone comment, oh, there's an airport over in Salinas or Marin. If there's a problem with the roadways, you can't come in. Also, uh, building on the Buena Vista for the housing, I know we need to put uh, make more housing, and ultimately we're gonna look like San Francisco, multi-story buildings and ad infinitum it's just going to happen but my concern being over there buena vista is a narrow road technically all county roads are supposed to be at minimum 40 feet wide people are building into the right of way so there's no parking so that has to be mitigated i take my life in my hands making a left hand turn off buena vista to go down i'm um, excuse me left hand turn from trading to go down buena vista it's a blind turn we've gone in with a, a uh, additional additional money with the neighbors to try and clear out so we can have a better uh, side of view and stuff. But people come flying up that road and honking their horns like I'm in the wrong. It's like, nope, there's a left-hand turn lane. But also in the rural areas in and around La Selva, Rio Del Mar, every place else, because people are moving their little uh, planter boxes and everything else into the roadway, there is no public parking. And I would request that you have the county... Um, building department limit the amount of driveway space per parcel to no more than 40% because if people keep putting in wider, wider, calling it their driveway, it limits the on-street parking. There's nothing out there. It's it's a challenge. I've, I've been ticketed by the Highway Patrol because a neighbor has their two-car uh, garage and then put in another spot that's technically too close to the garage. And I was able to speak with Officer Guerrero and say, have a handicap and try to park over here and the with the um plants and bamboo everything else that's clogging up the roadway there's no on-street parking he ultimately took it away thank and you, said ma'am. don't park there again thank you good morning chair cummings and fellow supervisors i'm elizabeth bird i'm a senior human services analyst with the Human Services Department Adult and Long-Term Care Division. We would like to extend our gratitude to the Board of Supervisors for supporting the proclamation on Ageism Awareness Day on October 9th. This initiative aims to highlight the impact of ageism in our society and to promote a positive reframe of aging within our communities. This, this effort aligns with the work with our work as an AARP age-friendly community and in conjunction with AgeWell Santa Cruz County, which is our county's um, initiative moving forward, the governor's master plan on aging. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Supervisor Friend and McPherson for their commitment to these important initiatives. Thank you so much. Thank you. So any other member of the public would like to speak to us on items that are on consent but are not on the agenda, regular agenda items that you can't stay for? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board um, for any comments, questions on uh, the consent agenda. And I, I did, yeah, so I'll just start, I guess, with Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. Uh, one on uh, item number 30, the Geological Hazards Directive. Uh, thank the OR3 for bringing this recommendation to the board. Um, I appreciate OR3's partnership uh, in 2021 when the board created this opportunity for C CZU fire survivors uh, to rebuild without investigating uh, geological ha hazards uh, should they choose to do so. Um, it was a hard one fight uh, to get that done, but I'm glad we're able to support our community by offering some flexibility in these very difficult times. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd just like to say the public comments now have been closed. So they're closed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, supervisor, actually, I'll go to Supervisor Friend online. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really briefly, I'd just like to um, congratulate you on the work on Greyhound Rock on item 29. I mean, that's a really wonderful item coming forward from both uh, previously Supervisor Coonerty and then your team's work to see that all the way through here is pretty remarkable. And just congratulate, uh, or not congratulate, but just thank Public Works for their continued work on all the storm damage repairs. There's multiple items on here showing both uh, Supervisor McPherson's comments regarding the CZ rebuild, but in particular on the storm damage repairs, we have multiple items just showing the continued amount of work that they're doing, which is uh, pretty remarkable for our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On, on item 20, I want to thank Suzanne Dottie for volunteering for the Women's Commission and uh, also encourage my colleagues to appoint folks to the Women's Commission so that they can meet and have a, have a quorum. Um, on item 29, accepting uh, the, the grant and revenue in the amount of 865000 from the California Coastal Conservancy for Greyhound Rock, I also want to uh, congratulate the chair and the Parks Department for this fantastic award. Uh, I think it's really going to um, be a fantastic uh, demonstration project of how we can provide low-cost accommodations and an incredible educational facility uh, on this property. So thanks and really looking forward to seeing where that goes. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. Well, first, I would like to thank all the folks that came out from IH, all the yeah, IHSS workers that came out and made their voices heard. Uh, second, item 21, I'd like to thank Lowell Hurst for taking the, the position as alternate member for the RTC. It's a ardu arduous uh, task that he's taking on, so I want to thank him for his commitment. And that's it. <laughs> Um, just a quick question, a comment that was brought during um, public comment regarding the just cause exception for, super, for supervisors to participate remotely. I'm just wondering if you can just give a little background on that, given that Supervisor Friend is, is participating remotely today. Well, there's a, there's a couple of exceptions that allow supervisors um, to appear remotely. One is a just cause exception and one is an emergency exception. Um, Supervisor Friend is appearing under the just cause exception. Folks have an opportunity to appear twice a year remotely under the just cause exception. Thank you. And then um, just a couple comments. Just want to uh, um, acknowledge the $233,000 grant that's going to uh, Community Action Board for the Immigrantes Juntos y Conectados program. Just really glad to see that we're investing in South County and continuing to invest in, in low income communities of color. And then um, also, just want to extend my appreciation out to um, the Parks Department with their ongoing hard work to try to get funding um, to secure the Greyhound Rock property. And also want to thank staff for working with uh, the Coastal Commission and the City of Santa Cruz um, because um, with the Cruise Hotel not providing all of their low-cost accommodation on site, we were actually able to get a $5 million in lieu fee to help uh, provide provide the cost for constructing this this um, this project. And so it's just great to see that we're bringing in the resources necessary to make sure that these opportunities to get young people and low income people out to the coast are really coming forward. So just want to thank everybody for their support and look forward to working with the Parks Department to get this project moving forward. And so with that, um, seeing no further questions or comments on the consent item, I'll turn it to the clerk or actually I'll turn it to the board for a motion. I'll move the consent agenda. And so a motion by Supervisor Koenig, second by Supervisor McPherson. I'll turn to a clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. I just have a question for County Council. I guess we should probably take a 10-minute break since we have a time certain out of 10 a.m. Yes, you can do that if you'd like, or you can uh, take item seven. If item seven is going to be a short item, I'm not sure about how long staff expects that to take, but you could go ahead and take a 10 minute break if you'd like. Take seven. Okay, we can go ahead and take item seven. I guess then. Uh, good morning, uh, Fernanda Diaz-Pini, Policy Planner with Community Development and Infrastructure Department. Uh, 
Um, our Kim Lee Horn consultants are also here with me today. Michael Schmidt is with us in person, and Anais Schenk is joining us remotely. Today we will be providing an update on the preliminary final report on the establishment of a Regional Vehicles Miles Traveled, or VMT, mitigation program for Santa Cruz County and the four cities. The development of this program is being funded through a Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant, which was sought in partnership with the City of Watsonville and the RTC, and which this board authorized staff to accept 300, uh, 3,000, I'm sorry, 3,900, oh, I can't say, accept a grant uh, funds in 2021. Due to the nature of VMT and VMT mitigation, the program lends itself to regional and cross-jurisdictional cross approach. To this end, today's presentation is part of a project's outreach effort to obtain and incorporate input on the proposed program for, from the Board of Supervisors, the cities of Capitola, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, and Watsonville, as well as from the um, Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. On September 24th, we made a similar presentation to the City of Santa Cruz uh, City Council, and we are working on providing similar informational presentations to the other city councils as well as the RTC. Um, today's presentation is for informational purposes only and no action is required. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Mike and Anais, who will be giving you a presentation on the report. Sorry. Good morning, Chair Board. Um, my name is Michael Schmidt. I'm with Kimberly Horn and Associates. Um, briefly, in the next few minutes, I'm going to cover the following items. I'm going to talk a little bit about BMT and SB 743, so just a little bit of a refresher. Then I'm going to talk about the background to this project. I'm going to talk a little bit about fee-based mitigation, so this is a new approach. To get close to the microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Close. My apologies. Uh, again, so in the next few minutes, what I'm going to cover is an overview of BMT and SB 743. I'm going to talk a little bit about the project background. I'm going to talk a little bit about different strategies that we've developed to essentially mitigate SB 743 in a different way than we've had in the past. And then we'll close out with findings and some recommendations about a project administration as well as next steps. Thank you. So VMT SB 743 is a CEQA specific change to how we evaluate transportation significant impacts. Um, previously, we used level of service, which was basically a qualitative effect on how drivers experienced the system. Um, in essence, SB 743 changed the way we look at um, transportation impacts and seeks to promote sustainability and greenhouse gas reductions by promoting denser infill development, reducing single occupancy vehicles, and improving mass transit. The most recent guidance on how to implement um, SB 743 was prepared by the Office of Planning and Research um, in 2018. And vehicle miles traveled is the specific metric. And if you kind of look over, if your eye kind of gravitates over to the moment to that image, it's pretty simple. Four vehicles, they travel some distance, we multiply that together, and that becomes vehicle miles traveled. Next slide. So how does this work with a simple example, like a land use project? So I've got an example here just to give you a flavor of what that looks like. This is imagining a residential project is being evaluated. So the idea is we take the trips that a, a residence would make over the course of a day. And obviously this wouldn't be for a single house. We'd be looking at a larger development project. So we look at the trips to school, the trips to shopping, uh, the trips to work, multiplying those together, and essentially dividing through by the number of people. And that is, we compare that to a threshold, and that's how we make a significant determination under CEQA now. And I should point out that each of the county and the cities have their own thresholds that are based on the math of their area. Excellent. So this project um, really is that the genesis for it was the idea that we really didn't have enough tools in the toolbox to mitigate vehicle miles traveled. Uh, with level of service, we kind of knew how to do that. Um, to date, we really haven't had as many solutions, so this is an effort to find new ways to do that. Um, currently, a lot of projects don't move be forward because of uncertainty, and obviously that has implications from an economic development plan standpoint, and it as well exasperates the housing crisis. Um, as Fernanda said, the county applied for a grant with Watsonville and Santa Cruz County and the Regional Transportation Commission. 
Um, and that was the paid, what paid to get the stay, study underway. <clears throat> the study is essentially to develop a recommended framework for a regional VMT mitigation program. So it's to study the feasibility and make recommendations. Um, and the benefits of this program include providing certainty for development projects, providing funding for VMT reducing projects, and providing consistency and nexus for mitigation and just creating less uh, uncertainty. Next slide. So this illustration kind of shows you, well, how does a BMT bank work, which is the recommended current recommended framework? The idea is we'd take projects like a bicycle project, pedestrian transit projects. These are things that reduce vehicle miles travel. They get people out of their cars. So the idea is we would take those projects together and essentially determine how many vehicle miles traveled it reduces. We determine the cost and we basically monetize this. You can kind of see if your eye kind of gravitates to the left, we have $1,000 per VMT. The idea is a development project or a project that needed mitigation. So you'd, you'd need to be in need of mitigation. It wouldn't be just because you did a project. It'd be because you have a significant impact, could buy these credits and essentially mitigate their project from a transportation standpoint. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of different types of mitigation measures or projects that can be in a bank that can essentially be for basis for that mitigation. That includes pedestrian, bike, transit, um, ITS, mobility hubs, affordable housing, which is, you know, the governor recently put a, a statement forward on the idea of help having that to help mitigate impacts related to the state highway system, then full carpool. So a variety of different types of mitigation measures can be funded through this pro program. Um, part of what we also established as part of the uh, feasibility study is a series of rankings because we recognize there could be the opportunity to fund many different solutions. And so we recognize that we needed to essentially create a set of criteria or a framework for decision making. And this list kind of highlights many of those aspects that would be used potentially to decide, well, which project would we fund if we had money coming in as a mitigation source? Um, it includes things like the price of BMT mitigation, um, the reliability of the funding sources, the ability to do this in a timely fashion, which is required under mitigation. And then there's also consideration about the geographic distribution of projects, how this would affect equity, and how these different mitigation measures or solutions would align with existing things like general plans or other community values. Um, next slide. So just want to highlight that we had that we talked to multiple agencies as we formed this pro initial project list and that included the uh, so, you know in different sources of documents which included many agencies and many of their active transportation plans the regional transportation plan had conversations with Santa Cruz Metro UCSC um, affordable housing representatives and climate and adaptation plan was also considered so there was a comprehensive look at different solutions that could be funded through this program um, so finally, the findings from the uh, feasibility study are that it's see, with the recommendation is that VMT banking would be the most appropriate initial program. There was also a recommendation for a kind of a ceiling in terms of how much would be spent on those VMT credits or how much someone would have to purchase those VMT credits for to be participate in the program. Um, I do want to point out that the level of program funding is unknown. So there's a sense of we don't know how many project applicants or, or projects that are in need of mitigation would participate. So there is an emphasis on picking projects that are cost less and are perhaps smaller, easier to implement. So we wouldn't have a challenge where we had very large projects that needs a lot of money over a long time to implement. Um, the preliminary final report is complete and it's uh, accessible to, for review. Uh, I also wanna make a point that not every project will still be able to be uh, fully mitigated, even if they participate in this solution. Um, this isn't necessarily a panacea for SB 743. It's just a new tool in the toolbox, a new solution to give folks choice in terms of how they might do that. Um, and it, you know, again, you know, this the regional means the the county and the cities. Um, there's optional for lead agencies to participate. It's an optional program as well, and there are others like Caltrans and UCSCS may ultimately participate. Um, just quickly about. A recommendation about how this program would be administered because obviously there needs to be some type of governance um, and administration in terms of technical requirements. Uh, RTC would be seen to oversee the program. Um, we're exploring the idea of a joint powers authority to legalize the fund funding and essentially the flow of, of money. Um, this and also there's some we're still giving some thought and taking input on how that governance would look, but it would probably rely on something similar with reliance on the ITAC or other existing uh, platforms. 
And then just finally, you know, part of the reason the RTC was a natural to potentially help manage the program is they, that they, they, they would already have the technical ability of manages, managing these types of programs. And the just as an aside, you know, the annual administration from these projects could actually pay the, for the staff time that would require to administer this. Um, finally, the next steps. Um, we're planning to schedule a public outreach event, again, to get more input on the program development. Um, and then we'll finalize the recommended program document. And then we'll bring that back around to the councils and the boards for for more input and for consideration as to whether they want to participate in the program. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'd like to open up to the public to see if there's any questions or comments from public on this item. Yeah, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. It's quite interesting to listen to this propaganda, you know, all based on this control and Agenda 21, which clearly came into this county in 1993 through the SEEDS project and was rubber stamped in 1997. So this is just one of the 17 sustainability goals, you know. Uh, this board is operating on such fraud. I'm going to leave it at that and be polite. So, you know, the Hegelian dialect, people must first believe that they're not being manipulated in order to be manipulated effectively. This is just more of the, that propaganda, you know. People are focusing about climate change. I did take some notes on this. It's a very interesting subject to me about the deceptions going on that you have outside individuals coming in and providing propaganda. Right now, currently, the CO2 on the planet is about 400 parts per million. That's one part CO2 to 2,375 parts of other things. People want to grow food the most healthily and the fastest. They increase the CO2. We are almost at an extinction level. You know, there is no such thing as fossil fuels. John Rockefeller a bunch of other criminals in 1892 in Geneva created the scarcity and they called it fossil fuels. Oil is the second most plentiful fluid on the earth. It's created when in subduction zones. So this is just one of many interesting topics to comment on. And I want to say thank you, Justin, for at least addressing one of my point of orders. Thanks. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. I've been watching developments throughout the county uh, since the Aptos Village project got a rubber stamp approval without any uh, environmental impact report done. And at that time, uh, what was used to evaluate traffic impacts was the level of service A through F, I think. And um, that made sense. It, it wasn't always very well described, but level of service as it applies to the direct impacts of a development at the traveled intersections is a better way to evaluate the true impact of traffic on an area when there's a development proposed. Vehicle miles traveled is nebulous. And I remember being shocked uh, to read when the Kaiser medical facility was being proposed on SoCal Avenue Frontage Road, the vehicle miles traveled by that huge four-story uh, facility and four-story 700-car parking garage was that it would have a, a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. There's no bus service on SoCal Avenue frontage road and yet the vehicle miles traveled argument was proposed because somehow it was stated that it would reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled on SoCal Drive over on the other side of the freeway. It's this kind of smoke and mirrors, to be honest with you, that I I have a real problem with any vehicle mile travel analysis. It makes no sense. It's not verifiable. And now I'm hearing that it could be a regional uh, implication where you could buy credits. What real impact is that going to do? What real benefit is that going to be at these intersections that would be affected adversely by traffic? Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, any members of the public online would like to speak on this item? Yes, sure. We have callers. Sam, Samsung 3220, your microphone's now available. <laughs> Samsung T220, your microphone is now available. Samsung N98S6U, uh, your microphone is now available. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. Um, Marilyn Garrett, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you to Becky Steinbrunner. As I was listening to the presentation, I thought this sounds like a phony attempt to solve transportation problems. Yes, smoke and mirrors, and not looking at real problems like what are the impacts of development, like the Aptos Village Project, et cetera, what she illuminated. And I think of the film called Taken for a Ride about how General Motors Goodyear Tires ripped up good public transportation, uh, public transportation systems, destroyed the environment, put in the freeway system to benefit them and sell their cars and it goes on today with the freeway widening and the uh, destruction of the trees and the beauty of the uh, you know those trees funded by Caltrans uh, such such deception just like the radar speed signs when you could just have regular signs getting microwave radiation exposure with these signs all these supposedly to mitigate problems I think this is a, a waste of money a diversion from real problems that you're creating more of by your decisions um, I think this should be scrapped. It's just a delusion and kind of insulting to people's intelligence that this is going to solve any kind of problem. Vote no on this. Um, it, it's disgusting to me. Thank you. We have no further callers. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board then uh, for any comments on this item. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm very appreciative, really, of this report because I think more than we all know that more than half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, vehicle miles travel or MVT, VMT. Uh, and this data helps us uh, with the prioritization of projects to lower VMT. Uh, the data also helps us uh, to, to fine tune our strategies and operations long uh, plan objectives for the county's climate action plan. Um, I also want to say thank you to Metro. Uh, it's been in, on which board we many of us serve. Uh, they they've uh, they're continually improving their route structure so it, uh, it'll, it'll accommodate more people. Uh, they we have a bus on shoulder that's to come with the widening of Highway One. That's I believe the first of its kind in the state, uh, and also the light synchronization program that is uh, we're putting together and Metro is putting together so that we can have the bus transportation and. Uh, I think that will improve or reduce our vehicle miles traveled to offer more uh, priorities to people that would could uh, go on a bus. So thank you very much to Metro and thank you for bringing this plan to us. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I I, um, I do a lot of vehicles miles traveled to get here to this meeting. It took me like an hour and 14 minutes to get here this morning from South County to the meeting. And vice versa, getting home too takes me over an hour. So I appreciate, you know, this study and I, I look forward to seeing how ways that uh, communities can acquire funding to mitigate this as well. So thank you. Supervisor Koenig. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, start with a few questions. The first is, um, you know, the county already has transportation impact fees. Is this contemplated as an additional fee? Um, to clarify, it's only you'd only have to participate in this program if you were looking for a solution for mitigation. And you, you know, obviously you have other avenues to mitigate. You could use transportation demand measures on site, land use choices, mixed use projects. So there's other options available. And in fact, we encourage folks to go down those avenues first before they they move to this. But you wouldn't have to participate again unless you had a significant transportation impact. Okay. Um, and you said that probably this would not apply to single family homes or ADUs. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that. It depends on the size of the development. If it has, if it has an impact under CEQA, then it would be it, whether, right, right, regardless sorry. of the land use type, or even if it was a transportation project, it could be. This could be an avenue to mitigate. I see. Okay. Um, you know, a member of the public brought up the Kaiser project, which um, was demonstrated to have um, uh, actually net reduction in vehicle miles traveled because it was a specialty facility. Today, people have to travel over the hill uh, to receive specialty care, and this was going to provide a local option. And so my big question mark on this is most of the project we're seeing in this county are happening in our urban area. Uh, the state wanted it that way. It made sense to do it that way because we're, we're putting housing closer to services. Um, is, are, are, aren't those projects also going to show either very little VMT because the housing is located close to services or maybe even a reduction in VMT? Uh, again, and then, yes, just the short answer. But it, again, you know, it's, this would those projects wouldn't be asked to participate. If the Kaiser didn't have a significant impact, it wouldn't have bought, needed to buy VMT credits or participate in this type of program. It's only for projects that are perhaps in a more suburban context or a rural context that might want to go forward and need to find a way, an avenue to address their their impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, so if I understand correctly, uh, the with this bank, um, it basically could allow non-localized uh, transportation spending. So let's say a project is um, located on Green Valley Road, but this could pay for sidewalks in SoCal. That's that right? correct. Right. You potentially could. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's a great concept, um, and obviously we want to reduce VMT. I just don't see a whole lot of applicability for it because, as I said, most of the growth I'm seeing is in our urban area. It's either going to be very low VMT or VMT reducing. Um, and frankly, I'd want to see most of the transportation improvements done by those projects or in proximity to those projects anyway. I mean, we have, um, you know, wanting uh urban infrastructure in general in this county. And I, and really, I think we need pretty much every cent we can get uh, as far as transportation impact fees uh, to be applied in the immediate vicinity. Um, you know, maybe there'll be some use case for this in the future, but I'm just not seeing it screaming out uh, here presently. I mean, obviously I'm gonna vote for it because we got the money and, and you know, from the state and the project's moving forward. Um, you know, it's a, I, I'm sure this, Work could be useful in other counties. I'd just not seen a huge use for it here in ours. Thanks. Supervisor Fred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see the points that Supervisor Koenig is raising. I mean, ultimately, I think what's more important is what comes back in March. What's before stays really is an accept and file an initial part of the discussion. And the next board is going to have to figure what uh, when the proof's in the pudding about what this specifically will mean uh, moving forward. And so I see no issue with uh, obviously just moving it forward today just to uh, move toward that final report. But the final report is going to be something that the future boards are going to have to more seriously consider. Thank you. All right. Well, I just want to appreciate all the comments and the work that's been done on this so far. It's it's good to see the progress that's being made. And, Ultimately, we'll have a recommendation coming back to us in the future, but just want to appreciate um, all the work that you all are trying to do, you know, um, um, to really address what's a state mandate before us. And so I just want to appreciate your work. And with that, um, I guess the motion would be accept and file a report. And so I'll be looking to see if there's a board member that would like to make that motion. I'll, I'll make move the recommended action. Second. 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 I'll make the motion. Motion by Supervisor Hernandez, seconded by Supervisor Friend to move the recommended action. And so I'll take it to the clerk to for the roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. And with that, um, okay. we're going to move um, on to our next item, which is our time certain item. I just want to apologize that we went a little bit over. Um, This is item number 11, consider approving in concept an ordinance amending chapter 5.60, the Santa Cruz County Code 
regarding tobacco retailing, license to prohibit the sale of filtered tobacco products, approve an exemption to the California Environmental Quality Act, seek and take related actions. Um, this is a presentation that's going to be given by myself and Supervisor Koenig, but we will also be um, welcoming up Dr. Tom Novotny to provide comments, and we'll be um, inviting up uh, Tara Leonard from um, the Tobacco Education Coalition to provide feedback on public comments as well. And so with that, um, I think we have slides available and we will kick off the presentation. So um just want to thank everyone for coming. And as a reminder, um, we were tasked back in May of 2023 um, to form a subcommittee to address this item. And so next slide. And so this item has been brought before us uh, by members of the public because cigarette filters are the number one most lit item in our county and in the world. Um, they're plastic and they're toxic in multiple ways. Next slide. And when we find, when we look at the different types of plastic we're finding in, in our environment, we're finding them on our streets and our rivers and our roadways and on our beaches. Um, this is this, um, this data was provided from Save Our Shores, um, where they uh, categorized the different materials that they had been picking up their beach cleanups from 2013 to 2023. And during that time period, they collected almost half a million cigarette butts on beaches. Next slide. And uh, contrary to what most people think, um, you know, some folks even that we were speaking with as we were doing the outreach thought that cigarette butts were made of cotton or some kind of biodegradable material. But the reality is they're made of a form of plastic called cellulose acetate. And um, one thing that's really important also to know is that in a recent study um, looking at plastic found in the water column in Monterey Bay. They found plastic at every depth within the Monterey Bay area. And what we know is that as these plastics get into our environment, they're not biodegradable. They break down into smaller and smaller microplastics um, that accumulate in our environment. Next slide. And so it's not just the beaches where we find these plastics, these cigarette butts occurring. We know we find them in the streets, on our sidewalks, and when it rains, this means that they end up in our storm drains, they end up in our rivers, and ultimately they end up in our ocean. Next slide. And there's a lot of new research that's developing looking at microplastics and human health. Um, because while we find micro, we, while we're finding plastics in our environment, there's new data showing that we're finding microplastics within our bodies. Um, it's being found in bone marrow, brain tissue, joints, placenta, and associated with a host of negative impacts to human health. And so while we don't know extensively how much microplastics are affecting us, we're finding them in our bodies and it means that we need to do something um, so that we don't continue to get microplastics in ourselves. Next slide. And so when we think about cigarette butts, there's a lot of different chemicals that are inside these that we know are associated with toxicity, including ammonia, lead, acetone, cambium. And we know that as we try to keep these out of our bodies and out of our environment, it's really important that we're addressing this as a form of pollution. And at this point, I'd like to invite up Dr. Tom Novotny to um, speak to the next few slides. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings, and uh, the rest of the board for uh, allowing us to bring this uh, issue before you and to talk a little bit more about it in detail. Uh, I'm a family doctor and a public health physician and professor. I'm retired now, but I still work on this issue and have been working on this issue for the last 20 years, the intersection of environment and tobacco use, which is, of course, one of the major public health problems that we still have, even though here in California we've made significant progress. We're down below 10% uh, prevalence of smoking in adults, uh, which is just a significant uh, change since the 1960s. Uh, but we still have 12.5 billion cigarettes sold here in California every year. And that's a lot. Uh, there's 5.2 trillion across the globe, which is even a more uh, astonishing number. And a lot of those end up in the environment, along with other kinds of tobacco product waste, whether it's packaging or uh, the e-cigarette now. But the chief uh, issue is uh, the cigarette filter, because as the supervisor pointed out, it's made of plastic. The chemicals in cigarettes, there are 7,000 chemicals in tobacco products, 50 of them are carcinogens. Uh, they're, you know, uh, the, the attempt at uh, trying to get rid of these from uh, cigarettes and make it somewhat uh, less hazardous it goes back to the mid 1930s when the filter was first sort of conceived as a, a convenience for smokers and um, the next slide i think 
if you could uh, flip it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, which uh, we refer to as a filter fraud. Uh, because the evidence on the health consequences of smoking started to accumulate, uh, and since then, we certainly have seen that evidence bear out in terms of uh, uh, the uh, mortality due to uh, lung cancer, other cancers, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease. And uh, the filter was there to first keep bits of tobacco out of the smoker's mouth. And that, you know, it's probably still one of the major uh, uh, features for the filter. But at the same time, uh, the uh, industry realized that they needed to do something to assuage the concerns about the health consequences of smoking. The filter became a source for reducing tar and nicotine. It became really, you know, a, 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 almost like a contest to see who could make the least uh, tar containing or nicotine containing cigarettes. And uh, uh, that ended up being a fraudulent uh, claim that it really didn't matter about the tar and nicotine levels because the diseases continued to happen anyway. The filter wasn't doing any good. And what we've seen is that the risks for smoking have actually increased over the years, over the decades, that the filter has become predominant. 99.8% uh, of cigarettes sold in this country uh, have the cellular acetate filter. And so the risks have gone up, actually, because the filter has not changed the risk of smoking. It's made it easier to smoke. It's reassured smokers that they're, maybe they're doing something for it. And the word filter itself kind of brings that up. It's really an attachment. It's an add-on uh, to the cigarette. And it's something that uh, uh, is increasingly recognized, again, because of the plastics, as a single-use plastic, non-essential, and not something that we want to be contaminating uh, the environment. So the next slide, I think, might have a little more. We can flip it. Uh, and, it, you know, uh, as a public health physician, we want to look at, you know, anything that makes uh, smoking less hazardous. But this wasn't it. The National Cancer Institute back in 2001 actually published a big monograph and said, you know, uh, some of the early studies showed that the filter might have done some good. Well, the early studies uh, looked at cigarettes, but they weren't comparable. An unfiltered cigarette has more tobacco in it than a filtered cigarette. The, the, it's actually more economical for the industry to have a filtered cigarette. It's less expensive to have the filter than it is to have the tobacco at the same length of cigarette. And so um, there was other differences that weren't accommodated or weren't uh, considered in these earlier studies. And what we know now is that um, uh, the filter hasn't, again, reduced the risks of smoking. And in fact, there's a particular kind of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma, which lives in the periphery of the lungs. And the reason it's become more common, the incidence has increased, is because if inhaling against the filter means you inhale more deeply into the lungs, expose the periphery to the carcinogens, and it, therefore the cell type of adenocarcinoma is actually increased in incidence, whereas the previous common cell type, which is small cell has decreased. Now, it's true that our cancer rates are down. That's not because of the filter. It's because people have quit smoking. So what will, having, what will happen if we get rid of filters? Well, we've done a, a small study at uh, SDSU where we actually got smokers and compared their, um, uh, compared uh, those, who, these are committed smokers. Uh, we gave them uh, all the cigarettes that they wanted and tested what would happen uh, in terms of the change between a filter and unfiltered smoking. So we did this as a crossover study where they were exposed for a while, had a washout period, crossed back over, so they were their own controls. We found that they smoked fewer cigarettes per day uh, with unfiltered smoking. We also found that there was no difference in the excretion of cotinine, which is a measurement of nicotine, and also uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamine in their urine. Now, this is a very small study. You know, I can't really claim anything. But what we know is, again, <clears throat> epidemiologically, that the filter over the 60 years that has been there hasn't done a darn thing to protect the health of smokers. Now, what we do know now is that there are uh, uh, impacts on the environment. 
We don't know exactly how much of that, but what we do know in laboratory studies involving fish, microorganisms, worms, you, know, you name it, everything suffers as a result of the leachates, that is the filters sitting in the aquatic environment and being absorbed by these organisms and causing increased mortality and other kinds of uh, complications. We also know that these chemicals can enter the food chain, like mollusks and fish that can be consumed by humans. Now, we don't have widespread evidence of this happening all over the place. But do we need that? There's something called a precautionary principle that says you don't need to have widespread health effects to be able to do something about them. So what I'd like to encourage you to think about is that this is an opportunity to prevent environmental contamination, the human consequences of that environmental contamination, because as you point out, we're seeing microplastics in the environment and microplastics in human bodies as well. And something that we can do now uh, with a, 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 a pretty logical intervention. And what I'd like to say is that, you know, I'm here not as a, a lobbyist or as a, uh, you know, as a, uh, anything but a, a scientist who has been studying this. But this is a really substantial intervention that really can help change the way the world thinks about uh, the cigarette filter. And I would like to say that, you know, Santa Cruz can do this. Uh, there's going to be others. There are other countries right now that are considering it, uh, especially relative to the plastics uh, issue. And uh, the state has considered it at the state level rather and uh, here in California three times. <clears throat> but each time they backed away. So I'd like to just congratulate you on taking this up. Thank you. I think there's one more slide. Oh, yeah, one more slide. Uh, there's always one more slide. Uh, <laughs> last point. Yeah. It's not without cost that the cigarette filter and tobacco product waste in general. Uh, and what we try to do in uh, in our uh, Center for Tobacco and the Environment at SDSU is to come up with a way of estimating what that cost is. And it's based on the surface abatement, that is the mitigation, this is the cleanup campaigns, that there's a cost to these, whether it's done by volunteers or by official organizations, uh, uh, governmental organizations, there's a cost. Every hour that people spend doing that means, you know, that much human effort that has a cost to it. There are supplies and, you know, recurrent uh, kind of uh, activities. And the important thing to know is that the abatement doesn't stop. It's over and over and over and over. There are system costs, that is, things such as the uh, storm system, storm drain systems. And as you probably know, uh, by 2030 in California, because of the um, crash amendment to the Clean Water Act, nothing greater than five millimeters can go into the storm drains, either surface or rather um, source reduction or full capture has to be implemented to be able to keep the particles such as sewer butts, which are 20 millimeters, from getting into the uh, storm drains. So there are systems cost. Uh, also, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, the chemicals from tobacco do get into that, and it's difficult to get them out of uh, wastewater. And uh, then there are non sort of non visible costs, things that may be altering our environment, our ecology, because we're never going to get all of these cigarette butts out of the environment. We can't pick them up enough. We'll do uh, a cleanup and get a million butts during the uh, uh, international coastal cleanup, but you know there were trillions that were deposited, so it's never going to be you know preventing them from uh, affecting the uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, as it, as they're just unmitigated. So uh, there are several different reasons to think about this, and economics is another one of them. Thank you again. Next slide, and with that, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Cummings. Um, so I just also want to highlight that over the last uh, seven years, we have had a tobacco education co coalition uh, active in our county uh, with some uh, great staff members uh, in the uh, health services agency. And um, they have been doing a ton of out, uh, outreach and work just educating our community about the risks of tobacco in general. And uh, as Dr. Novotny said, uh, we have made strides in general in California uh, to reduce smoking. Um, but there, you know, there, there was this uh, group of folks who have been uh, actively involved and working on this issue for many years. Next slide. 
Um, so for all the reasons mentioned, um, our board passed a resolution back in May 16 uh, of last year um, that you, uh, acknowledged that uh, cigarette butts are a uh, um, public health hazard and uh, toxic waste within the environment. And so um, that resolution also uh, created an ad hoc committee of myself and uh, Chair Cummings and specified January 2020. 2025 as a date for us to return to the full board with a policy recommendation on uh, how to eliminate uh, this uh, environmental damage. And um, it also committed us to contacting the other four jurisdictions, the four cities uh, in our county and urging uh, collaborative action. Next slide. So we certainly did that, uh, and I'm happy to say that now, uh, since 2021, all uh, five county jurisdictions have passed resolutions recognizing tobacco waste as a public health and environmental threat. Um, and so uh, since um, the city of Santa Cruz and city of Watsonville had already done so at the time that we passed our resolution here at the county and the city of Capitola and city of Scotts Valley uh, came on board as well since we did. Next slide. So our tobacco waste subcommittee uh, met eight times over the last 16 months, and we did include members of county staff, including County Health Services Agency, the Sheriff's Office, Tobacco Enforcement Division, uh, County Council, and the Tobacco Education Coalition. Next slide. While we were doing our work, a uh, study came out uh, by NOAA that found that 25% of all of the uh, plastic and, and trash uh, picked up in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary uh, is actually related to smoking. And of that, the vast majority, 95% is cigarette butts. And so this uh, really just encouraged us to uh, keep up the work uh, to address this issue. Next slide. Um, as I said, this is an issue that's been looked at for many years, and so we were able to leverage past uh, efforts and community knowledge, uh, including a survey that the city of Santa Cruz did uh, in 2023 that found 90.6% of city residents and non-city residents would support policies that reduce cigarette butt litter, and that prohibiting the sale of single-use cigarette filters was the top policy choice for survey respondents. Next slide. Um, so I also want to mention that before, uh, before I re read the actual uh, text of the proposed ordinance before us today, um, that our committee did also look at alternatives like collection bins uh, and higher cigarette taxes. Um, but as Dr. Um, Devotny has, has discussed in, in detail, uh, those efforts are ultimately limited in their scope uh, and capacity to, to actually eliminate the problem. Um, so with higher cigarette taxes, a 10% price increase uh, in a pack of cigarettes can reduce overall consumption by three to five percent. But um, so higher prices have certainly not eliminated smoking. Um, and then with collection bins in suburban areas like ours, uh, we've seen success rates between a 25 to 45 percent reduction uh, in overall um, cigarette butt litter as a result of, of, of very aggressive collection bin campaigns. Um, but um, those are costly to maintain. And furthermore, um, you know, when we're talking about 5 trillion cigarette butts a year, uh, we fear that uh, 2.5 trillion cigarette butts out there in the world uh, per year was still not an acceptable result. And so that's why we came back to uh, simply banning uh, cigarette butts in general. And when we considered this, we wanted to learn from past efforts to ban uh, single-use plastics, for example, plastic bags. Um, when we did that, of course, uh, industry adapted, um, and that's great, but they adapted in a way that wasn't necessarily uh, productive, that was still creating just a thicker bag that actually was problematic for our recycling facilities uh, and, and still um, not solving the problem. So what our ordinance language does is um, propose to ban partially inconsumable cigars and partially inconsumable cigarettes. And that would, uh, that way we're really getting at the root of the problem, which is this waste that comes from every single smoke, um, whether that's plastic, cellulose acetate, other fibrous plastic material, or even any other inorganic, organic, or biodegradable material. Um, and the reason for that is, well, A, um, 
you know, what we wanted to try to anticipate was that cigarette manufacturers would turn around and create a biodegradable filter. First of all, biodegradable is um, still a pretty nebulous term, and uh, we've seen issues with you know actually ensuring that things are biodegradable and forcing that. Um, and furthermore, they still absorb the toxins within the cigarette um, and will continue to leach those into the environment. So um, that's why we said on this partial, partially inconsumable language for the ordinance. Next slide. Um, you know, the convenient thing is that we actually have a tobacco enforcement unit when the sheriff's office has already mentioned. And so really we wanted this ordinance to uh, leverage that exist, existing framework. And so we didn't actually create any new penalties. We simply follow the same penalties that we already have uh, for selling to minors or selling flavored tobacco uh, and made this one more thing that um, the sheriff's office could enforce and that would ultimately um, result in monetary fines or someone uh, losing their license to sell tobacco products. Um, and then, you know, um, Chair Cummings will speak more about some of our feedback from retailers. Um, but we, we do understand that there's going to be a process for uh, the, our, particularly our local retailers to adapt um, and also consumers. And so we're proposing a fairly long implementation timeline, really January 1st, 2027, before enforcement uh, of this ordinance starts. Um, you know, in some ways that, that that's debatable, um, you know, what we ultimately go with, but we we're trying to be sensitive uh, to impacts on our um, local retailers with that date. Next slide. Uh, so I just want to give a couple of examples of products that can still be sold if the law passes. So just to be clear, we are not talking about banning all cigarettes or all nicotine products. Um, this ordinance is really focused on the waste that comes from smoking. Um, so anything you see here, whether it's a filterless cigarette, chewing tobacco, um, rolling tobacco, cigars, uh, or um, tobacco fluid can still be sold even if this law passes. Next slide. What could not be sold are cigarettes with plastic filters like those seen, um, or you know, you also see here a, a cigarillo with uh, a wood tip that would be considered partially inconsumable, and so that would be banned as well. Next slide. So when we finally determined the language working with county council in consultation with our sheriff's department and tobacco waste, um, we had an aggressive community outreach campaign. Um, so over the course of these 16 months, we not only created a website where we had outreach, but we went to numerous speech cleanups. We had numerous um, engagement with students in the local community. Um, we had a band of but speaker series, uh, which where we invited, I think about 50, well, 50 members of the community um, uh, we're in attendance. We had panel discussions. We discussed the policy. We were able to get feedback. And ultimately, and I'd say overwhelmingly, the community was very much in support of um, us moving forward with the policy that we had recommended. Next slide. And so this is just, again, um, highlighting the different types of activities that, um, that we conducted to make sure that this was, there was broad, there was wide knowledge of what we were proposing and that we were hitting a broad audience. So we weren't just focusing on the environmental community. We weren't just focusing on one part of the county. We were going to North County, South County, meeting with youth, meeting with, um, various members of the public tabling at a variety of events to make sure that people were aware of what was happening and that we were gaining enough public input on this so that when we brought this forward, it was really reflective of what we were hearing from the community. Next slide. And um, I will say that we did also conduct a retailer listening session and um, the retailers did express their concerns with the impact on their businesses, economic losses, uh, concerns um, uh, that we come from consumers and potentially buying out of um, county. And, and so we, as, as Supervisor Koenig mentioned, we did take that into account um, as we we're deciding on this policy. Um, and ultimately, as we mentioned, part of why we settled on the date of January 1st, 2027 is because we want to make sure that there's outreach conducted with the retailers so that there's education on what products can and can't be sold. They understand the penalties and they're able to, we're giving them time to implement the change that they need to do to make sure that they can mitigate some of the um, potential uh, financial losses. And um, we'll go to the next slide. And so um, one of the things that came up was, you know, the impact to um, to our sales tax. 
and the concerns from retailers about, you know, the impacts of sales tax and sales. And, and I want to thank county staff. They were able to pull together some stats um, regarding um, the flavor tobacco ban and, and changes in sales tax revenue related to tobacco products um, after, before and after the um, flavor tobacco ban. And so this is a graph going from 2015 to 2024. And that blue line represents this, the sales tax revenue generated by um, tobacco product sales. And what we can see is that um, even before the ban, there was a bit lower um, uh, trend. And then after the ban, we didn't really see that significant difference in terms of the change of sales tax revenue, which really goes to show that um, we don't anticipate that there's going to be a huge reduction in sales. Um, and it, it, and while we did see a, 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 a dip after the flavor ban went into effect, um, we did see that uh, increase and then kind of stable after the cigarette ban, uh, or after the flavored tobacco ban took place. So next slide. And so um, at worst, um, if people were, if a, if a significant amount of consumers were to quit, we may see about a 25,000 to 50,000 reduction in sales tax revenue in the first six months of implementation. And at best, if consumers were, were shifting to um, their consumption from filtered tobacco products to um, some other form of non-filtered tobacco product, we'd roughly see maybe a 6,000 to 12,000 reduction in sales tax revenue over the next six months. Um, but based on previous data, we're, we're our thoughts are that um, the market will eventually stabilize over time as we observe with the flavored tobacco ban, and that even even um, if it weren't to the impact of sales tax revenue, really significantly small when you compare it to the overall amount of uh, money that we generate from sales tax revenue here countywide. And then also just point out, we also should be thinking about the financial impacts to cleaning all this up, um, which has not been mentioned here, but as as Dr. Novotny mentioned earlier, you know, with Santa Cruz being about 13 square miles and them having to spend around $2 million locally just to spend that, just to clean up that waste, the county overall is over 400 square over 400 square miles, and so if we were to pay to have somebody on the beach cleaning this up every day, or to have sheriffs on the beach every day monitoring, it'd be well those costs would be way more than the hundred thousand plus dollars that uh, we generate from sales tax revenue um, for the for the um, for this item. So next slide. And um, in addition to that, what we've looked at in, in terms of how other um, communities have been impacted, um, as we mentioned before, there's there's data out there that suggests that businesses adapt to change. When there's new laws that come into place, um, if businesses want to keep selling those products, they're going to figure it. How, they're going to figure out a way to adapt. And we've seen that with the uh, cigarette industry, the tobacco industry as well. Um, as we see more vapes coming online, there's things called Zim that people are into that are smokeless. They're coming online and that have less of an impact on our environment. And I do think we have to acknowledge that, you know, when we think about our values, we invest so much money into trying to get people to not smoke. We educate our community on the, the harms of smoking and why people shouldn't smoke cigarettes. So it makes sense that we're moving in this direction to get people away from these products. Next slide. And then I also just want to point out, because um, one of the things we heard from the industry was that, well, people can then just go buy their cigarettes online and, you know, they're, they're just bypassing our taxes and they're just getting them any, anyway. And um, as we've gotten more data throughout this timeline of the, uh, the subcommittee being in place, on last Monday, um, Assembly Bill 3218 was passed and signed by the governor. And in January of 2025, um, any provision on local tobacco retail licensing ordinance will automatically apply with equal force to online and delivery sales. And so what that means is that people will not be able to go online. These online companies will need to comply with our local laws, which means that if this goes into effect, people will not be able to go on to Amazon or online platforms to purchase these products. And that th those companies that do uh, uh, conduct those online sales will be subject to the same laws as our local jurisdiction. And so, and again, we, we want to reiterate too that this, what we're proposing today does not ban all tobacco products, but specifically we'll focus on these filtered products. Next slide. I think this is funny. Um, and then I just want to highlight that, you know, in, in addition to conducting um, the community outreach, we, under, we, we know that there's a role that our commissions play. And so prior to bringing this item to the board, we also went to the Commission on the Environment. We went to the Fish and Wildlife Commission and um, 
these this policy was presented to them and was supported ultimately by both commissions for us to move forward. And while we wish we had time to go to some of our other commissions, like our Latino Affairs Commission and maybe the the um uh uh, the, there's a waste task force that I'm on. I can't remember the name, but we were, we were trying to get as broad of input as possible, but definitely brought it to our commissions to get input from them. And they also wrote letters of support on this item. Next slide. And so this is just a small list of the organizations in our community that have also written letters of support. Um, Fishwise, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation Advisory Council, Ocean Conservancy, Save Our Shores, the Valley Women's Club, the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, uh, Community Action Board, among many others. Next slide. And I will say even up till probably this morning, we I at least was still getting emails coming in from a variety of groups, um, from students in Watsonville, from people throughout the community who see this as a path forward to, to further protecting our environment and ensuring that we are doing our part to reduce plastic pollution in our environment. Next slide. So our recommended actions are to approve in concept an ordinance amending chapter 5.60 of the Santa Cruz County Code regarding tobacco retail license to prohibit sale of filtered tobacco products. Find that the proposed ordinance is exempt from CEQA and direct the clerk of the board to schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on October 29th, 2024. Next slide. Um, as uh, of course to publish the notice of proposed ordinance in a newspaper of general circulation um, and finally to direct staff to develop and provide education outreach to affected retailers to assist with the transition away from the sale of filtered tobacco products and partner with local healthcare organizations to increase tobacco screening and cessation referral and to affirm to the board's commitment to support and support for staff to work with our local community partners to educate the community on the harms of smoking and tobacco use. Next slide. And this is just a hopeful message that we can be part of the solution, not the pollution from El Nido High School students in Watsonville. Thank you. And with that, um, we're going to move to public comment. But before um, I open up to the public, I want to invite up uh, former assembly member Mark Stone to speak on this item because we also heard from the retailers about you know why we don't do this at the state level. Why are we doing this here locally? And and former assembly member Stone had uh, spent a lot of time working on this at the state level, and so I've invited him to speak to us here today. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, Dr. Demotny, who was instrumental in the efforts at the state level. Uh, was actually wrong about one thing. We tried this four times. And in the assembly, we had a difficult time getting it through one committee. When it was attempted, it was a part of a larger bill going through the Senate, flew through the Senate, came to the assembly, died in the one assembly committee. And you can ask why the tobacco industry spends millions of dollars lobbying, even in California, most of that money goes to members of that committee. So it was no surprise. We knew we had an uphill battle the three times we tried to run it through the assembly, but it is still good policy. And and why? Most people think about too much cigarettes, either banning cigarettes outright, which is a good thing, not at all a bad thing, I will say, or I'm not sure what the alternative is, but that just sort of seems to be what, and, and that proves very, very difficult to do for a number of reasons, a lot of them economic, but a lot of them sort of historical and, and based on people's perceptions of what they, they can and can't do. But if you look at the product itself, there is a better path. And originally, we thought we could talk about alternatives to just banning cigarette filters, reusable filters, doing something differently than that. And I talked to a lot of smokers, and the smokers say they get a cigarette, they light it, they smoke it, they toss it. That's what they do. That is not going to change. And as Dr. Demotny says, the number of smokers in California has been reducing year after year after year to a group who is very clear about how they do and they don't want to smoke. So other alternatives just were really not going to work. We talked and, and talked about the, the littering problem and litter enforcement. And you've all been driving down the freeway and you see that little orange arc as somebody flicks a cigarette out of a car window. That is a thousand dollar fine right there, a thousand dollar fine. But it's not really enforced. Nobody seems to care. And most smokers don't care about it. So enforcement 
is not probably a good use of public resources, uh, nor is the cleanup. We saw the cost of cleanup, which is absolutely extraordinary uh, across the state. Caltrans said they spend multi-millions a year just cleaning up cigarette butts. We asked them that specific question. They said just cigarette butts. So the policy is really good, and that cellulose acetate as a as a bit of plastic does absorb some chemicals, and it makes the the it it, it has a particular mouthfeel to a smoker. So if you ban the butt, if you ban the filter, it will change the mouthfeel, but it will make what is thrown away just a little bit of paper, a little bit of glue, a little bit of tobacco, that part that can't be smoked. That is, can be broken down in the environment very, very quickly. That is something that, even though that is disgusting as it sounds, it is something far less harmful than that piece of plastic that is pervasive in the environment. It will last and last and last. And even if fibers break into smaller pieces or single fibers, they last and they last and they last and the butts get eaten by sometimes kids, but certainly dogs, wildlife, and others. These are little toxic bombs that really should not be in the environments. So you're trading off an inconvenience for the smoker having not having that filter there for a significant environmental benefit. And as you know, and as we've seen at the policy level, when we're talking about waste, the companies that make millions and billions of dollars producing products, they want you to spend taxpayer dollars to clean up their messes. Happens with plastic, happens with cigarette butts, happens with any number of products that are out there, significant amount of stumps. We've all done beach cleanups. I don't know how many beach cleanups I've done, but it irks me that we have to do that. And that is the given response to the trash problem. It doesn't need to be that way. There are a lot of items on that list of things that get picked up that could be addressed. This is the most ubiquitous piece of trash that you can find on the beaches. We've all been there. We all know that. So it's an easy first start. Yes, it's been difficult at the state for purely political reasons, not practical reasons. They bring up the health concerns. Well, as it turns out, the filters provide absolutely no health benefit, none whatsoever. And in fact, as Dr. Novotny alluded to, the health consequences of a filtered cigarette, because the, t the smoke is taken more deeply into the lungs, has a different type of cancer that develops that is arguably a more aggressive and more dangerous type of cancer. Now, that is something I will say he probably wouldn't because the research is, is not complete on that. But what the research says, not some of the research, not selected research, not most of the research, all of the research says that the filter itself is a lie. The tobacco industry has been perpetuating a marketing lie for decades because the filter produces no better health outcomes at all than a filterless cigarette. So that's your choice. This is a good policy. It is a strong policy. It is a way to take the first step. And, Supervisor, you brought up the bag ban. Santa Cruz County, this county was at the forefront of local jurisdictions putting bag bans on the on their agendas and getting them passed. And there were enough local jurisdictions that the industry was frustrated. And in fact, it was the grocers associations and others, part of the industry who brought it to the state to say, this is crazy because we have all these different bag bands across the state. They're all a little bit different and implementing to those was very, very difficult. We wanted a statewide ban. As was pointed out by the chair, not the best ban, because of the industry found ways around that. And there was an inkling, we sort of understood that as a possibility at the time. But that can be improved, that can be changed over time. Just as your best step now is to do this, hopefully other jurisdictions will follow suit, and that will create more of an impetus to get the state to do its job at not only protecting public health, but protecting the environments and saving millions and millions of dollars statewide on the cleanup cost that the industries who make the money refuse to take any part of. So I applaud your actions here as someone who's tried this multiple times. I think you have a much better shot at getting this done. 
please do. It is the right thing to do. I think it will prove to be, as the chair pointed out in his slides, less impact than the sky is falling rhetoric that we hear around these kinds of ordinances, but will be a significant improvement for everybody here in Santa Cruz County. So I, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to open up for public comment. And so, you know, we have a bunch of speakers in the room. Um, we're going to start by giving everybody two minutes, and we'll try to get through this hopefully in the next hour. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and get started with public comments. So go ahead. Yeah, good morning still. My name is James Ewing Whitman. That gentleman spoke for seven minutes and 40 seconds. You know, I've endured hours of testimony to come up with saying something 50 times more important than two minutes. So I think it's interesting that there's only five trillion cigarette butts a year. You know, I think people should get a thousand dollar fine for littering with all the surveillance technology, all that stuff's being witnessed. Now, as far as the one screenshot that I really liked that had the 10 common chemicals or pieces that are in a cigarette butt, and that would be carbon monoxide, tar, arsenic acid, butane, cadmium, acetone, arsenic, formaldehyde, lead, and ammonia. People might want to look what's in most medicines, including the modern vaccines. The last six of those items are in there. So this is once again an idea of the Hegelian dialect, meaning people are focusing on something that's really important. Citizens should call out people for littering. It's terrible. I mean, I'm a smoker. Get to know me. I have lots of other bad habits. But um, when every breath currently is 10 million nano-sized particles of plastic, every breath in one human breath is 10 to the 23rd atoms. When you draw out 10 and add another 23 zeros, that's a lot of atoms that we're not seeing. Sometimes you can smell it. Sometimes you can see it with water vapor. So as far as what's really going on and what's in our food, you know, five years ago, the leading, the third leading, leading cause of death was Western medicine doctors. Today, five years later, with all the crap going on, the second leading cause of death is Western medicine doctors. The first leading cause of death, unfortunately, is men like you, all seven of you that are just following dictates. You guys are controlled by the city manager. So yeah, we need public debate and I'll listen to this, but I've got other things to do. Thank you very much. Excuse me, but if I can ask, we have a lot of differences in opinion here. So if you have, if you want to express your support for something, you can wave your hands, but we don't want any, we don't want people clapping or booing or cheering at this point in time. Thank you. My name is Pauline Seals. I lead the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, an environmental group with 1,900 people. Thank you, especially Supervisors Koenig and Cummings for putting this together. We are in strong support of this. I, like Mark Stone, have picked up many cigarette butts, both on beaches and also places I like to go in the Sierras. And they're disgusting and horrible. But I only learned in the last year about the particles that are getting into everybody's body and that the medical industry doesn't even really understand all the risks yet. And this is one place we can take a stand, do something for the environment and our future health. And thank you. Please enact this. Good morning, Chair Cummings, members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Ferris Sabah. I serve as your County Superintendent of Schools. And on behalf of our school community, I'm here to express my strong support for the proposed ordinance banning the retail sale of filtered tobacco products in Santa Cruz County. As your board is aware, cigarette butts are the most littered item in the county and across the globe. Many made of cellulose acetate and non-biodegradable plastics, they break down into microplastics that persist in our environment for hundreds of years. In the past de decade, nearly half a million cigarette butts have been collected from our beaches by volunteers. These toxic filters leach dangerous chemicals like lead and arsenic and nicotine into their environment. They pose a significant risk to small children, wildlife, pets, marine life. And cigarette filters provide no clear health benefits to smokers, uh, according to the World Health Organization. The Santa Cruz County Office of Education is a member of the Tobacco Education Coalition and has a long-standing commitment to tobacco use prevention. 
Through our tobacco use prevention and education program, we educate students and families about the harms of tobacco use and how to resist peer pressure and how we support local schools to implement tobacco-free policies. Our students understand the importance of preventing tobacco use and actively participate in tobacco waste cleanups and educational activities. They recognize tobacco waste as a pressing health and environmental issue. By passing this ordinance, we will continue the County of Santa Cruz's legacy of leadership on environmental issues in our state. And we will send a message to our youth that, that you hear their concerns about persistent health and environmental inequities. Thank you for your consideration on this important issue. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Terry Trumbull. I'm here representing Breathe California, the Lung Health Organization for the State of California. You were kind enough to mention this a number of times in the opening presentation. I'm a board member for Breathe California, the Monterey Bay area. Um, I want to reinforce what you've heard many times already. Beach cleanups are uh, all about cleaning up litter but specifically tobacco filters. Intuitively, I would say the people I talked to said 90% was uh, filters, and that's consistent with what you showed us in the slides. My second experience to talk about is 45 years earlier. I was trained as a military policeman in Augusta, Georgia, and after every classroom session or during, they'd take a break, and there'd be a drill sergeant waiting for us outside telling us to pick up all the tobacco filter um, remnants around. And for some reason, I hate tobacco filters. So um, a third experience um, I want to talk about is being the state garbage man, or maybe I should say litters are. Uh, for six years, from 79 to 85, I headed, was full-time head of the State Waste Management Board. And um, as you may know, the beverage containers have a deposit on it, and not all of them make them back to the state. So the first five years or so, we were given $15 million to distribute to cities and counties to pick up litter. So you had a chart here that indicates how silly that is. We had one county that was spending more than that on beach cleanup. I mean, the problem is monumental and um, it went away to balance state budget. Those funds are all sorry. been. Okay, sorry, thank you, I appreciate Excellent. it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Felix Blanco. I own two businesses in Santa Cruz. I've lived here for 40 years. I think banning is not the right thing to do, supervisors. I think uh, we need to find other solutions. We've been proposing solutions like uh, having disposals at the beach and having uh, some of my colleagues are going to speak on behalf of that uh, issue. But what I urge you to do for us, Santa Cruz businesses, all the retailers, we're not going to be able just to adjust like you're saying, like Justin is saying, we're just going to adjust. Some of us are going to go out of business. Some of the cigarette stores are going to go out of business, but we're not just cigarette stores. We're also markets. We're uh, liquor stores. We, we uh, have so many different other businesses, and we are in jeopardy of just losing a lot of money and losing uh, employees. Therefore, we'd like to urge you guys, and some of you are here, probably this will be your last time being supervisor, do the right thing, help your community, your retailers, your local retailers continue to be able to sell all the products, but also we support the cleanup and we support having us a way to dispose of all the cigarette butts because we know it's, it's, it's a problem, but I urge you to do the right thing. And uh, I have more than 3000 signatures here from my customers that I'm going to give to your County clerk today, I'd like to get that into your hands. Thank you very much. Good 
morning, Chair Cummings and members of the board. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Koenig and Cummings for the work you've done on this proposed ordinance. Uh, I'm Dr. Hugh Bialecki. I'm a resident of Bonnie Doon. <clears throat> My wife, Lori, and I have regularly participated as volunteers in the Caltrans Adopt a Highway program for over a decade, cleaning roadside litter and helping keep California's highways uh, more beautiful and cleaner. Uh, cigarette butts continue to be the number one uh, source of the human waste stream that we regularly collect and dispose of during the adopt the highway cleanups. Uh, your vote to support this proposed, proposed ordinance can help reduce this toxic waste stream and protect our wildlife and marine environment. So thank you so much for this work. Hello, thank you for allowing me to talk. Let me tell you first, this is very scary for me. We are out number, we're out IQ brain. I am just a Sherry Dang, a local businesswoman and reside in the area for the last 38 years. I didn't imagine that someday I will be sitting here and being called selling poison, trashing our environment. Trust me, I love this town who adapted me since July 4, 1988, more than anything. I don't want to be the one that trashed our environment, but banning tobacco will hurt our retailer. Because as you see on the No I Measure Z of the Santa Cruz editor, they said you are just driving the consumer to the next 300 local retailer around our area in the next 10 miles. Same thing with cigarettes. You will just drive our consumer who work in San Jose, buy everything in San Jose, and left us alone. Since you ban tobacco, uh, menthol cigarette, the sale didn't come down. They just drive into looking to different retailer, and we are right now already so far about that. You talked about you didn't lose sell tax since menthol tobacco because customer changed to different cigarette to, to smoke. So just think of that. I'm nobody, but I employ 67 employees for the last 30 something years. These, we are our number. The doctor talking about health. We're talking about a cigarette, but here, like the gentleman who picked up cigarette this morning, I pick up all of this trash. Amazon, billion of dollars of trash. And they're not going to pay anything or employ anybody in our county who will go after them. The tourists will bring cigarettes from their town to come here. How can we stop them smoking and ruin our environment? Please support us. Supervisor Cummings, members of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, fellow community members, my name is Kirk DeChico, good morning. I'm not going to even read this because I think it's all been addressed and I don't want to be repetitive. But I will say that there's approximately 3 million visitors that come from San Jose and other parts of the community. And a lot of them bring cigarettes and they're going to continue. We were apprised of this that you two authored a month ago. And we had a month to get our act together. I don't smoke. I've never smoked. Why don't we impose a deposit of five cents per five cents per bud? Cut me off when I need to. It's like we did with five cents per bottle of water. If if the price of cigarettes goes to twenty dollars, then as the doctor, the good doctor just announced, cigarette smoking will continue to go down. People will still pay 20 bucks, but they'll, they'll take those cigarette butts and they'll package them in their car and we'll refund them the money. Having said that, I want to talk about the plastics. From what a supervisor told me, 25% of the litter is on the beach. What about the other 75%? Plastics. Is their lobby so big that you guys aren't addressing that? According to the provided data, 240,000 plastic fragments were detected per single liter of bottled water. And a single cigarette filter releases 100 micro 
plastics. I thought it was illegal to smoke on the beach. Are our police not doing our job, their job? You can't, you can't drink. Thank you. Members of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, thank you for allowing me to talk today. My name is Jimmy. I'm a business owner here in Santa Cruz. I live here with my family and my children. I'd like to start off by pointing out or quoting the actual um, page 30, paragraph 2 of the report from Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, final report, October 2023. The state of California passed a law in October 2019, California SB-8, prohibiting smoking on the most California state parks and beaching along with a $25 fine. Following the smoking ban, the shoreline segments within a state park showed an 84% drop in cigarette butts from 2019 to 2020, whereas the segments absent of the state park dropped by only 52%. In 2021, there was a slight rebound in cigarette butts in state parks. However, number of cigarette butts remained far below previous years. I'd like to quote that one. Um, again, we can talk about, I. some of my fellow colleagues have, have mentioned it over and over. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Um, you guys have presented a lot of good points. Let me make thing, one thing very, very clear. We are on the same page. I live in town. I love this town. We want to keep this town clean. But more than 3 million visitors are coming into this town. You know, they are, they are bringing their own trash. Guess what's going to happen on January 2nd, 2027? There's going to be guys standing outside my store with a backpack. It's going to be that. Um, flavor ban, you know, that did not affect it. But there's other things that could affect this. Um, even if I wanted to sell my business, I've just lost equity, right? So nobody's thought about that. Um, there's a couple of facts. 150 tobacco retailers in Santa Cruz County. A lot of are going to go out of business. Finally, 450 retailers within a 10-mile Santa Cruz County radius. They're just going to drive and get it from there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Donnelly Greenland, local marine ecologist and former executive director of Save Our Shores and also a former smoker. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you for all the work you do as our supervisors. Um, we can certainly continue to talk about all the detrimental impacts that we see from these littered, um, these cigarette butt litters for our environment, ecosystems, watersheds, public health, our soils, but we've been talking about this for over decades. What I would like to stress is that we come back to the data, which is our evidence. Our local community cleanup, as we have seen, um, we're still picking up tons of cigarette litter but, um, butts, over, uh, over half a million collected between 2013 and 2023. So what we know is what we're doing is simply not effective. This is the case, even though the cost of these products has increased, the public places in which you can legally use them is more limited. We have public signage with reminders of their toxicity. We have disposable receptacles for these butts in public spaces. But in the long run, some of these supposed solutions ended up costing our community more time and money and keep us moving in circles. For example, when the bus receptacles are full, there are questions regarding who services them and who pays, pays for that service time. When it comes to the signage, who update, updates that signage to make sure that those bus aren't thrown on the ground? Is the public even reading the signage at this point? And we're in a, an era of data and, and just information overload. Is anyone even looking at those signs? So these are a few of the extra efforts on top of the time and money that it is costing us as a, as a community, particularly environmental nonprofits. So right now, the data still points to the fact that we have not found a solution that works for our community. And I humbly ask you as our county supervisors to consider a big move that gets to the root of the problem. And that sets a precedent for environmental and public health. Please ban filtered cigarette products. But we know the solution will not be perfect by any means. It's important that we break out of this cycle and take a bold step that moves the the needle forward for environmental and community health. In time, I have a feeling that the data will reflect um, based on what the decisions we make here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cummings, members of the board. I want to thank you for uh, this extensive presentation today and uh, for moving forward to this. I would recommend very strongly that you move forward with this. And it's part of a bigger picture that your board and your staff has undertaken for the last several years 
to protect the ocean, to protect our waterways. That would include, as Supervisor uh, Koenig mentioned, single-use plastics as well as disposable cups and your work with organizations to support their work to protect the ocean and to provide education. So thank you again for this effort. Uh, look forward to having uh, a ban on single-use um, filtered cigarettes. Good morning, Chair Cummings. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm Tracy Weiss. I'm the Executive Director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, but I'm here today as a member of the Commission on the Environment. Um, individually and collectively, the Commission on the Environment strives to improve and protect the environment to ensure the long-term environmental sustainability of our environment here throughout Santa Cruz County. At our commission meeting at the end of September, we heard this presentation and considered and debated the facts and are encouraging you to accept this ordinance as we move forward. Tobacco waste from cigarette filters presents a negative impact on our natural world its and its inhabitants. Cigarette filters are consistently the predominant trash found on the ground at the beach and throughout our county parks and waterways. Each city jurisdiction throughout the county has already passed resolutions acknowledging this, and we encourage you to move forward with this. The county spends over $2 million annually dealing with tobacco waste, protecting the sanctuary and its human and non-human inhabitants. And these funds could be used to better protect, conserve, and preserve our oceans and beaches. Additionally, as my role as the executive director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, we are working to encourage the next generation of civically minded stewards. Over 50% of our participating classes go out and participate in beach cleanups every year. And we are exposing our children to these toxic bombs. We're asking you to ban them so that we are protecting not only our environment, but our future generations. Thanks for your consideration. Hi there, thank you, um, the Supervisors Cummings and Koenig. I am for banning the butt. Um, I've also been a, uh, I agree with everything with ban the butt. However, I've also, for the majority of my life, I had a private business. So I also sympathize with the small business owners here too. I don't know how we how that can be addressed to alleviate um I definitely don't want them to go out of business, so I don't really have an answer for it, but hopefully there can be some kind of remedy for the small business owners. And um, But please also move forward with ban them, but thank you again, both of you, all of you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, members of the board. Thank you for your time. I'm here to urge you to support the proposed ban on filtered tobacco products. My name is Katie Thompson and I'm executive director of Save Our Shores. In its 40 year history, more than 40 year history, Save Our Shores has been advocating for initiatives and actions that preserve Monterey Bay, its coastline and watershed, always fighting hand in hand with residents who directly depend on the health of the bay. And this issue is no different. Filtered cigarette butts are top of mind for us at Save Our Shores and our thousands of volunteers who work tirelessly to keep our beaches, rivers, and public areas clean. Cigarette butts are the singular most picked up item on the Monterey Bay beaches, rivers, and public areas. Over a 10 year period, we removed nearly half a million cigarette butts from beaches, rivers, and parks, which make up about a third of the plastic debris that we pick up. So yes, there is a lot of plastic out there, but if you're looking for one item, it's clear it's cigarette butts. And we are seeing a similar trend as we analyze this year's data from the annual coastal cleanup, which just happened a few weeks ago. It is clear the littered butts are not going away despite numerous efforts to combat the problem. Now is a time to be bold. Today, we have the chance to reduce the plastic on our beaches by up to a third and shift the scarce resources, time, and money uh, to other important environmental issues. Santa Cruz is not alone in combating this pervasive problem. It's happening all around the world, but we have a chance to be a leader in solving the problem. We've long been a beacon of environmental stewardship. By enacting a ban on the sale of filtered tobacco products, we have the unique opportunity to solidify our leadership in public health and environmental protection and lead the charge in addressing the intertwined challenges of tobacco use and environmental degradation. Thank you very much for your time.
Good morning, Chair Cummings and the members of Santa Cruz um, County Board of Supervisors. My name is Jasmine Enciso, representing the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, including the retailers and convenience stores operators across Santa Cruz County. We strongly support the existing tobacco retail license program that its, that its role is promoting responsible retail practices. We oppose the ordinance to ban the sale of filtered tobacco products, while we all support the efforts to reduce environmental harm, this ordinance places an unnecessary burden on local businesses without effectively addressing the core issue. Retails, retailers in Santa Cruz County have a proven track record with 94, 94% passing rate in tobacco compliance checks over the past three years. The retailers are doing their part to follow the law, preventing sales to minors and contributing to the local economy, penalizing responsible retailers by banning a significant portion of their products to lead to job losses, financial strain on small businesses that depend on these sales. Moreover, banning filtered tobacco products won't solve the broader issue of plastic pollution, given that Santa, Santa Cruz is a major tourist destination. How does the board plan to enforce this ban effectively? Will tourists be stopped and have their filtered cigarettes confiscated upon entry the county? This raises serious concerns about the practicality and enforceability of such measure. If the true goal is to clean up beaches and reduce litter, why focus solely on tobacco filters? Paper, plastic bottles, and aluminum cans also contribute significantly to beach pollution. Singling out tobacco products suggests that there may be an underlying agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much for your effort on this item. My name is Sean Burns. I'm the coordinator with the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve, part of Save the Waves Coalition. I'm here in support of the ordinance to ban uh, the tobacco uh, cigarette filter. Um, this is 20 minutes I found on West Cliff Drive this morning on my way over here. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty, it was, you know, honestly a little therapeutic picking up the first couple of those. But uh, by the 20 minutes, you know, I got pretty fed up and pretty ticked off. And, you know, I, I myself and I think a lot of us become numb to seeing the cigarette filter on our beaches, in our ocean. Um, I've lived here for about, I've grew born and raised here. I've been surfing for about 32 years now. Uh, so where all those cigarette filters end up is in our ocean, on our beaches. And I become numb to seeing them. So now expecting a kid in about just one week's time. I envision a future where him and all the youth don't get numb to seeing the tobacco cigarette filter on our beaches and ocean. The ocean has enough problems that are caused by humans, like rising sea level temperatures causing hurricanes and the most severe winter storms we've seen here in Santa Cruz. By eliminating the most littered item in our beaches and into our ocean is how we can do our part to keep this ocean ecosystem clean. I believe it is here in Santa Cruz where there's a sanctuary, a world surfing reserve, that's in Santa Cruz is already internationally recognized as a leader in ocean protection. Therefore, here in Santa Cruz, with your leadership, I believe you, the Board of Supervisors, today can help defend ocean pollution by adopting this policy. Thank you for your leadership. Good morning, County Supervisors. My name is Maria. I'm a senior at Lido High School. And every Tuesday, we go to the plaza located in Watsonville downtown, and we clean up. And the thing that we always find, like the number one item, is cigarette buds. I think you guys should ban it just because it's not healthy for the people smoking it, for our ocean, or for, like, anyone, like, walking through it. And especially because every Friday we have the, um, the farmer's market, and... Families go there, kids go there. You don't know, like, they could pick it up any day or something. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you and good morning, board supervisors. My name is Patricio Guerrero, and I'm a business owner on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, I choose to establish my company here because of the city's thriving ecosystem for forward-thinking, environmentally-focused startups. 
The decision you make today will send a powerful message to our community about Santa Cruz's commitment to environmental sustainability. Cigarette butts are not just a local issue, they contribute significantly to global pollution. As a city that prides itself on the environmental stewardship, it's time we take a decisive action to protect our streets, our waterways, and our beaches. I urge you to vote to support the cigarette butt ban and help shape the clean, shaping a cleaner, healthier future for all of us. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for first and foremost fighting this battle against pollution. I'm a retail owner um, in the Santa Cruz County. My name is Harvey Pabla, and uh, I'm against this uh, ordinance that we're going to be passing um, that should not be passed because it's not going to solve the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all of these cigarette uh, customers that we have that are buying cigarettes from us and our customers, they know how to dispose of their, their butts. They're taking those butts, putting them into the trash, donating them in depositories that we have all across our town. Um, but this ban will not effectively eliminate the waste of cigarettes. They're like some people I'd mentioned earlier, they're going to be coming in from all over the place. I mean, all of that money that you guys are getting from us in sales tax, that's all going to be eliminated. Like some people I'd mentioned, not only will that be eliminated, people's jobs are at stake. They, those jobs will have to be taken away because that's 30% of our margin that we make at in the stores. Um, along with that, this is the freedom of choice for our customers, right? You guys want to take away their choice to make their decision at the fundamental of everything. This is the, this is the land of the free, right? We, we are supposed to be able to make our own decisions on what we want to do with our bodies, with our lives, right? I totally agree with you. This is a problem. We as retailers want to support the initiative of cleaning this up. We'll create a culture within our stores to say, Hey, let's get rid of that. But throw it back into your, your cigarette box, throw it in one of the depositories, but we're we're not one of those retailers that are going to say, hey, you guys go ahead and keep continue polluting the environment or anything like that. We'll be on your guys' side. But if you guys do this and uh, start this, this whole ban, it's going to push us very far away from you guys because we won't be on the same team. It will be effectively taken away from our business. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Um, hello, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for allowing us to have this meeting and allow us retailers to speak. My name is Manraj Bungu, and I'm a retailer of Santa Cruz County as well. And um, I would like to say that this isn't really a cigarette issue. This is more of a waste management issue of Santa Cruz County, because like you guys said, that there's a lot of pollution on these beaches. And for you guys, um, you guys have put a lot of responsibility in our retailers. Uh, we have now started doing CRV uh, cleanups for multiple customers who do plastic water bottles and, you know, plastic uh, liquor bottles and such. But we are helping as much as we can for the community to help us um, uh, help us. Uh, basically clean the environment when it comes to cigarette filters. And, oh, I'd like to say that I'm against the ordinance too as well. And, um, you know, I'm sure uh, Supervisor uh, Bruce would recognize this. Uh, we have these all over uh, Boulder Creek and pretty much our BCBA, our, business, our Boulder Creek Business Association, pretty much voluntarily with the charity of all the local businesses, pretty much put these up in all the hot spots in town. And with the support of Tamara and Karen, we have effectively decreased cigarette butts and we created a culture of, um, you know, properly disposing of filtered cigarettes and properly disposing of trash because they also put trash cans everywhere. And I understand that it's hard for un, uh, unincorporated communities to have this, but with the support of you guys and the support of our sales tax on all our items sold, we would appreciate that if you guys could implement proper disposal because if these were implemented all over Santa Cruz beaches, all over um, towns and streets, we would have a proper solution. You know, if we could dispose of needles and such safely, why can't we dispose of filtered cigarettes properly and create a culture in Santa Cruz County that, hey, we need to take care of this and solve the tourism issue of, hey, this, this is where you need to dispose and create a committee for us to pretty much find the people who do litter. Uh, thank you guys for your time and appreciate it.
Good morning. My name is Patrick McGillan. I'm here uh, as a resident community member for the last for my entire life. I've grown up here and I now own a store in Live Oak area. I'm here to speak against this ordinance because it is going to it's not going to accomplish anything other than hurt our community financially, put people out of work, put people out of business. We are we live in a commuter community with over 400 tobacco retailers within 10 miles of our county lines. Because of that, anybody that drives to work, anybody that drives out of this county can go buy as much as they want for themselves, for their friends, whatever it is, come back, bring it in. Everyone's referring to 3 million tourists a year, that's 3 million trips a year, upwards of 15 million people a year coming into this county, bringing all their own trash, which is we can't prevent any of that. Due to just these two factors, not going over anything else we've talked about, that is going to completely negate anything this ordinance does. The only thing we know is it's going to destroy our businesses. We operate on extremely thin margins. 30% reduction in sales is going to completely put us out of business. That's going to translate to millions of dollars of employee income gone from this community. They're already low income in a lot of these jobs, and now they're not going to have a job to support their family. They're going to be gone. Um, the other part of this is a transition, two-year transition. We can't magically generate more sales when we lose customers. That I can't even get to everything because there's not enough time, but we had month, one month to come up with a solution, and basically you're going to put us out of business, and you're going to put all of our business to Walmart, to Safeway, to Target, and we're not going to be able to support our community anymore because we're going to be gone. And all those employees are going to lose their jobs and you're going to lose tax dollars. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Uh, how you doing? Uh, I'm Doug with Harbor Wholesale. We're a wholesale company. We actually we distribute to your business out here. And one of the biggest things that, I'm, that I know for a fact that's going to happen is with a lot of these business owned companies, uh, People, they're going to lose business. They're going to be going somewhere else to buy not just cigarettes, not just, they're going to buy a lot of different stuff out there that's not going to be able to, these uh, businesses are not going to be able to get. So one of the biggest things that you got to think about is how is it going to affect your city? I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm coming in, but I'm just letting you know that it's going to affect a lot on your business because it's a big revenue you guys are going to lose by uh, taking the cigarettes out. So that's, that's, I'm here to support, and that's what I have to say. Good morning, or maybe it's afternoon. I don't know. I've lost track. Uh, Chair Cummings and board members, my name is Jack. I'm here because of my affiliation with the Cigarette Surfboard Project and its goal of protecting our beaches and oceans from plastic pollution, and in particular from pollution from cigarette butts. I thank board members Cummings and Koning for bringing this issue to the board and for their careful and complete examination of the issue and their powerful me memorandum and for the presentation of Dr. M Dr. Novotny. All of them have eloquently stated the costs and severe impacts to the county and its citizens and its natural resources of discarded butts and they have identified the incredibly broad support they have for adoption of the ban. I'll try not to repeat what has been said by them or others. Even though each discarded butt in, is in and of itself small, the cumulative effect is tremendous. Uh, we've had three people speak. I'll be the third on what they've witnessed today. Uh, I saw 116 butts in my five block walk here today, walking quickly. Uh, multiply that in parking lots and streets you know, by all the streets and parking lots in the city, in the county, in the state, in the nation, and you begin to get a scale of the problem. And it's not a problem that simply goes away by cleaning them up. They keep returning. Uh, I applaud the county supervisors for considering doing something about this problem by en enacting a ban. Other cities and towns will follow you. I have no doubt of that. And then the state. I have seen this happen and been involved in similar initiatives over the years where this has occurred. But it has to start somewhere. And you guys, I, I really appreciate your willingness to be groundbreakers. Thank you uh, for your one powerful step to addressing the way that plastic tract is uh, dealt with in this county. On a personal note, I'll close by saying that 
I, I feel bad that this might affect small businesses, but removing a health item, something that affects health is not a bad thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, my name is Taylor Lane. Uh, I've been a resident of Santa Cruz about 15 years, and I'm the creator of the cigarette surfboards. These are tens of thousands of cigarette butts that have been picked up off our Monterey Bay sanctuary. These boards speak to the throwaway culture and something that must be done to prevent this pervasive waste from polluting our planet. As stewards of the Monterey Bay, we have a responsibility that stretches far beyond this small town. This sanctuary cannot speak for itself, and therefore we must. Bruce, your leadership has come across party lines and has been crucial in the past. And we need you to prioritize our community and environment over big tobacco interests because that is what these small retailers are, unfortunately. My generation is facing an ecological disaster. And, there, and this policy is a huge step towards holding these corporations accountable for their waste and their ill responsibility. Please show us here today that when community organizes under the pillars of democracy, that our leaders side with the people and the environment, not the short-term profits of a few. History will look back on this day in two ways. We either had champions that listened to the logic, the science, the evidence, and our community's plea for prioritizing radical broadest policy or not, and we kicked the can further down the road. Please provide us, please preach us this hard work, organizing and commitment to the cause and along decades of irrefutable evidence will guide your decision. You will forever be a champion far beyond this town and you will be able to look back and say with confidence that you made the right decision, paving the way for others to follow in Santa Cruz footsteps. Felipe, Zach, Bruce, we hope you will choose Santa Cruz over big tobacco and this will truly show which side you stand on. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ash. I am 16 years old and I go to El Nido High School. Every week, my class and I go to La Plaza to clean up trash, many of which are cigarette butts. The toxic cigarette butts leach into the environment and also end up in storm drains that empty into our ocean. Our ocean is supposed to be a protective wildlife sanctuary. I would also like to share a personal story. My grandmother was a smoker for many years. Even though she quit smoking, she still developed lung cancer. I hope that maybe the ban of filters could inconvenience someone to try to quit smoking, in addition to helping the environment. Please ban filtered tobacco products. Um, my name is Jeff Breen. I'm an old man. I'm pretty naive. Um, in 1948, my family waited while my grandfather was in the operating room. I was told they were scraping his lungs of tar. And he died that day. And I really loved him. He was a darling person. 1990, sort of miraculously, I was in Sulawesi with my son. We were flying back. We were going to go back. My son was sick. He had gotten, um, I, I don't know, he was dehydrated, but he had gotten very sick. And we were flying back to Jakarta. We got on the plane, and there was a person walking around the plane, and he had little free packets of Camel cigarettes, six cigarettes in a packet. He was passing them all around the plane. It's big business. It's a huge business. It's all around the world. You're doing something about it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Good morning. My name is Randy Wong, and I'm a volunteer with Breathe California. And when I see cigarette butts, it reminds me not just of the environmental impacts of tobacco product waste, but really about the efforts that tobacco companies make to try to cause addiction. Um, I'd like to mention two things uh, for you to consider as, as criteria as you're making your considerations. Um, and, and the first is whether uh, it might be undoing some of the harms that the tobacco industry has been doing over the many years and decades. Uh, there's such a human cost to tobacco use, uh, both uh, the suffering and disease that people suffer from, 
uh, but also the economic and the productivity costs, uh, not to mention the environmental uh, costs as, uh, in terms of tobacco product waste. Um, and also just to consider whether the um, policy aligns with the existing uh, policies that the board has passed and, and builds on those. Uh, tobacco companies have spent so long, decades, um, through so many different methods, trying to figure out ways to get the public to try to smoke. And importantly, to try to get the public to underestimate the harms that come from tobacco products. Um, these plastic pieces would seem to be part of the tobacco industry's efforts to do that. And so as a resident, I really appreciate all of the efforts that the boards have done to do comprehensive approaches to reduce tobacco use um, and harms throughout the many years. And I hope you'll continue that trajectory. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Ricky Erickson. I'm the Chief Scientist for the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and we fully support the uh, cigarette ban. And all of, a lot of people before me have said a lot of the great scientific and environmental reasons um, for reducing plastic and pollution in our great Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I also wanted to talk to you as a sailor um, out on the ocean, a mother, a 20-year resident of Santa Cruz, and a former smoker who travels a lot around the world. And certainly access to products and cost were one of the reasons or priority reason that I quit smoking. And as a former smoker and now use other products that are more safe, um, but I think from a um, the convenience store and the economic um, arguments that are here, I've seen a lot of replacement products. So the cigarette industry is rapidly, and what you have access to is in direct response to a lot of the local regulations. So I think that this is a battle between sort of economics and environmental and community health. And I think that there are a lot of good studies out there that would show that there are a lot of opportunities for convenience stores to make um, economic investments and, and gains from other products that are going to be either out there currently and become available in their stores or increasingly develop. So I urge you and really look forward to you guys being on the front page of every international <laughs> news story this afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. I'm George Leonard. I'm Chief Scientist at Ocean Conservancy. We're the oldest marine conservation organization in the U.S., and we, uh, like others here today, proudly support this policy. For 39 years, we've coordinated the international coastal cleanup around the world, including with local partners Save Our Shores here in Santa Cruz uh, in close coordination uh, with the California Coastal Commission. I am not going to say anything more about all the details that you've already heard, um, and rather than speaking to data, uh, I'll speak not as a marine scientist, but as a long-term Santa Cruz resident, uh, a husband, a father, uh, an old soccer coach, and a community volunteer. Because the simple truth is you don't need a PhD to do the math. Only 6% of Californians smoke, but the remaining 96% of us are picking up their garbage. Now, you've heard uh, from lots of people today, passionate arguments on both sides of this issue, from tobacco retailers, from smokers, from surfers, parents, educators, students, environmentalists, public health professionals, and more. And now you have a fundamental decision to make. Are you going to side with an industry that has spent the last century lying to all of us uh, and the American public? an industry that has taken zero responsibility for the environmental damage that it causes, and an industry that has never once, not once, done the right thing for the environment or for people without being forced by law? Or are you going to side with science and data and the environment and children and families and health and the medical community and, most importantly, common sense? This is fundamentally about common sense. So the 94% of us are asking you to be brave, do the right thing, and pass this policy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Whitaker, 25-year resident of Santa Cruz. I'd like to thank you for your consideration. I'm here to support the ban. 
and I appreciate all the work you've done um, on this issue and this getting this ordinance to the point where it's at today. Um, leading the public in those roles that you the roles that you have is not an easy job. I'm seeing it here today, and I applaud you for the work you guys do. These are complex issues, and there's a lot of stakeholders, and you guys do really, really good work. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I have two children and it's sad when we talk about the environment because they feel very disheartened and they're looking to people like you to do the right thing and to lead us in the right direction. And I think this is an opportunity to, to, to do the hard thing, but do the right thing. And uh, you could define courage as standing up for what you believe in. And I would say you guys have a chance to be courageous here and do the right thing for a lot of people. And I'm not going to repeat all the facts and figures, but it's pretty clear that this is the right uh, decision to make. So um, two things that uh, came to my mind when I was listening financially, this is the right thing to do for the city, um, obviously for the environment. I think sometimes government has to make regulations to encourage people. And so this is an opportunity for you to kind of encourage people to do the right thing. And in terms of leading other cities and at the state level to consider this, we got to make this first step. And so I just like to thank you for the work and please uh, support this ordinance. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Andrea Dempsey, and I'm the education coordinator with Save Our Shores. Um, so primarily, I'm leading beach cleanups with youth in our community all across the county. One major thing I ask youth right away is coming back to this same beach every day. Is that the best way to prevent this litter from making it to our environment? Um, the important thing about Save Our Shores is we're taking data on this issue. I won't talk more about the data that's been presented, but students are committing their time and energy to this community science where they're figuring out that cleaning up our beaches is great, but it's the preventative aspect of taking that data, committing to that community science, taking the responsibility off the individual and putting it back um, where it belongs with Big Tobacco. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment to represent all the students in the county that are not only affected by their public health reasons, environmental justice. I wanted to address that for a moment because big tobacco does disproportion disproportionately target some of these communities that we work with with Save Our Shores. So yes, thank you for allowing me the moment to represent the students and the youth of our county. All right, ma'am, you're going to be the last person in, in here in Chambers who will speak on this item. And then when we, when we move to online, we're going to shift to one minute because we've got a supervisor friend needs to leave at 1.30 and we want to get through this. Plus, we have another item we need to get through. Hi, my name is Portia Reimer. While watching your presentation, explicitly the slide that showed what is currently removed from our public beaches, I remember a time when plastic bags were a much bigger percentage of that waste. So while this ban will not cause a complete removal of butts in our trash that needs to be removed from beaches and other public places. I hope it will have as big of an impact as the plastic ban had at the local and state level. Furthermore, any business member that doesn't want this or any other ban slash policy simply because they will lose business they need to perhaps consider that this county might not be the best place for them to conduct their business. I could be wrong, but I believe the only people that object to this ban either smoke or profit from those that do. Therefore, I encourage board members to vote in a manner that is consistent with what the majority of Santa Cruz County in general wants, which in this case is to prioritize environment over business profits. This should be considered when voting on this ban and other issues in the future. Furthermore, comparing disposing buds to safely disposing of needles actually shows the need for further action in this area. 
There are still too many places in this county where needles are not disposed of and the county has to pay for somebody to, to remove them, despite all of the efforts that are already being made in regards to this situation. Thank you. Are there any members of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item? You have callers, give me one second. And you know more or less how many folks are online? I'm showing eight. Okay. And we'll still shift to one minute. Okay. Samsung, your microphone is now available. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yes, I just call in um, to both know. I'm an employee at the convenience store, and I've been talking to the customers relating to this um, issue. Um, they won't stop smoking. They say they are going to go to another place, another county to do it. I think what we need to do is just to educate the people because no matter what we do it, they are the one who are throwing the cigarette butts, whatever. So um, I guess we have to just educate people how to do it the right way. And I vote no. Thank you. Oh, hey, your microphone is now available. Oh, hey, your microphone is now available. And just as a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Ali, your microphone is now available. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a mother, a single mother of four, and I've had no for the band because I do work in a convenience store. And I just had a dinner last night with my four children about if they ban this um, cigarette, I'm going to lose my job. And I'm worried about it because I love this community. And I think, like somebody else said already, um, they... It, this is about choices. We were talking about it last night with my kids, and they're like, Mom, you have showed us if we eat chips or junk food, it's going to affect our, our, our um, health. Same thing with cigarettes. It's their choice if they want to smoke or not. And so, like I said, I work in a convenience store. I talk to customers. Customers are not going to stop smoking. They're going to go buy cigarettes somewhere else and bring that same trash to our beaches. Please educate everybody, including especially our kids, because later on in life, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to go to another communities and come here and do the same thing. Thank you. Viola, your microphone is now available. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, um... Hablo español, este, yo estoy um, en contra de que quiten los cigarros porque esto me afectaría mi trabajo, uh, disminuiría, disminuiría el trabajo y también este, uh, pienso que hay otras cosas que está afectando uh, la, la contaminación como otro tipo de basura. Lo que pienso que sería una opción era como um, poner áreas designadas para que uh, para los cigarros como las playas o o parques aumentar pues las las áreas designadas para que no pudieran quitar la venta de cigarrillos. Thank you. Caller user one, your microphone is now available. So much profit in these toxic industries. Capitalism kills and pollutes. Judy Berry of Earth First said, capitalism cannot exist without destroying the earth. This is toxic tobacco with microplastics and other poisons in it, but also 
think of the microplastics from all your so-called protective shielding with plastics during COVID-19. Microplastics are in the masks that people are told to wear, in cell phones, in the geoengineering particulates. It all needs to be banned. We need to stop the power of the corporate structure of this country that is massively contaminating and destroying everything, including the tobacco industry. This is only a drop in the bucket, unfortunately. Stop it where it starts. Thank you. Eric, your microphone is now available. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Hi, my name is Eric Crosby, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm a former doctoral graduate at UC Santa Cruz. And I really applaud the uh, board for proposing this and supporting this and big support of this. So I just want to quickly outline three reasons why to support this. Uh, first, um, I was when I was a student in Santa Cruz, we did a collection of cigarette butts, and it really helped pass smoke-free universities all throughout California. But in terms of enforcement, there were still problems where students were still going back behind the trees and leaving butts, so it still was an issue. Second, um, I used to work at UC Santa uh, UC uh, San Francisco, and they're home to the industry document library that speaks to the fraudulent claims that have been mentioned. The industry has lied for decades, and so this is a common sense thing. And one of their strategies is to use retailers as a mouthpiece to make very similar arguments. And if you look at other policies, they've worked well. And then finally, very innovative policy, first of its kind. I applaud all of you. And there are other countries and other cities that are looking at it, so diffusion is very important. So you will not just be helping people in Santa Cruz, but all throughout California and all throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, your microphone is now available. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Bill Hickman with the Surfrider Foundation. Surfrider has a hold on to your butt program aimed at eliminating cigarette butt litter to help address the plastic pollution crisis and water quality issues with the toxins when the toxins in butts get released in water. We're an environmental organization and not an anti-smoking organization. So our chapters have tried Everything from education to handing out personal ashtrays to installing hundreds of outdoor ash cans through southern, throughout Southern California. A speaker earlier mentioned outdoor ash cans. Uh, they require continued maintenance, and we have seen a number of them broken into so people could get the small amount of tobacco on some of the butts while leaving most of them on the ground. So unfortunately, none of these actions have made big progress in addressing the cigarette butt litter issue overall, so we need to go to the source and eliminate the unnecessary plastic filters and plastic tips. Uh, you all won't be alone. You will be a leader with other jurisdictions likely to follow with similar ordinances, and hopefully the local ordinances will spur our state legislators to take action finally. Thanks for your time and consideration. Allison, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Allie Webster. Many of you might remember me as the surf rider lady with the jars of cigarette butts. I'm here today to speak in support of this proposed ordinance. While recognizing the impact this ordinance has on business owners, employees, and smokers, it is important to acknowledge that this isn't about targeting any of these individuals. It's about holding the tobacco industry at large accountable for their environmental impact. These toxic plastic filters end up littering our streets and polluting our waterways, beaches, and oceans. As the guardians of the legendary Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary, it is our responsibility to make this big move. It's unacceptable that Big Tobacco continues to produce products with these toxic components with absolutely no extended producer responsibility. This ordinance will increase awareness of the harms of plastic cigarette filters, and it will get the attention of the industry and force their hand to implement more sustainable alternatives. By implementing this ban, we can help protect our local environment while setting a powerful precedent for like-minded communities. Santa Cruz once again has an opportunity to be a leader in environmental policy in California and beyond, and I urge the board to take this important step toward a cleaner, healthier community and country. Thanks for your time. Gabrielle Licker, your microphone is now available. Gabrielle, 
Bria Licker. Your microphone is now available. And just as a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute yourself. It appears they're having difficulty, Chair. There's no more callers. All right, we'll bring it back. I know we've got a few items we need to get to, so I'm just going to bring it back to the board for um, questions, conversation, discussion, and action. Um, just acknowledging also that there are staff available if there's any questions on, you know, as it relates to some historical work, some of the things that came from the presentation. And so I'll turn it to um, Supervisor Friend, if you have any comments, questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for everybody that took the time to come speak and for the community outreach. I did just have a, just for a point of clarification for my own knowledge, because it wasn't 100% clear. You had, I had heard from folks in South County that were learning about this kind of late. You had talked about South County outreach. I saw a couple of organizations from South County, but can you just kind of um, expand on the South County, both business and individual outreach you did just so the community can be aware? I believe it was in the memo, but um, in May of this year, we sent letters out to the retailers, um, letting them know that we'd be having a discussion with them. I believe in, it was either late, it was late July or early August. Um, but maybe actually I'd like to invite up Tara Leonard because um, she had conducted some of the outreach and education and, and sent the letters out to South County or to all the businesses throughout the entire county. Yeah, good morning, Supervisors. Tara Leonard, Tobacco Education and Prevention for County Public Health. Uh, hello, Supervisor Friend. Thank you for your question. Um, I just want to add that when we talk about education outreach around this issue, the Tobacco Education and Prevention Program has had tobacco waste in its scope of work for seven years. So it's not that this effort or any of this outreach has just started recently. We have been doing dozens of cleanups from South County to North County. We have done tabling and presentations and events all over this county in the last seven years. So community outreach in South County has included work with Wetlands Watch, with the Watsonville Public Works Department, with El Nido School. We've done extensive outreach with Watsonville High School. I was actually the preceptor for a capstone project for a number of Watsonville High School students back in I don't know, 2019, we've done multiple cleanups and data collection in the city of Watsonville, including just a couple weeks ago, I'd like to say, we did a cleanup at two of the locations we've done historically. It was on Rodriguez Street, and in one block of Rodriguez Street, 35% of the tobacco butts that we picked up were within 10 feet of a no smoking sign. So outreach has in South County has been extensive, and a number of those organizations have been a part of our tobacco education coalition for at least a decade. So, so Ms. Leonard, I appreciate that. I've been part of some of those cleanups, and you've done, I mean, amazing work in South County in general on this. I, I was speaking specific to the proposal, though. So I, what I want to know is, because what the feedback I'm getting is that folks, um, both in the retail side or the the individual, I guess, user side, I don't know how to really characterize it, but um, that they're learning about this late or were invited into the specific process regarding the ordinance proposal late. And I just want that to either be disabused or confirmed based on the information that's that's provided. So I, I read the report, uh, Mr. Chair, but it, it outlined um, organizational support like PVPSA, for example, and um, but not necessarily how the, how and when folks came in in the South County. I just wanted to make sure that we could make set the record clear on that uh, for the community. Right. So in terms of this particular ordinance, first I want to be clear that this ordinance is not being brought forth by the Public Health Department, but by the Ad Hoc Committee of this Council. But on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee, we did send out an invitation to every retailer in the, in the county, every licensed retailer in the county, to attend a retailer's meeting. Someone refresh my memory. Let's see, it's October 8th. So the retailer's meeting was the last week of August, I believe. Yes. I believe it was the last week of August. And so we made sure that those letters went out at least a month before then. Okay. Um, then second, I guess, to that, do we have the, uh, we have the data specifically on, I, I mean, it's unquestionable that there is, that this is a significant waste problem. And I, I recognize that folks that came and spoke had different rationale for supporting it. There's people that have public health reasons of wanting people to stop smoking. There's the environmental issues. And so there was a different rationale, but do we have any sense of, of what, I know this might be very difficult to do. We've also tried to do this on the needle waste side, but what percentage of the waste that we're, we're coming is actually from local retailers or would be improved or impacted specifically by us doing something in the unincorporated area only? 
I had don't I am not personally aware of any data that would give us that answer. Okay, I mean, I imagine it's really tough. I just wasn't sure if we had a sense of whether it was all from local retailers, whether it was from out of town or a combination of both. And so then just a question maybe for my two colleagues that, that sat on the committee. Um, I, I know Supervisor Koenig, as part of your presentation, you talked about the resolutions as a public health crisis that were adopted by all the local jurisdictions. Do we have a sense of of the interest of the local jurisdictions to pass something so that the county um, isn't, I mean, so that this is a countywide issue as opposed to just an unincorporated wide issue? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think that the resolutions from the four incorporated cities demonstrate some level of interest uh, in passing an ordinance. And I agree that uh, this is going to be most effective if we move forward together. Uh, I mean, after all, um, wouldn't want to ban the, the sale of filtered cigarettes in Live Oak, only to have someone cross over to the city of Capitola uh, to purchase that pack. That would that would not be effective policy. So. Um, I think you know part of the reason we feel comfortable bringing this forward today is that uh, discussions have been ongoing uh, with council members and all the jurisdictions, um, and we feel that uh, there's a good chance they, uh, they that they certainly will introduce uh, bans in their jurisdictions, um, and we'll see what those councils do. But they have passed resolutions saying that uh, cigarette butts are toxic waste. Thank you, if, I could, if I could follow oh, up on that too, I will just say that we have. Um, had, during this entire process with the subcommittee, we were engaged with representatives from those districts um, on an ongoing basis. And so part of how Capitola and Scotts Valley ended up bringing their resolutions forward was that they were shopping this around to um, folks within the councils. They were trying to gauge input from their communities, and they felt that they'd be able to bring this forward. And through introducing those resolutions, help answer some of the questions that would be raised by their council members. And over, overwhelmingly, they support the introduction of these resolutions, which gives us some sense of their interest in moving forward. I will also note that um, the other uh, jurisdictions jurisdictions had expressed some concerns with if if we'd all put something on our agenda day, let's say the county didn't move forward and a small jurisdiction like Capitola did move forward, you know, the impact that that could have not only to their businesses, but if the tobacco industry were to come after them, not being well resourced, but there was an expression that folks would want to bring something forward potentially in the first quarter of the next year should the county move forward today. Okay, I appreciate that. I mean, that's sort of the end of my questions, but I do think that, that that's actually a really important component for the efficacy of this, um, both from an equity standpoint, if we from the business perspective, but also from just an effectiveness of the overall ordinance. And we may want to consider um, thinking about how our ordinance is structured, not just from the timing of the 2027, but also uh, to some degree of, of even a contingency of these other communities doing this so that we're not on an island that way, because I mean, at the end of the day, this is about a, a setting a statewide precedent, I believe, and it's also about uh, being as effective as possible. We really can't be effective without uh, some of these other communities joining in. But uh, thank you both for bringing it forward, and I look forward to my colleagues' questions on those. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to our Health Services Agency and the Ad Hoc Committee for their considerable work on this. Um, as well as Sheriff Cummins and uh, uh, Koenig, uh, Supervisor Koenig, for their leadership in bringing this and their really investigation into how we can present something of this nature. Um, the, the health risks uh, associated with uh, cigarette smoking are, are well documented, as are environmental impacts on cigarette butts, na namely the filters that are littered on our beaches that we're talking about, and our roads and our parks and open spaces. And I do understand the concerns from retailers about the potential negative impacts of this ordinance on their overall revenue related directly to cigarette sales as well as, uh, as, well as other items that uh, people buy when they purchase a pack of cigarettes. And I understand that the county will face a loss of sales tax income. It may come and go uh, as was we experienced earlier with a, a, a similar situation. But when you contrast those concerns with the huge toll on the health of our residents and our environment, there's really no comparison, I don't think. Uh, I do understand that outlined filtered tobacco products in the county without similar uh, bans in adjacent jurisdictions it could cause smokers to purchase their items outside the unincorporated areas. Uh, and well, that should not deter us from leading on this. Um, both locally and statewide, I'm concerned about the effectiveness of it going alone, it's been mentioned. So I do support the proposal that has been brought to us 
but I believe that uh, that the ordinance be enforced, not be enforced until 2027, until a majority of jurisdictions in our county, that being the county and its four cities, um, adopt a similar ordinance. I hope that will provide at least some consistency and more measurable decreases in cigarette litter. So I think that any motion that's made, I think should be, uh, we should have it that a majority of our jurisdictions in the county follow what we were doing today. Supervisor Hernandez. may do today. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I think uh, I had the the fortune, or I'm not sure if it's fortunate, but uh, I've actually worked at a convenience store for quite a while during college. I actually worked at the 7-Eleven over in Scotts Valley back in 1997, which was a long time ago. And I was actually a longtime smoker. I don't give my age up, but since 1983, um, I quit. At the end of 2012, December 2012 was the last cigarette I ever had and haven't touched a cigarette since then. But, um, you know, I have to say, uh, I'm really taken back about the economic impact on some of the retailers and some of the jobs. And I would like to see a little more uh, detail about that as well. You know, having worked in that in, in retail, I know. I know for a fact that when people shop for cigarettes, they also pick up other stuff. So food, you know, drinks, whatever it may be, beer. So there's a lot and gas. So I know that there's a lot more economic impact than the 20, what was it, 25 to 55,000 suggests. You know, it's more than double that. I know that for a fact. Um, I would never go in there just to get a pack of cigarettes. I would double up my trip to make sure I go get some soda and, and a sandwich or something. So, you know, I think that I'd like to, our staff to look into that as well, to make sure that that economic impact is an accurate one, an accurate picture of an of a average customer that goes into these stores. Um, we're at a point where we're losing a lot of income, a lot of revenue in our county. Uh, we need to build up our, our coffers for our general fund. It's a difficult time to cut any sales tax revenue when we have, you know, negotiations, we have these these pending bills that we have with the with the uh, fires and the floods. So, you know, I'd like to find out if if there was a probably from staff, right, a little more detail on the economic impact. Okay. Um, Supervisor Koenig, any further questions or comments? Uh, I'll, I'll just make a couple of brief comments. I mean, first, I, I fully um, agree with the suggestions that we should make sure that we move forward together as a county uh, with the incorporated cities on this. Um, second, just want to briefly address uh, the economic argument. I mean, it's been pointed out that tobacco retailers are very well resourced and have spent hundreds of millions, probably billions of dollars to get more people to smoke their products. If we change regulation, they're going to keep doing that to adjust. And I actually, especially after seeing the thorough economic analysis that our staff did put together that said um, that after the flavored tobacco ban, demand, yep, took a little dip as people tried to had to adjust to it, but it came back as, as people did. I'm sure we'll continue to see more products that get people to smoke. And hopefully thanks to the action today without a toxic filter attached to it. Uh, you know, I also want to speak briefly to this fil uh, to this freedom argument. I mean, freedom for the wolves is death to the sheep. We have a six percent of our community that's smokers. Your freedom to smoke a cigarette with a toxic filter attached to it is impinging ninety four percent. The rest, the other ninety four percent of our freedom to enjoy a clean environment, and that's not counting the animals. So I think the choice is pretty clear here. Cigarette butts provide no health benefit to the smoker. They're the most littered item on the planet, and they're poisonous to our environment. Let's ban this toxic trash. All right. Um, 
Well, first, I just want to thank um, the board for the direction to form the subcommittee and for the support for us to go out and do this work. I think it's really important that we're responding to our community when they come to us with their concerns around plastic pollution and trying to address issues related to plastic pollution. Um, I do think that we've done a really good job of trying to address the, um, the some of the retailer concerns. I think one of the retailers who came to us when I spoke with them said, give us time. And, you know, there are other jurisdictions where they literally give them like three months. So Manhattan Beach has banned all tobacco products. Beverly Hills has banned all tobacco products. And we were trying to use a data-driven approach where we're saying, well, of the pollution that we're seeing on our beaches and in our community, what is the number one thing we're seeing? And it's these cigarette butts. So we're not seeing tin plastic tins of dip. We're not seeing vapes. We're not seeing those other products laid all over the place. We're finding this one specific product and we're trying to address this one specific form of pollution. And I'll also say that I also smoked for 10 years. And one of the things that I found was that if I wanted a cigarette, I would adjust my behavior if whatever I wanted wasn't around. So sometimes I'd go roll my own. Sometimes I'd have a, I'd buy a pack. Sometimes I'd tip it. Sometimes I'd use other forms of tobacco. And there's so many new forms of tobacco and nicotine products that are coming out these days that are alternatives to this. And that's what people need to be shifting towards if they're going to keep smoking. I mean, the preference is they quit. But I also want to speak to that is that, you know, when we talk about the sales tax revenue, it's like, let's think about how much money we spend on just educating people to not smoke. We have full time positions in the county where people are going out and doing education, telling people to not smoke. And so this is part of that effort to try to address that issue. And so we're, you know, we have to think about those costs, too. And then finally, I do want to just say that what hasn't been mentioned is also the cost as it relates to public health. Because we know that low-income communities and communities of color have been targeted um, by these products. And we know that many of those people may not have health insurance. And so where are they going to get treated? County public health. And so we have to not only deal with that cost of the litter that's being produced, but then we also have to treat those people and their health. And, um, and if you've ever known anybody who's had cancer, who's died from complications related to smoking, it's not pretty. And so I think what we're trying to do here is really you know, with all the knowledge that we have, move forward in a way that gives the retailers time, gives the community time, really helps us to educate folks and gives us time to bring the other jurisdictions on board. Because I will say that when the first flavor ban went into effect, um, it was started in the city of Santa Cruz. And it took two years in Scottsdale. It was the last city to join. And then that was when all the jurisdictions in 2022 had, had gotten on board. Um, but that's what we're trying to provide here is, is some time for us to really make sure that we can there's more information we need to get. We can. This will give us time to get that information. I mean, it'll give us time to engage with the other jurisdictions and you know really have all these policies hopefully going into effect at the at the same time, which will be two years from now. And so, um, I'm wondering if and maybe I, I'm looking to get a little bit of advice on this, but I mean, you know, with uh, the concerns that Supervisor McPherson brought up, in addition to the direction, I'm wondering if it would be amenable to the board to have the subcommittee send letters on behalf of the board to the other jurisdictions, um, letting them know of our intent today to move forward with this and encouraging them to adopt similar ordinances that align with our timeline. And maybe that's a question for other board members or supervising person, or if that's, uh, so maybe I'll ask supervising person. That's yeah. My, my preference would be that, um, the ordinance going to affect when we have a majority, uh, two other cities aside from us, should we pass this today? Uh, I would like to stick with that. I think um, I do not, I, I don't like to get in that head. I'm not in ever a habit of telling another jurisdiction what to do. That's a concern. But on the other hand, for the implementation of the carrying out this ordinance that if we should pass it, I think it's critical that we have some other uh, uh, jurisdictions to at least two of the four and we may get all four uh, to be part of this. So I would like to stick with that, but I am not the maker of the motion. I think it would be up to, uh, well, not the chair probably, but uh, Supervisor Koenig to, to make the motion, but that's where, where I am and how I feel at this point. So question for County Council, does this need to come back for a first read? If we uh, add another criteria to the implementation, um, which is that two, uh, two of the four cities would also need to implement a similar ban. No, I was just I was just uh, searching in the agenda for the exact um, place in the ordinance, <clears throat> but we can modify the implementation date if your board approves um, to be 
January 1st, 2027, or the date that at least two other jurisdictions in the county approve, whichever is later. Okay. It, and that I think that makes sense. If you just give me a minute, I can I can I can uh, propose some sp more specific language. I'm just pulling up the reference portion right now of the ordinance. I believe it's in the resolution section eight that the implementation date. So it's in the ordinance section eight, and I am still paging down to it. If you want to take a break, we can take a break or um, just give me a second here. Maybe take a moment to do everybody. Yeah, legal question for. Okay. I guess if we're going to take a break, I got one more question. Uh, Supervisor Koenig mentioned about the concerns of some of the cities in terms of legalities. Should we have any concerns in terms of legalities in no. doing this? No, it's this is this is absolutely legal for your board to do or not do. It's within your board's discretion. What what are the city's concerns? I wouldn't know. Oh. I don't know. What they have. Also, I just want to clarify. So the language you were proposing uh, just now, council was uh, implementation would be January 1st, 2027. Or, or uh, after two cities uh, in the county, within this county of Santa Cruz, uh, adopt a similar ordinance, whichever is later. However, I think what Supervisor McPherson and Friend are getting at is is that even if we get to 2027, we, we need at least two other cities to yeah. have adopted it. Not, and I, that language doesn't include that, right? It does. We include it because it would be whichever is later. So if so if it so basically what I would be proposing now I'm oh, right, right, of course, of course. is that is that section eight would be modified to say this ordinance shall take effect on the thirty first day after final adoption. Mm -hmm. Enforcement of subsection J of SCCC five point six zero point zero four zero shall begin January first, twenty twenty seven, or on the date that two additional jurisdictions in the county approve a similar ordinance, whichever is later. Perfectly said. I'm going to move the recommended actions with the additional language suggested by county council. I'll second. <laughs> Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll go to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So thank you all for that. And we will continue to, uh, you know, have outreach with the retailers so that they understand um, kind of what their options are and also with our communities so, so they understand what's happening on this item. And so uh, we'll take like maybe a two minute break and then we need to come back to deal with um, item number when two cities of four, I think it's 10. 10.
go ahead and keep going. We have one more item before we move into closed session. Um, we're going to move up item number 10 to the next item on our agenda. And so this item uh, is to direct the deputy CAO and director of community and development and infrastructure on the their designated to apply for the 2024 solutions for congested corridors program funding to continue with cycle three of the Watsonville Santa Cruz multimodal corridor program for close of the application period and take related actions. This is an um, item that's being brought forward by Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Friend, Supervisor Koenig is still out of the room, so maybe we could have you um, start us off on this item. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for take, moving the item up uh, a little bit today. So this item that's before you is in regards to an application that I'm sure all of you are, are well aware with both the current highway project and the SoCal project. This is the next phase of that. And uh, some years back when I was advocating to the California Transportation Commission for that first section of, this, of the congested corridors program to do the, the section of SoCal that includes Live Oak into Aptos as well as that section of the highway that's being built right now. Uh, this was one of the commitments that we had made is that we would be continuing this into another phase for the highway and this section of SoCal. Uh, and we also did this when we were make, uh, had our numerous community meetings and discussion of this. This is a once in a generation opportunity for us to fund things that are long overdue, in particular from a school safety standpoint, to have sidewalks and improved bike access to that area. Um, I don't foresee any situation in the next 10 or 20 years of us coming up with another funding mechanism to do this. This is a very well traversed area from the South County to North from a commuter standpoint. And for students that attend both the junior high there and Valencia Elementary who have been stranded due to storm damage in the last five years or so, this would provide additional access points and safety throughout that entire corridor. So um, I'm excited for us to move forward on this. I know that um, this board has been supportive of these efforts uh, previously. And so just to be able to have the bike improvements, the pedestrian improvements, the road improvements, the metro improvements, and the congestion related improvements for the thousands of folks that commute from the south to the north through that corridor, um, this is an important thing too. On top of that, um, I did have an opportunity to both see, speak to the chair of the California Transportation Commission, as well as the deputy executive director of the California Transportation Commission about this project, it's clear that this is an important element of the broader application for multimodality for both uh, ensuring the success of the overall highway project. And also they wanted to emphasize the flexibility on the funding structure. They're well aware of the challenges that the county is facing right now in regards to storm damage repair, the long, uh, the long time it's taken to get reimbursements from FEMA and uh, the overall difficulty of immediately identifying where this funding would come from. We are not required to obligate any funding today. As part of the application, we're supposed to identify where the funding's gonna come from. Uh, the CTC wanted to emphasize not just the flexibility, but also felt uh, that once this was overall approved, it does open up a whole new set of additional funding opportunities for us from the state level so that we wouldn't have uh, to bear that burden at the local level. Um, I do believe also the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission is on as well to answer questions regarding that, but I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig for additional comments before other board members. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Uh, and thank you for doing so much additional light work uh, about the potential for other funding sources and uh, the timeline here. Um, you know, part of the reason that I was excited to bring this forward with you is that I mean, when we look at opportunities to invest our community, uh, invest in our community, so often there it's, it's yes or no. Uh, are we going to do this? Um, and, or I should say a now or never uh, situation. And so we saw that with building sewer, uh, a sewer line up to the San Lorenzo Valley, we chose not to, and it's probably never gonna happen at this point. Uh, we've seen it with putting in sidewalk network, um, you know, places like Sumner in the second district. Uh, we had funding for that, turned it down. And so I, I think if I was trying to explain uh, 10 years from now to my kids why there was not a sidewalk in Aptos and it was because, well, you know, we just, it was, it's kind of a difficult time and we just decided not to, to go for the grant. Um, that, that's a kind of a lame excuse. Uh, we really need to build out this uh, safe walking and biking infrastructure. Um, you know, it's this part of SoCal, granted, it's not as busy as the first segment, but it's still 10,000 people a day. It's, and it's a huge number. It's one of our most used roadways in the county. And uh, we really have a great opportunity to move forward with this project now because of our partners with the Regional Transportation Commission. We, this has always been a combined approach. It won us 
I think the largest transportation investment uh, in our community's history, $107 million uh, for the first phase of the SoCal Drive project and the highway, uh, actually, I think phase one and two of the highway project. And it was because we looked at this as a complete package of how we were going to improve not only Highway 1, but uh, what we affectionately call Highway 2 as well, SoCal Drive. Um, and in doing so, we're going to improve transportation, not just for cars, but also for bikes, pedestrians, uh, and transit. And, you know, if you, if you go through parts of, uh, my district and the second district, uh, into Aptos today, um, it, it's really exciting to see that infrastructure going in. Um, the, um, even like just the pedestrian islands in the middle of SoCal Drive, right? I mean, that just makes it so much easier to cross the street. Um, and I know it's really going to activate the uh, entire community around there. So I think we've got to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, and we've got to continue to invest in our, our core urban areas like this. All right. Um, with that, I'll open up to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. Please approach the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. I thought we were going to be doing eight, but this is just fine. You know, it's amazing. I lived in Tokyo, Japan twice in my life. I lived in Milan, Italy, Paris, France, L.A., San Francisco, uh, Palo Alto. I must say the worst traffic I've ever experienced in my life is in Santa Cruz County. And this is all from the agendas that you guys are rubber stamping. And you guys are like lipstick on a pig. The Hegelian dialectic. In order for people to be effectively manipulated, they must first think they're not being manipulated effectively. So that's all you guys are doing. I mean, when you look at that corridor and the raping of the trees and the short sections where you're whiting stuff, it's a joke. It's, it's like the worst example of what the community actually needs. I'm not quite sure what else to say. I took a three quarters of a page of notes in this short dialogue. But you know, it's, um, uh, what's going on with FEMA and you guys waiting for some money? Didn't FEMA just declare bankruptcy? And haven't at least now six sheriffs out of the 3,100 sheriffs in this nation have been asking for local militias, specifically for FEMA, because they are stopping helping people. Now, I don't have time to go into all the good and bad things of FEMA. Obviously, there's good and bad in all of us. I'm not perfect. I'm not trying to be perfect. But I am inviting some change. Um, now back to the 27 intersections where there's an independent fiber optic. Those are all weapon stations. Anybody can do their own research. Human being can only see 5% of the light spectrum. Those lights and stuff, that technology, we already have the surveillance tracking. I think I'm not on the list. I'm on a bunch of lists. You might as well be on the top one. I'd like to see all of you men on the list of changing and doing things more better for society. Because some of you have children. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to us on this item? Sure. You know, I'll, when we come back, I'll open up for staff. Um, seeing none here in public, anyone online? We do have callers online, Chair. Rebecca, your microphone is now available. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, if you've ever attempted to walk or ride a bike, use a stroller, a walker, or a wheelchair, you know, anywhere along SoCal Drive between Aptos Library and Freedom Boulevard, you likely experience the excitement and challenge of navigating to your destination. You know, this narrow, non long neglected segment of SoCal Drive is frequently referred to as the Aptos Choker because it carries part of the daily commute for Aptos often in standstill traffic, along with children on foot, bikes and skateboards traveling to Valencia Elementary, Aptos Junior High, and on to Aptos High School. And these students need safe passage, just like those attending schools between Harbor High and La Vista Elementary. Aptos Village was developed to encourage the use of nearby transit with expanded and more frequent metro service now running along this corridor Providing safer routes to bus stops will encourage more residents to ride the bus. And the construction of Segment 12 of the rail trail will also bring more people to the area, requiring commensurate safety infrastructure to accommodate them. 
Now, all these people require much less space than vehicles and should receive safety measures equal to those who drive. And drivers need roadways clearly marked and separated where possible from everyone else so they can better navigate through this congested safety, congested area safely. You know, because no funding is required at this time to complete the application for the next phase of this project, please direct the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure to apply for the program funding to continue. The longer we wait to fix this, the more it will cost both in dollars and possibly in lives. Thank you. Todd, your microphone is now available. Thanks. My name is Todd Marco. I'm a resident of Aptos and executive director of Nicene Rio Gateway, which is a local nonprofit aimed at supporting safe and active transportation through and around Aptos. We have a really special and incredible community here with outsized opportunities to enjoy nature, recreation, restaurants, and, and education. We have an excellent and newly redeveloped library, as well as a historic core that's also being redeveloped. We have great schools near town, including Aptos Junior High, as well as Valencia and Mar Vista Elementary Schools. We also have the promise of a world-class rail trail connecting directly to the heart of Aptos. Problem is active transportation to, from, and through the south and east parts of Aptos really heavily rely on this treacherous strip of SoCal Drive that runs from Freedom Boulevard to Aptos Street. This is a stretch of roadway where cars zoom and pedestrians are completely unprotected by the safety of a sidewalk. Phase one of the SoCal Drive redevelopment project is a big benefit, but phase two is even more vital. Pedestrians and cyclists should not have to risk their lives to travel between Aptos Village and Aptos Junior High or Polo Grounds County Park. If phase two of the SoCal Drive redevelopment project is removed from the upcoming grant application, there's a strong concern that the completion of this project may be deferred indefinitely, just as Supervisor Koenig emphasized. Thank you very much. Chris, your microphone is now available. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Chris Peterson, Aptos resident living in the historic district in Aptos Village. Uh, with the SoCal Drive redevelopment removed from the grant application, this is very concerning. Uh, I'm a new dad. My wife and I welcomed our baby daughter eight months ago. We we're incredibly lucky to also have neighbors across the street with a five-month-old baby that our daughter will soon and hopefully get uh, play with. The hope is that they can learn how to ride their bikes on Bernal Street. Even better, they can even learn from other young children that also live in the Aptos Street and Bertle Street neighborhood. But the reality is, it's very... This morning, 7.30, I went outside for 10 minutes and observed 33 vehicles used as a through street, of which 12 did not stop at the stop sign at the intersection of Aptos Street and Bertle Street. And unfortunately, on August 29th, just two weeks into the new school year, the young kid was biking to school and was hit by a car in front of our home. For these reasons and future events that will happen, I request that the SoCal Drive redevelopment be added back into the grant application. This will go a long way in ensuring the safety of the kids, not just in our neighborhood, but also all the kids in the community that use this street to get around town. All children's safety depends on it. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, with that, I'll bring it back to the board um, for questions, comments. Um, I think um, Director Machado had, was, was approaching, so I'll see if you want to respond or if you have anything to say. Well, if he's going to come up, I do have some questions for him as well. Uh, I wanted to find out uh, what would be the cost of this project like for us, yeah. or if there's any grants available, and would this project... Uh, or is this project going to eventually take away from our identified priorities that we have, road uh, project priorities that we have? Yeah, those are great questions. So good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Uh, Matt Machado, your CDI director. And uh, I was planning to touch both of those items because that is the crux of the situation here. And I've got to tell you, it's such a strange feeling to come up here and speak against such a great project. But that's exactly what I have to do because... We're in a situation today that we just can't afford it. And um, I'll tell you what we can't afford is the local match is going to be north of $6 million for this project. 
that's a big match. And, and it's, it's not because the grant doesn't cover construction. It does, but it doesn't cover design. It doesn't cover a few other pre-construction elements that are going to, that are going to be more than $6 million. And so that's the rub, but here's why $6 million is such a problem for us today. And, and this is why I really can't support what's, what's before you this morning or this afternoon. So the budget that your board approved back in May, um, we identified a handful of storm damage projects. We put everything we've got into that group of storm damage projects that we plan to deliver over the next three to four years. So for the next three to four years, we're tapped out. And even with that said, with that small group of projects in the queue and doing good work, those are the critical projects. We still have nearly a hundred storm damage projects that we haven't touched yet. And we can't touch until that first pack, package of projects are done three to four years from now. So we are way out on storm damage and that's a problem for us. In addition, because of all the storm damage, both this past year and 2017, we're still making debt service. So on the 2017 event, that we still haven't fully recovered from, we're still making $700,000 a year debt service out of the road fund. So another reason why we can't go and dedicate more than 6 million to a really, really great project. And then the other point on the budget is, is same, is on the 23 storms, we had to issue debt to pay for it because we were tapped out. We're making debt service on that for the foreseeable future, about 2 million a year of road funds. So another reason we can't afford $6 million into a really, really great project. Last year, we've had some great success. I heard Supervisor Friend say we've had great success with grants. Last year, we secured $14.2 million from the RTC through the Consolidated Grant Program. But to spend that $14.2 million, we have to match it with $3.2 million of our local funds. A good deal but we have not yet identified that 3.2 million, but we fully plan to, fully plan to, but it's already a stretch for us to identify a $14 million grant that we've already received that we need to match to, to spend. And by the way, all these items are board priorities. So Supervisor Hernandez, you asked, are we working on board priorities? Yes, we are. The storm damage that was prioritized and budgeted, the, the RTC grant that was awarded and accepted, those are those are high priorities of ours. And then we're talking about SoCal Drive today. Well, the phase one is not yet done. And that was a high priority and a great opportunity for us. We secured $16 million of grants, but the match on that one, it looks like it's gonna be right at 14 million. And uh, a little more than 3 million of that is still a gap in our funding plan. And yet it's under construction. We hope it wraps up next spring, summer, and by then we have to figure out how to fill that $3 million gap. So now we have this, 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 you know, this situation we're in, storm damage, grants that aren't fully matched yet. And we're working desperately to, to do that. And then just two more items and I, I won't take up any more time. You look at our deferred maintenance, our system today and, and how we're able to, um, to maintain it, our PCI, Pavement condition index continues to go down. We're gonna see that again this summer or this next summer, uh, that number is going down. And the culvert liability is going up. We have $1 billion deferred maintenance. So that's it. It's an enormous need. This year, this budget cycle, we had to reduce our road operation maintenance by 16%. And guess what? That's in direct contrast with projects like SoCal Drive because the phase one with all the new great signals and great congestion relief and safety improvements comes with a price tag, a maintenance price tag. We're estimating it'll cost about an additional $100,000 a year to maintain those really great improvements that we're building today. It's necessary, it's good to invest in, but with a 16% cut in our budget and now increased cost because of the delivery of a great project, it's a really difficult combination. And then going into this winter, here we are in October. Going into this winter, right now, we have six roads closed and we have about 100 storm damage projects that are unrepaired that are susceptible to more damage. And we don't have much of a contingency plan for the winter. So we're, we're living on a hope and a prayer. And so not only can we, can we not find extra money to go pursue you know, great ideas and great projects, we're barely gonna try to survive this winter. And then lastly, lastly, um, one of the things that keeps me awake at night now is 
if we do pursue this grant, we're already behind the eight ball on it. We're already behind on schedule. The rest of the, the project partners on this, they've already got full designs done. We have 0% design done, zero. So we don't really have time. If we pursue this, we need to start design now. And that $6 million is the design. So we don't really have time to wait and see because if we're gonna be serious about pursuing this grant, we need to start design now so we can catch up with our partners and that, you know, hoping we get awarded, which I think there's a good chance we have good projects, but if we get awarded, we can hit the ground running in construction in two years or two and a half years, something like that. But that's what it takes to, to do this project, start design now, which we don't have the $6 million and it's a lot of pressure to divert all of our board priority attentions into this new effort. So. I know it's a little windy, but I needed to share that because it, it gives me a lot of concern and it it's really unfortunate having me speak against a really great project, but that's the spot I'm in today. Certainly answer any questions you may have. So basically you're confirming that our, our identified priorities would be cut off the chopping block if we were to go for this. And there is a fair chance we'd be in that desperate position. I am, um, you know, Maybe it's not my role here to say this, but um, I know we have a good partnership with RTC and I know they voiced some interest in taking the lead and being the sponsor and being the implementer of this project. Maybe that's an opportunity where this board could direct us to make to make that pitch to their commission, which we have good representation on. Maybe that's an alternative that could be considered today. Yeah, that would be viable too. Um, Is, is there any opportunities, uh, I think maybe our RTC director can also answer this, but is there any opportunities to cover that almost $7 million that's still left in matching funds? So cover with a grant, another yes. grant? With another grant, ATP or whatever there is. Right. It's a good thought. Um, it is extra difficult to match a grant with a grant. And so, you know, that um, specific monies don't always line up. So it's very difficult. Yes, we could all say there could be opportunities, whether it's IIJA money, you know, through SS4A, which is Safe Streets for All. And I know there's a lot of acronyms in our industry, but anything's possible, but I will tell you it's not likely. It's definitely not likely. We should not go into this with that hope and a prayer that we're gonna find a grant to match a grant. Theoretically possible, highly unlikely, highly, especially due to the timing. Hello, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Sarah Christensen. I'm the Executive Director with the Regional Transportation Commission. Um, and I've been leading the development and implementation, excuse me, of the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program over the last five years, which is a sustainable transportation program that is trying to develop and adapt our transportation system to be more sustainable. Um, and it involves a comprehensive set of multimodal improvements, including Highway 1, including the rail line, and including Soquel Drive. These are three critical cross-county routes that need improvements in order to adapt to be um, in a more sustainable situation. This program depends heavily on the partnership with the local jurisdictions, as well as the transit district, as many of the improvements along Soquel Drive as part of the project that's before you today uh, will benefit the transit district with transit signal prioritization, as well as improvements to uh, bus stops and shelters. A lot of the uh, bus stops out there are just signs in the dirt on the side of SoCal Drive. So this is a, a great opportunity that may pass us up since uh, we're going to be proceeding with our grant application regardless. And um, our package is highly competitive. If awarded, um, RTC does not have any subsequent projects that we will be pursuing this particular grant program for. So that's really critical to understand because um, RTC is um, preparing the grant application on behalf of the county. We spend a significant amount of resources doing so. We spend between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars just to pull together the grant application in staff time and consultant services. And all we need from county is information and to collaborate with staff. Um, and just 
We're committed in uh, supporting the county and identifying and pursuing funding to make this project come to fruition. So I can answer questions if you have any as well. So I, I know that we'll also need the seven million, but is there any is there any opportunity for RTC to become the lead agency on this? Anything's possible with commission approval. If commission direct staff to take over the project, we could very well do that. I will say that we just um, completed a very extensive restructuring process and we have a very small um, department of capital project delivery. Um, we're not currently in a position to take on any more work because we have two positions that are vacant in that department out of four people. So half the department is understaffed. And if we're starting to take over and, and deliver larger projects like this, in addition to the highway program, the rail project, we'd need to probably look at our staffing again for uh, capital project delivery. So that's a consideration for the commission. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, may I ask a question of the executive director? Is that possible? Sure, go ahead. All right. I, I just want to, I mean, first, I just want to say, and I, I understand it was with good intention of our deputy CAO, but there was a lot of, I was disappointed in the amount of editorializing that was going on. I was just thinking in my 12 years, I've never really heard that kind of, that level of editorializing. But, I mean, in my experience, I just want to ask this to the executive director, um, and not just with the CTC with my experience, but in my direct conversations, as I had said with the chair and the deputy director who oversees this, they both seemed confident in a few things. One, the funding, um, that the success of this overall package opens up new opportunities for funding for the county to fund it. And two, that this whole thing is flexible um, to the point where, because I had asked, I'd said, you know, if there is a significant winter, for example, or a couple of winters, um, have has anybody ever pulled out of something like this due to extenuating circumstances? And the case was yes, generally because costs actually escalated, but there was an understanding of this. Is your understanding, because you work the closest with the CTC of all the folks here, that I think Supervisor Hernandez's key question is just whether the funding is a realistic possibility in the next uh, three or so years, if not more. I know there's extensions often granted on these projects. But what is your sense of the funding availability that would be made available to the county for this? Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Um, the funding outlook is uncertain. I will say that um, the RTC every two years goes through a consolidated grant um, process where we have all the local jurisdictions as well as the transit district. Um, apply for grants from the RTC. So that's definitely a possibility in 2025 for the county to uh, apply for that um, program. And I would say it is it is challenging to get any grant really, but um, there are possible paths forward with potential federal funds. Um, you can apply for federal funds if you've um, if you've obtained a state grant. And, you know, there's federal earmarks that are possible. There's um, many, many IIJA programs that focus on safety. And this, you know, that's a huge benefit to this project is that it improves safety significantly. So am I correct in thinking based on what you had said a minute ago and what Supervisor Koenig has said is that if the county doesn't apply for this now, there's no future intention that this will ever be included in any sort of project that we would be able to get funded. Correct. The RTC, who again spends significant amount of resources applying for this particular program, will not be um, seeking future rounds of funding within the foreseeable future. We don't have a bench of additional projects yet that uh, maybe give us a couple, you know, seven to 10 years and we'll have another project you know, maybe on the highway or on, uh, along one of those three corridors to apply for. But um, this is definitely the opportune time. This is the final leg of the Highway 1 program. It includes uh, the Coastal Rail Trail, and it all integrates with SoCal Drive. And so it's really the comprehensive um, aspect of this project that makes it competitive. I appreciate that. I mean, this is a challenging situation. I understand what Public Works is dealing with. And to me, 
Not applying makes the decision. Applying affords the opportunity for continued ability to identify the funding. I recognize that we have to identify where that funding is, and I heard Director Machado's commentary about the design components. My conversations with the CTC, they understand this is this project's going to be toward the end of that time window, if not longer. So that's my concern is that if the board kills the project today, then we've, we've functionally have at a minimum have killed it for a generation, but I would say it's killed it forever. If the board moves forward with the application process, um, a future board is going to be having these discussions about whether that money that we identified actually materializes or not. And that's a different discussion to be having then at that time. And I think that that's the most appropriate policy decision to make than just um, ending uh, really a life safety opportunity for um, thousands of people that use that every single day uh, because we didn't have the creativity to think through it as, as it appears to be being proposed by staff right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, any comments? Boy, this is, um, you know, a reality check. If, um, and I have had some previous thoughts, but, um, and I appreciate um, the outlook of, our, of uh, Director Machado uh, on the community development inf infrastructure and their limitations, but I just uh, don't think there's any, any gain in not going forward with this and try to do this cooperative. I mean, you're right. Uh, looking back, way back when, uh, the sewer project up to the valley, and once it's gone, it's you're never going to have it. That could have been 87% funded at the time. But um, I think that we, we when this board is was considering accepting a TC, uh, CTC grant uh, for segments 10 and 11 last spring, and Supervisor Koenig and I temporarily uh, delayed accepting the grant because uh, we wanted we had some legitimate financial concerns. We learned that the CTC can be flexible. So I, I just don't, um, knowing that it's, it's now or never pretty much, I think the county uh, and RTC staff uh, requested a grant extension to give us that time to find the funds to cover the expense, uh, extra expenses in the previous projects I just mentioned. Uh, but I'll, I'll support acknowledging that the county will have uh, difficulty in providing any matching funds, uh, but the county and the RTC need to work together to seek other sources of funding for the match. So. I'm ready to go forward with it because I believe we do it now or we're never going to get it. Sure. Let's see what other this. So, you know, I'm concerned that we do have a lot of priorities throughout our county, my district, your district. And essentially, this, this is the funding that we're going to use up. And you know, I'm concerned about also the process that we use. This is the reason that last meeting we brought up uh, a tool, a funding mechanism for emergency projects. But I think we got to further elaborate on how we bring up road projects. Bring them, bringing them up like this, there was a monkey wrench in all our county's budget, our you know general fund, our roads budget. So we have to figure this out, um, but I, I'm really concerned that it is going to eat a lot of our uh, emergency road funds, a lot of our priorities that we've already identified and agreed upon and voted on. So I'm really concerned. I would like to, say, you know, if I were to move forward, I'd I would like to have an assurance. You know, um, our RTC director said we can possibly get grants. But I'd like to get assurance that we don't use no general fund money or Measure K money, especially because we talked to the voters about what Measure K money was going to be used for. So that that would be my only, I guess, uh, input. Sure. Do as a Uh Well, first of all, I'd say of course we should use Measure K money. We promise the voters roads. That's what we know voters want, and ten thousand people use this road every day. It's it's highly trafficked. I mean, we had a very obtuse conversation at our last meeting about a formula. I didn't think it was particularly productive. I think it's much more productive to talk about it in terms of concrete projects like this. And if we're creating priorities, this one is pretty much at the top of my list. It's not one that I would cut. Um, I, I, would, you know, I, I recognize the budget's tight, and it's going to be challenging. We've got $4.5 set aside in contingencies. 
God's grace, we won't have to spend it all on emergency repairs this, uh, this winter, and we'll be able to decide on how we can invest that in our road infrastructure in the future. So that's one potential source. Um, our executive director from the RTC also mentioned the consolidated grant awards that will happen uh, at the end of 2025. I'll point out Escalona and the city of Santa Cruz got $3 million for a sidewalk and bike project. I don't know what the traffic is off the top of my head on Escalona, but it's not 10,000 people a day. And so I think that this is a pretty good candidate for the consolidated call. We know that uh, whether it's federal um, federal money, state money, um, or even our own RTC and how we uh, allocate funds locally, we're prioritizing these kinds of projects. I think it's highly competitive, and I don't think it's one that we can afford to let go. I guess I'll make some comments. Um, first, I just want to appreciate um, the work that's gone into this and um, the acknowledgement of you know really trying to continues to fund funds to help with these types of road repair projects. But I, I do share some concerns with the fact that, you know, it seems like there's already current gaps in funding for some of the projects that we're already moving forward with. And, you know, I think after the last two winters, the, what's really come to the surface is that there are a lot of emergency storm projects that we need to, that have also been prioritized. So, for example, I know that Paulson Road, we heard from a lot of folks, they want us to move forward with fixing that. We hear from everybody about Mountain Charlie and how they want to see a solution for that. And so we have all these priorities that we've outlined and said we're, we, it's our priority, but then at the same time, we don't have funds. And then here's another one that's like, now we have another priority. And so, I mean, I, I feel like if every time there's there's an opportunity, we make that a priority, we forget about the previous commitments we've made. And I just get concerned about you know, the fact that we were promising things to people and, um, you know, we might not necessarily have the funding to actually, um, you know, return to actually build the projects that we're saying that we're going to try to build. In addition to when we went out for Measure K and campaigning on that, roads were one piece, but there were so many other pieces to what people want to see in terms of different programs and new programs at the county. And we haven't had that discussion. I actually... Um, and reached out to CAO's office and I had spoke with Nicole Co Coburn about potentially bringing something forward because while we needed to get the budget approved to meet the state deadlines, we've never actually had a conversation since the lawsuit was settled on Measure K as to what we want to prioritize those funds for. And so I would hate to see us put ourselves in a situation where we obligate ourselves to having to pay for something like this and then we're not able to, you know, complete all the other things that we promised the voters because we have to take all that money and put it into the specific project. So I'm I'm really torn because I really want to see you know, as, you know, not miss out on a grant, but, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we do have an opportunity to, to advocate at, to our state legislative representatives that these are the kinds of projects we would like to see um, funded from the state as well with the hopes that they will be able to provide funding to some of those other agencies for these kinds of projects in the future. Um, so, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm not sure the best direction that I'd like to take, but I do, you know, share some concerns with um, Supervisor Hernandez. If if RTC can come up with all the money, they can apply for the grant and they can come up with the funding, then I'd say let them take over the project and then that would be a good way to approach it. But I, and it sounds like there might be some interest in the director doing that. Um, and so I'd be comfortable with, I mean, given what we heard from the director of the RTC, I'd be comfortable with, you know, sending this project and I'm sure the best way to do it, whether it's a letter, but really encouraging and having them take over this project because, you know, if, if they're, if they're that invested and interested in it, then it sounds like, you know, we as an agency aren't able to do that at this time, but let's give it to you all. And, and that way we can continue working together and we can provide some staff input. And, and I think I remember her saying that, you know, they want to be able to work with staff and be able to get, you know, support from staff, but that they'd be willing to take over the project. And so maybe that's a, kind of middle ground that we can come to so that we can continue working on our priorities, especially with the disaster projects, and then RTC can continue working on this project as has been identified as a priority of theirs. Mr. Chair, what I'd be open to on this, and, and perhaps this doesn't have your support or Supervisor Hernandez's support, but that's that's okay. That's how this goes, is that um, I think that we move forward with the recommended actions. I'm comfortable with that additional direction by the way, an agency's responsibility can shift during the granting period. That also was something that the CTC had said. So I think that 
what I am hearing common ground on is there is not an interest in foreclosing on the opportunities, just the, the means by which we do it. I don't want it to be contingent upon an RTC. This is due in November. This might seem last minute, but these discussions were going on for quite some time before the decision was made that the county wasn't going to move forward with this. That's why this is coming forward to you today. It's, it's sort of odd to actually have an item directing to apply for a lot of money. But what I would be open to is, is just adding, if, if my colleague, if Supervisor Koenig is open to it, is the recommended actions with um, the discussion, the continued discussion with the RTC to consider such a thing. Um, all of you, all of us, I mean, sit on the RTC, so that's a discussion that can continue there. But I didn't want to preclude, uh, based on the timeline, this application. But I mean, if that happens in a year, that happens in two years, and that's a funding component, I think that that's totally reasonable as an option. As she had said, that all options were on the table. She had mentioned a staffing thing, but I didn't want to make it contingent upon, because uh, I don't think it would be able to be possible in that short amount of time. So I'll, uh, I don't know if Supervisor Koenig is comfortable with that, then, then I could do it as a recommended action. And uh, so I'll move the recommended actions with additional direction that the deputy CAO work with the executive director of the RTC for consideration of the RTC moving forward to take over the project um, from both a management and financing standpoint. Um, I wanna make clear that that's not, that this isn't contingent upon that, but that's an additional component um, that uh, can provide some flexibility moving forward. Second. Yeah, is there any further discussion on this item? So, Supervisor Nett. is there anything that pins us legally to funding this if we don't have the money to do it at some point, if we are awarded? Let's say no. this winter we have a devastating right. storm and we have to pay 60 million. Right, I understand. Uh, yeah, no, this is not a commitment. No, we still have opportunity to to rethink this next year if we get the grant. What they would expect from us if we get the grant that we would execute a baseline agreement probably next summer, and that's when you commit. So we have some time to make a hard commitment. Today would just be um, non-monetary committal commitment, but clearly expectations committed, that would be it. Okay, do we have a second to the motion? I second it, okay. So we have a motion by Supervisor Friend with additional direct uh, direction from Supervisor Koenig. And I guess, I mean, I'm a bit torn, but with that information, it sounds like if this came back, if we got the grant and this comes back, then we'd have to decide at that point whether we want to move forward with funding it or not. And that would largely be on the county and not so much on the RTC or any other funding sources that are out there. It would be unless we were able to go to the RTC commission and convince them to take lead on it, then it'd be their decision. So, I mean, I think I heard that clear that we could try that. It's not a, you know, either it's not a exclusion from us pursuing, but it could be an additional help. It's part of the motion. Part of the motion. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you all for bringing this forward, and I, I'm, I I support the intent. I'll probably have to vote no on this today, but should we be able to, you know, find other funds? And my hope is that the RTC would actually be willing to fund this, um, so that we can continue addressing all the disasters as well as you know our priorities. And so, with that, I'll turn to the clerk for roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig, aye. Friend, aye. Hernandez, aye. McPherson. And Cummings. No. And so that passes with Supervisors McPherson, Hernandez, Friend, Koenig voting in favor, and Cummings voting opposed. And so um, with that, you know, I think we can probably get through the next two items without having to go into closed session. They're going to be pretty brief. So why don't we, can, if there's no you know, um, desire to go into closed session right now and go to lunch, we can just keep rolling. Okay. Item number eight, consider approving in concept an ordinance enacting chapter 8.58 Santa Cruz County Code regarding restrictions on the Bureau of Land Management administered Catoni Coast Dairies unit of the California Coastal National Monument, Santa Cruz County, and approve CEQA exemption take related actions. Um, this is an item that I brought forward. I was going to um, have the director from BLM on, but I I did not text him in time to, to join the call. But really, um, as the Catoni Coast Area's monument opens, um, there's a lot of enforcement they have on their property. And um, they found that it would be really helpful if um, we aligned our county code with the Sheriff's Department with their code in case that they need support or in case they're 
<clears throat> violations that are occurring uh, where the sheriffs may be able to step in and provide law enforcement. And so um, that's the reason for really bringing it forward today is really aligning those two codes. I see there's a representative from the sheriff's department if there's any comments or questions on this, um, but that's the main intent of this is to, to align. I agree. I, I think this is an incredibly valuable uh, resource in our county. It makes sense that we uh, would uh, want to have a, a mechanism that's similar to the federal regulations. Um, and I, I would have a couple questions from, uh, I think there's representative of the sheriff's department about, uh, they, 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 they have a tight, um, well, they don't have a bunch of uh, extra deputies to patrol this. Uh, how do you anticipate the ordinance would impact your operations? Um, and is it common for parklands to have a uh, signage that protects provides a contact information for reporting? I mean, who would they report to? Is you or who do you think at first? Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Um, I'm Jacob Ainsworth, the Chief Deputy of Operations with the Sheriff's Office. Um, yes, we have some concerns about the calls for service that we're probably going to see um, with the increased number of people showing up in this area. Uh, we will continue to prioritize these calls for service, respond to them uh, accordingly. The concern is, is that there, there will be some competitiveness with these calls for service from the San Lorenzo Valley area, the Soquel and Live Oak areas. That's where we would be pulling deputies from to respond up to the coastal dairies um, uh, property. If correct, and we see tens of thousands of people visit this area every year, we do believe that we're going to see some increased issues with traffic, uh, criminal activity, calls for service from the sheriff's office, um, and, you know, big concerns with things like search and rescue missions, which are very labor intensive uh, types of operations that will take away from my regular staffing. So I have some pretty significant concerns about our ability to respond to calls if we're up there, but how is it actually going to affect uh, the rest of the community? All right. And um, excuse me, do you anticipate any uh, signage? I mean, that if this just goes into effect, that they would contact you first, or who who would they might con? Do you know at this point? Can you say? Yeah, it's my understanding that, that these ordinance will be posted up there as 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 a, as as a way for them to report if they need to. So that we it would it would be first to call the sheriff's office for us to make a determination about how we're going to respond. Um, I don't believe that we're going to get any type of assistance from the Bureau of Land Management. Um, as 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 we have seen in the past, we tried to negotiate with them or have discussions with them about adding staffing to this location. Um, those have since fallen apart. Uh, a lot of it has to do with cost, but um, it will be us that responds up there, and the expectation will be that they will be calling us. Yeah, this is just a tremendous valuable asset that we have here in the county, and uh I think we got to do this as in coordination as best we can, but I think it'd be really good that uh, we have maybe an annual, well, the future boards have an annual report on the impact it's had and the response efforts of, of uh, what, it, what it's taken the sheriff's department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions from board members? Seeing none at this time. Oh, Supervisor Brown. Actually, if I could get... Um, the under sheriff to come back up for a quick brief second Ains, um Ainsworth. But I just had a the report says that the sheriff's office had reviewed the ordinance and supports it. I mean your your language is a little more guarded. I just want to see where you are on on this so that we have a sense. Yes, we we do believe, uh, Supervisor Friend, that, that we're going to need to provide some um, services up there. The Bureau of Land Management is not going to be able to do that. The Sheriff's Office knows that if there's ordinance that is in fact that we're going to need to handle these calls for service. You just don't, and I apologize, I made you the undersheriff two months in advance of, of your okay. question. But um, uh, you, you're just saying from a staffing perspective, it's going to be a challenge to actually do it. That's correct. I, this is not an area that we staff um, around the clock like we do other areas of the county. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, so I'll open up for public comment. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak to us on this item. I'd like to speak to us, please approach the mic up two minutes. Seeing none, I'll see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. We have no callers online. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, I will say my, my understanding and conversations that I had with BLM is that they, they're going to have enforcement up there. So I'm happy to follow up with them just to get a sense of what their enforcement protocols are, are going to be and how many people they're going to have up there because I definitely don't want to see us open this national monument and then the enforcement be put on the county when they they're you know 
there should be federal resources that are going in to support that, and it shouldn't fall just on the county. So be happy to reach out and see if they can share that information with board members as well so it's pretty clear on what their enforcement plan will be. But with that being said, should they need support from the board or from the county, if we didn't have an alignment with our ordinances, with their policies, then our sheriff's department wouldn't be able to go up there and actually enforce because there'd be no um, ordinance or laws on the books for that enforcement to occur. And so I just really want to appreciate the sheriff's department for aligning our policies with BLM. And um, and then just and to Supervisor McPherson's point, I really want to, um, you know, make sure that we have a report back on what the impact of the new visitorship is on our law enforcement agency to make sure that we're not getting overwhelmed um, with this, the new opening of this park. And so uh, with that, if there's no further questions or comments, I'd like to see you entertain a motion on this item so we can keep moving. Second. So motion by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez, and I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Brent? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously and brings us to our last item on our regular agenda. Consider approving establishment of secure youth treatment facility and ranch camp at Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall approving concept ordinance adding chapter 2.130 to the Santa Cruz County Code establishing Redwoods Coastal Academy at Juvenile Hall and take related actions and alternative staff from our uh, probation department. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings, Board of Supervisors. Pleasure to be here today. Um, today I'm here to present ex an exciting proposal that would utilize our existing juvenile hall facility up on Graham Hill Road as a secure youth facility, uh, as well as a ranch camp. Thank you. <laughs> so this proposal what it aims to do is just develop a secure youth track facility. And we, we just tend to call it around the state now an SYTF and ranch camp in our hall. Um, we have, we realize that real, you know, low, uh, rehabilitation is best occurring locally. As you are aware, we are sending our youth, our young people, emerging adults to Sonoma County, um, at as, as a, a pretty high cost to host our youth. And, uh, we, we believe we're totally capable of doing that here locally now. Um, this board's approval of this plan will align with our initiative um, and, and uh, uh, really be aligned with our juvenile justice realignment plan that we submit annually. Now it's to the Office of Youth and Community Restoration that has oversight over what we're doing. And really, this is really going to maximize the use of uh, our local resources and uh, improve financial efficiency. And I'll show you how in just a little bit. So as you recall, SB 823 signed into law on September 30th, 2020, closed the Division of Juvenile Justice and realigned that responsibility of youth who are committed to the state facility for certain uh, 707B serious offenses. Um, that realignment was given back to the counties. That was a big responsibility that the counties had to have. Um, so it was a transfer of responsibility at the state back to the local jurisdictions. Um, as you're well aware, when this occurred um, in 2021, when the uh, DJJ uh, Division of Juvenile Justice stopped intake, um, we did have uh, um, one youth. Uh, we had actually six youth eventually that were uh, housed in Sonoma County. Presently, we have two youth there um, and one transitioning very soon. So um, as, as adopted, SBA 23 emphasizes local rehabilitation, education, mental health treatment, family involving which will lead to better reentry outcomes. Um, particularly, as you can be aware, it's a challenge for our families to travel to Sonoma County to visit their youth. It's a, it's a hardship, it's a long distance, you know, to at least two or three hours. Although probation is uh, providing transportation to those families that are in need of that. Um, Santa Cruz County was allocated $984,000 in fiscal year 2023 under the realignment block grant. And as far as oversight and some accountability, the newly established Office of Youth and Community Restoration oversees this realignment process, ensuring accountability and support, supporting counties in implementing effective juvenile justice programs. So here's our rationale for developing an SYTF and ranch camp. Uh, it's, it's a, a strategic initiative really aimed at enhancing outcomes for our justice involved youth while maximizing local resources. 
Presently, we contract with Sonoma County for a cost of an annual commitment of $110,000 annually. Ranch camp commis commitments cost approximately $50, $55,000 annually. So when we send a youth away, uh, we're utilizing um, for ranch camps, particularly general fund dollars. For SYTF, we're currently using our state dollars that are realigned back to us. But there's some real key benefits. We're going to keep our youth closer to home, facilitate easier family visiting support, and foster better reentry because we could start families can be families and those support people can more easily uh, be in contact with the young people. Um, we have a decreasing population in the juvenile hall. Today we had 11. Most of this summer, we had five, but as you're aware, we have a 40 bed capacity. So we believe we do have the space to provide the programming necessary. Uh, we believe that be starting a ranch camp as well as our um, secure youth facility track in our juvenile hall will allow a step down and transition a program where youth would have the opportunity to furlough um, family. Uh, so youth can probably potentially attend community college or college or perhaps work um, and then come back. So those are opportunities if they're in the least restrictive program. Uh, SBA 23 revenues will will maximize those by freeing up general fund dollars. So we believe we can cover the cost of some of our juvenile hall staff that are paid for by existing um, uh, general fund dollars. So it'll be a, a definite savings to our county. We have the renovation project. Um, we actually um, are taking that out to bid very, very soon. Um, and I think uh, we're doing a walkthrough with uh, a number of folks that are, are going to bid on the project very soon. So that's the renovation in the juvenile hall and gymnasium, which would be great for programming. And we definitely need that. So it's timely. And we really we already have the Board of State and Community Corrections approval. We need state approval in order to open up a secure youth trap facility, and they've already uh, approved that. So they have confidence, and they have much said many times that, that we're well-equipped to, to open a program like this in our juvenile hall. So a little bit about just the financial impact overview. Um, our plan would utilize uh, some of the funding to cover the costs of three to four juvenile hall staff, freeing up general funds. As you know, housing our youth who are committed in our juvenile hall could save us up $110,000 per youth annually. And again, uh, we actually have in our budget up to $500,000 in general fund dollars to, uh, to utilize uh, when youth are sent to a ranch camp. So then we could keep those dollars locally and provide pre better programming once again. Um, so here's a detailed cost of what this looks like. We're really estimating an annual savings of $1.2 million by running a program locally. Um, that is to say, that's taking into account the $300 a day or $110,000 annual cost of sending youth to Sonoma. And again, the $55,000 or $522 cost it costs us to send youth to Ranch Camp. We've been using Camp Singer, and actually we use the James Ranch in Santa Clara, which is the $522. So um, we think we could do that. We've visited programs around the state. Um, we're seeing what programs they're do, you know, doing. We're grateful for a host in Sonoma, um, but we think we could do just as a, a job just as well as they can um, um, once we are able to start this if we're given the green light. A little bit about our juvenile hall. Uh, we've done studies. Um, we did a looked at the trend of 10 years from 2010 to 2020 when we knew realignment was coming. We had an average of uh, about two youth committed per year. They tended to range in age of 16 to uh, 16 to 18 years of age at that time. Um, their average length of stay was two years. We're taking the data into account to see, well, how, how is this going to impact us? Um, we have two units in our juvenile hall facility, A and B unit. Our proposal is to use A unit where we where we have uh, what we call more sophisticated young folks uh, with uh, unique needs. We're going to house the um, youth who are committed to the secure youth track and program those youth in a unit together. B unit is for our girls and younger young, younger folks who are um, in there for less less serious charges. Although I will say we have 11 youth in custody, and a, a very high number of them are in there for very serious violent felonies, up to murder or awaiting transfer to adult adult care court right now. Um, we all youth in the SYTF unit, uh, which is a unit, will also be uh, programming with the other youth in that program. So it'll be a great benefit to everyone who is in custody, not just youth who are in the SYTF. So our allocation to date, 
uh, since 2021, our SB allocation has been 2.5 million, and we've spent a considerable amount of that already because we've had youth in Sonoma County. We had, again, like I said, we had six, six youth there at one point. What we did have is when DJJ closed down, several youth were tra transferred. They're, they weren't uh, done with their base commitment, and then they finished their commitments, commitments in Sonoma County. So again, we're estimating a p potential a general fund savings of a maybe seven hundred thousand dollars and also there's an opportunity with cal aim coming on you're all you're all aware that cal aim the justice uh initiative uh would enable us to actually start billing for services through medi-cal 90 days prior to young people's release so counties could in theory are supposed to be reimbursed for those services through cal aim so that could free up some more some more general fund, uh, fund dollars we don't know the impact yet but we will know soon as soon as we go up online we will continue to pro provide comprehensive services. Clearly, there'll be unique services for these, this population. They're emerging adults or, or young adults because they could be housed up to 25 years of age. So that'll be something unique that we'll be working with our staff and partners in training and working with that population. So uh, we already do have enhanced medical and behavioral health services at the juvenile hall provided by our health services agency partners. Um, we know we, we're going to continue providing high school for, for young folks uh, through the County Office of Education. But what might be different? Well, we already have some kids occasionally are enrolling in college courses, but those who are um, aging, aging beyond 18 and have finished high school enrollment in community college or colleges uh, across the state, there's been some success stories of youth, young people in these uh, security track facilities. Just uh, in Santa Clara, had a young person graduate from Berkeley, California through these programs. So there, there is hope. Obviously, we will continue to provide life skills, um, spiritual and recreational programs for youth. And so uh, once we have the green light, we'll start uh, working with a lot of our partners to see how we can enhance those services. And we'll be using SBA 23 funds for that. The key part to any success from, uh, for young people from juvenile hall or the jail is the reentry services. That's essential component when they come back. Um, but we see our, our ability, if they're stepping down to a ranch camp in the facility, they'll have more opportunities to actually leave the facility. facility. We can work with them to get their driver's license, for instance, uh, Medi-Cal appointments, um, greater collaboration with the colleges and uh, universities, and then potential off-campus outings for vocational and individual needs. So in terms of possible employment where they can go back, uh, work, and then come back to the juvenile hall at night, which they would have to do until their base turn is completed. And again, uh, I, I did mention the anticipated cost reductions in the general fund uh, through Cal AIM if we are able to bill for a number of services that we're currently providing. Uh, we don't know how much we're estimating 50 to 100,000, but hopefully it could be more than that because they are doing a lot with our young people. Um, so that'll that'll be an excellent opportunity to begin, particularly for reentry services, 90 days release. So my recommended actions uh, for you today are several. Uh, number one is to approve the establishment of a secure youth treatment facility at San Cruz County Juvenile Hall. To approve and concept the ordinance for the Redwood Coastal Academy, that would be our ranch camp. Direct the clerk to place the ordinance on October 29th, 2024 agenda for final adoption. Direct the clerk to publish the notice of proposed ordinance summaries no later than October 21st, 2000, 2024. Number five is approve the chief of probation to sign the necessary paperwork to implement the secure youth track facility and ranch camp. And that's the end of my presentation and um, I take questions if you have those. All right, thank you so much. Uh, before we bring it to the board, I'm going to see if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on this item. Uh, you'll have two minutes. <laughs> comment. And you can approach the podium. Yeah, hello, my name is James Julian Whitman. I think this was a fascinating subject. Probably the one of the most interesting subjects I've heard in here in a long time. So I think the presentation was excellent. I took some notes and I certainly have a lot of questions that can't be answered right now, but did some work professionally in 1988 that would probably be very geared into assisting these young men and young men, women and children to taking more responsibility and helping each other out and certainly being a positive influence. So I'll contact the person speaking. Thank you. Uh, 
buenas tardes, Chair and Board, uh, members of the public. Uh, Bernie Gomez with Milpa, uh, Milpa Collective down in District 4, right? Uh, I am a resident of District 3, so I have that dual learning, you know? Uh, I was born and raised in lots of them. One thing that I want to say or read right now is uh, just real quick, SBA 23, Section 1, Subdivision E. It is the intent of the legislature and administration for counties to use evidence-based and, pro and promising practices and programs that improve the outcomes of youth and public safety, right? And I'll go lower. And it says, and reduce the use of confinement in the juvenile justice system by utilizing community-based responses and interventions, right? Um, I think we're for bringing our, our young people back, right? And we support the, the that placement, you know, here locally. The one thing that I don't support, can't support, Milipa kind of st stands can, in opposition to is the ranch camp, right? We got to think about a less restrictive environment, meaning outside of those walls, right? Outside of that barbed wire fence. And that's something else that's also SB 23 allows us to do using the less uh, uh, LRPs, right? The less restricted programming, right? Um, so we're at, I'm asking, you know, for this to be postponed until there is a community meeting allowed for community input to have uh, stakeholders, folks that have been impacted by the by the justice system, right, to be at the table with probation, right, and kind of just have that conversation, right. Another thing too that I'll say is, um, I'm also an uh, an appointed uh, juvenile justice and Negative prevention commissioner, right, um, representing District Three, and I think this is also a critical. A tool that the probation can use because there's a lot of expertise in that commission, right? Where we can provide different outlooks. You know, uh, probation can be the can be the be all end all. You know, there's other people that, and stakeholders that have uh, uh, different resources and potentially can help support probation, uh, maximize right the the flexibility and you know the uh, positive outcomes for you. Thank you. Thank you. How y'all doing? Uh, first of all, good morning, family. I'm here with my family, my community, and I want to honor the Board of Supervisors. With, with, I don't know your name, sir, but I ask that you please give us respect. You are on your phone throughout the whole presentation of the probation officer. I'm a student at UCLA going into a PhD. I listen to my professors. I listen to my lecturers, and uh, I listen to my community because that's why I'm here. At the age of 16, I was incarcerated in L.A. County, and I did 14 years for a crime that today we, we don't lock our kids up for. You guys stole my freedom. I worked for probation. I've been abused physically, emotionally, and you guys have a chance here in Santa Cruz. Milpa has, I came to, I have come to Milpa three times already, and every time I come, I leave a better person as in Santa Cruz. When I'm in LA County, I fear being in my county. There's too much fentanyl. There's too much probation, too much officers, too much camps. We are leading the way in LA County. Alameda, other counties are leading the way. Probation is not the way. Our community is the way. Today's meeting is not respected. Why? Because you guys don't have the stakeholders. That's the mothers of all my little brothers and sisters. We don't make these meetings accessible to them. We don't make them accessible. We don't give them time. We don't give them respect. And so I ask that you hear my community here, and then not only you hear them, but you respect us, and you pay attention to us when we speak to you. You don't stay on the phone for a whole four minutes. And then try to go in there and see who I am in the camera. I love you guys because, wow, we're all people. We're humans. And so I ask that with these 30 seconds that we, we, we come from the heart and we listen to our brothers. Jails are not the way. There's homes in our communities. I heard of the term LRPs. All these communities. These are the people. We have seen historically probation, all the lawsuits. You guys have a chance to not go that route and not copy any footage model. You guys have your own rich model. Santa Cruz is a good city. You guys are united. Make that united change where you listen to your community and you don't listen to historical lawsuits, historical abuse that we're seeing all over the world. The kids are revolting. The kids are don't know what to do. They're coming for medicine. They're coming for healing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, the supervisors, you know, and just the whole community, uh, Fernando, you know, um, my relationship with the uh, Juvenile Hall goes back to 1979, probably longer than any of the people have been there for, for a while. And there's some of us 
here in this community that have dedicated our, our, our you know century i mean decade after decade to try to make that uh, a better not the better place that's that's where we put our young people uh and i i don't i don't i think we had this conversation several years ago fernando we were talking about this and uh what I, what happened with, with me and just personally on, on, on my on myself i just heard about this yesterday that it was going to be on the board you know and uh, i tried to get, keep myself pretty informed so i was kind of like saying so what what's going on here you know, I've been part of this for years. Marcos has been here for, for 50 years, you know, fighting for our young people. We're in the penitentiaries. We're all over in the county jails. We were in the county jails for years. We know that there's a problem here. I think that, you know, the community has to be involved. I wish we would have had a conversation about this, Fernando, you know, about how do, how do we come together? How do we, we can solve this. We can, we can work together. I, I I agree with my brother for me, but I don't I don't support a ranch camp. I don't think we need a ranch camp. We got to call it something else. We got to develop our own, like the young brother from LA is saying, do something else. I think that Santa Cruz is unique. We've done incredible things. People come from all over the country, all over the world, to see what we've done and the organizations that are here. We brought celebrities. We brought a lot of people to Santa Cruz. You know, and I, I you know I have seven grandkids. Now, I have four great grandkids. I don't care what kind of camp it is. I don't ever want to see them over there. But on my personal, you know, I've had that experience of you, this, this system sending my grandson to the penitentiary at the age of 17. I'm glad that he's doing good today. But I'm here just to say, you know what, take a, take a little time to look at it and give us an opportunity to have a conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Buenas tardes. My name is Edgar Ernesto Barra Gutierrez. I am the narrative strategist at the Milpa Collective. And um, as we're, as probation uh, explores this idea of uh, facilitating and opening up uh, a secure youth track facility within Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall, you know, as, as always, it's always good to just take a moment, take a step back, reflect, engage the people that need to be at the table, all those who have been formerly incarcerated, impacted or carry that level of expertise that can really inform a thoughtful process and a thoughtful uh, overall uh, opportunity for young people. We want to have the best deal for them, the best deal for all the young people in Santa Cruz County, not the worst one, right? And, uh, and I say that out of experience. I was in juvenile hall. I went to the California Youth Authority, which this, this bill, SB 23, made away with. And I came back home, and after that, I'm currently a master's student at, at University of San Francisco, trying to support my community. While we know that majority of the young people at Juvenile Hall or at County Jail are from Watsonville, California, where I grew up at, we know that. So it's it's important to uh, be able to have platica conversation with the people that are most impacted and bring the, the all the solutions, the creativity and imagination that we need at the table. Uh, we know the research is there. Confined settings don't work. A camp cannot be in a juvenile hall. It's, it boggles my mind that we're still at that idea, that notion. However, there is promise. There is people in our community who are working together to make different uh, alternatives of incarceration for young people. We just saw two young men lose their life in South County. Two 21-year-olds. That's not okay with me. We need to do better. We need to have, we need to focus on prevention. But if we have to go down this route, we need to have everything possibly we can so that young people come back to our community and reach in the best way possible. It's worth the conversation. Just table it for a moment, come back to a conversation and engage all the people that need to be at the table. Palabra. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Beverly Brook. I'm a commissioner with the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission, representing the 5th District. I'm also a community member of the JJCC's SB 823 subcommittee, and I also provide chaplain services at Juvenile Hall. Since the inception of SB 823, the JJDPC has worked diligently with probation to keep our youth high-end offenders in our county. 
Supervisor McPherson worked with us to explore options in our county and neighboring counties to house our youth close to their community and family support. Unfortunately, we were told that um, our current juvenile hall facility was too old and too small, and it was not financially feasible to build a new facility. Therefore, we sent our children to Sonoma County. Now, as a result of the vision and philosophy of our probation department, the youth population at Juvenile Hall has continued to drop over the past five years, and we also now have budgetary constraints. So we now have the opportunity to keep our youth offenders in our, their own community and close to their family. I would recommend that the board approve of the SYTF and our juvenile hall with a view toward continuing to reduce the secure youth treatment population <clears throat> and to establish a less restrictive option within the community and not in juvenile hall. I would also encourage probation to engage with members of the community to ensure robust programming at the SYTF and to improve youth outcomes, eliminate racial disparities, and to, to promote healing and transformation for our youth. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Cunningham. Uh, from Santa Cruz Barrios and Neos. I'm here to speak about uh, my journey as a 12 year old who first encountered with the juvenile justice system. What that led to uh, from 12 years old to 21 was me taking the life of another human being and spending the next 30 years of my life in prison. Jail is jail. I don't care if it's Sonoma, Santa Cruz, Juvenile Hall, Redwood, community, whatever it is, jail is jail. Jail is not conducive for our children, for our kids, for anything positive. It's a, a saying that says it's easier to build a man than to fix a broken man. Continuing to shuffle our kids around from jail to jail is just further traumatizing them, not doing anything to heal them, not any, doing anything to build them up. Honestly, Fernando, I was offended when I just heard about this uh, proposal a couple of days ago because, in my opinion, we've always had a good relationship with Barrios and probation. We get calls daily, daily from probation about sending some of the young people down to us to mentor. I've personally walked young men through uh, their transition into the uh, uh, community as uh, working with probation, but we was, wasn't in any conversations about this plan. Probation holds a young person up. Also, at 823, less restrictive housing. It could go from camp, SYTFs, uh, anchor monitors, transitional houses, CBOs, all the way to being home with their families. That's always, also an option. Every month when probation has their meetings, they uphold a young person that I've been working with for years and been out here in the community that went straight home from Sonoma to his family. And they speak about him every month about he's the most successful uh, uh, returnee from uh, uh, DJJ. Let's uh, think about sending them home with their families. Good afternoon. My name is Sergio. I'm an intern with uh, Milpa, and I haven't personally been impacted by incarceration through my family and community. As someone who has Ohlone Chumash heritage, my people have been in and out of these institutions for decades. This approach does not live to the values and beliefs of my people. While I'm open to the idea of the uh, SYTF, the camp isn't the way to go. Not only will, will it take away the funding for institutions and programs that will actually help our youth and learn and be, and be reintroduced into our society, instead of an open-air prison that's made to look like a camp with an attractive name, uh, the Redwood Coastal Academy. The lack of transparency and engagement with the community and the reach of, and reach of this process of having this camp is disheartening. The misuse of the funds and continuing the cycle, having our youth uh, be confined in these settings, isn't what the community wants. 
we should strive for something better and never seen before in our in our Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, buenas tardes, Chair and Board of Supervisors. My name is Elias Gonzalez. I reside in District 4, Felipe's District. Um, first of all, uh, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather. I'm also a community member and a relative to a lot of folks that have been impacted by mass incarceration. Um, for the last 20 plus years, I've dedicated myself to working in Watsonville, born and raised, to working with families and those system impacted, right? Um, for the last five years, I worked with an initiative uh, called Restoring Promise, where we were able to go out there in five different facilities, seven different facilities out there to work with young adults, 18 to 25, and not just the young adults, but working with those folks that were actually taking care of our young folks. We realized that the trauma that folks are experiencing in these spaces is something that's not being talked about, right? Our correctional partners are also dealing with this trauma. Right, they're also dealing with this madness. So what does it look like to do things differently, right? For me, as a training and site manager at Milpa, right, I was blessed to train over hundreds of folks, uh, mentors and mentors that were lifers, but also work with the young folks, but also work with the staff to do things very differently. What would it look like to do something very differently? Uh, we've talked to probation about these things. That we're at the table trying to be a partner that's willing to talk about these things, right? Uh, we've been here. I'm also a commissioner for the last seven years of the Juvenile Dis Delinquency Prevention, uh, previously appointed by Greg Capital and now appointed by Felipe. And I'm sorry, the here. But again, for us, we brought these things to the forefront. We brought these issues. We brought these concerns. It's not that we don't want an SYTF. It's just that we want our folks home. This is what SBA 23 was trying to do. Get our folks home. We're cool with it. Uh, we want to move forward, but we also want to be in those conversations. A lot of folks that we have been at the table, we have been knocking at the door for years and not trying to figure this out collectively as a village. Again, for us, it's the importance of the healing of our young people and our communities because what we're navigating is a system of mass incarceration. These are not the solutions. Let's look at other alternatives to possibly move forward. Thank you. Buenas tardes. My name is Casey. I'm a key member from San Estos County. I'm signing here with BIPA as a youth intern. Um, speaking on this agenda, MIPA and comrades are open to the idea of repurposing, repurposing a unit at Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall as a service youth track facility for youth who have been charged and adjudicated for 707B offenses. However, we oppose the additional of a youth camp at Juvenile Hall. We strongly believe for Santa Cruz County to keep the, its leaderships in juvenile justice space. We ask for less restricted programming options in Santa Cruz County and ask, to, ask for a deep community engagement and trans transparency. Thank you. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Hernandez. I am the policy program assistant with Milpa and Yolo in Solano County. Um, I come this this far out to support my colleagues out here and about this work. And I'd like to start by reflecting that SBA 23 and the added language of the Welfare and Institutions Code, Section 851, have although created some rather difficult and challenging circumstances for probation departments across the state, it also created opportunities for them for the youth they serve and the community as a whole to think about the future of juvenile justice in a more meaningful and impactful way. Although we are open to the idea of the SYTF in the county, we also want to point out that a five bed camp, quote unquote camp, in the same unit as the SYTF and the same unit as other youth still facing dispositions for serious crimes is not a camp. We are against a camp being in a restricted facility. We ask that you please do not make any decisions today, especially in regards to a five bed camp, but ask that you expand the scope and participation of even the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council to have a more significant role in guiding the approach by Santa Cruz County in regards to juvenile justice, especially as it considers to use the, the funds from the Juvenile Justice Realignment Block Grant. This will allow for an opportunity and meaningful engagement and transparency to think about a carceral setting, to think beyond, excuse me, beyond a carceral setting and collectively discuss what a true less restrictive placement can look like that will put healing and treatment first before punitive measures. Milpa has had the, has had the opportunity to go into juvenile detention facilities and secure, secure youth track facilities in Solano County and Yolo County to provide cultural healing programs and mentorship. So I'm confident that my colleagues in Santa Cruz County are more than willing and enthusiastic to engage with the county so stakeholders and the community to provide experiences, expertise, insights, and reflections throughout the processes in designing a less restrictive place and program for the youth in Santa Cruz County. Gracias. Palabra. Good 
Good morning. My name is Faye Martinez. I'm a youth justice intern with Milpa. I'm also formerly incarcerated and have experienced the juvenile justice system from my first interaction with police at 12 years old to, the, to my placement in the secure youth strike facility. And is that the experience I would like to share with you today. Throughout my two years in the secure track facility, although I was blessed and fortunate to be close with my family, which helped me for supporting my growth. However, the downside of being in a restricted facility around barbed wire fences with white brick walls and a steel door, it didn't allow me to truly feel free. It was a productive, which caused frustration. It didn't really allow others to overcome old mentality and behaviors that brought them in the first place. So I ask you to consider today delaying any decisions making today about holding use in restrictive facilities and take the necessary time to engage with community members and community-based organizations that help that have lived experience with the juvenile justice system. This engagement will provide an opportunity for community's input and meaningful insight that Santa Cruz probation and this board can utilize to make the necessary adjustment for the best interest of Santa Cruz County youth. Thank you for your time and consideration. Buenas tardes. My name is Jesus Angel Robles Gonzalez. I come here uh, from Solano County. I came with Melpa. I'm here today because I am concerned about youth that look like me and decisions made about them that don't include their boys. I went through the system at a young age. I just want to advocate for those who are still young and couldn't be here. Thank you for your time. I ask you to join us in breaking the cycle and building the circle of communication with community and ask to consider today delaying any decisions making today about holding youth in a restrictive facility. Thank you. Good afternoon, community. Good afternoon, board members. I'm a formerly incarcerated youth. I travel up here with Milpa. I spent most of my life from 13 years old to 25. And most of the time that I spend, I spend it in camp. I lost my vision by being punched by a probation officer. And after multiple times and multiple surgeries, I didn't get my vision back. It is important to do the research. It is important to be transparent. It is it is important to know that our community is suffering. We know that you know institutions and religious places have not been good to my people. And so I, I would like for you to take uh, a little bit of more time to do research on this uh, uh, proposition. Um, Religiously, things don't work for our youth. We have our own ways. We have our own teachings. I've taken classes through uh, the University of Southern California for environmental uh, purposes. And our youth need our help. All this time that I've been standing there since 9 o'clock, it's all been about budgeting, money. You take away the freedom of our youth, but you leave them with the problem still. I travel up and down California doing mental health, doing conservation projects, and it's always the same thing. Probation has nothing but to focus on the money, to focus on the, uh, on the budgeting, not the people. So I suggest uh, we do more research about this and let the community be involved. Let us do collective uh, uh, decision makings so our community be better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kenya, hey. Hello, community. I am Pure Pichadish Fainlon. I am a scholar of linguistics and psychology, UCLA and co-commissioner of cultural affairs for an initiative that oversees communal discrepancies and efficient alternatives in support of parenting students and our families of higher education. As a mother, Santa Cruz community advocate and associate of Milpa and Movement Warriors Collectives, 
these vessels of local community outreach alone have proven the efficacy of alternatives to incarceration of children by providing guidance, self-behavioral substance, and methods through their safe spaces for at-risk youth. This to generate and regulate a young person's healthy cognitive behavioral development through culture and community and not cages. This has reduced the rates of youth recidivism, public endangerment, and the costly state and local funds used to operate youth incarceration facilities or camps. I am in support of all of Santa Cruz children and community. Therefore, I am for support of cultural community outreach and against the wrangling of our children into camps. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Frank. I worked in the field of youth justice for over 15 years. My career has included working at the Annie Casey Foundation and their Juvenile Justice Strategy Group. I've worked at the Vera Institute of Justice, working with Milpa Collective to found the Restoring Promise Initiative that was not mentioned earlier. I've also served as Assistant Commissioner at Rikers Island Jail in New York City. I now work at Race Forward as their Director of Root Solutions for Public Safety, and I'm also a social worker, a therapist in private practice specializing in trauma and PTSD. I'm here today in my personal capacity as a resident of the 5th District, concerned about what was proposed and discussed today. There's been a robust discussion, but in my experience, the process matters more than the outcome. The process has to be driven by the people who have been most impacted by the justice system, formerly and currently incarcerated people and families. Throughout my career, I've sought MILPA's partnership at every project and every inflection point that I've been presented with. And as a local group here, I strongly urge a revisiting of the process and a pause in partnership with them. While serving as Assistant Commissioner at Rikers, I worked with MILPA to stabilize the humanitarian crisis there for young adults and youth imprisoned. We designed a 40-hour training over the course of two weeks, led three uh, cohorts of it. The union itself advocated that it be scaled. This was MILPA's doing. Next level. Government serves the people by the people. And this process could clearly use a revisiting of that commitment to be driven by the people most harmed by mass incarceration. You've heard many people reflect about what that could look like. And I strongly urge the uh, board to consider what they've said seriously. Thank you. Uh, say good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, my name is Juan Gomez. I'm the executive director and co-founder at MIPA. Um, I'm a representative right there, District 3, you know, but I grew up in Pajaro, right? I want to say what's up to my community. You know, as someone who grew up um, seeing a lot of the fellas around age of 16 disappear, only to find out that it was the migra or that it was a uh, uh, incarceration that took them, you know, I kind of, I got caught up in the system from incarcerated. I was in the juvenile hall in the 90s, you know, and I got out. Scott McDonald went to go visit me. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work in my community. You know, I want to see what we're for versus what we're against. I've had the opportunity to travel with Fernando and the previous judges all over Washington, D.C. to advocate for stuff. You know what I mean? So uh, my colleagues in probation, like, we're engaged in this conversation. We're not talking about the old way that we do business and advocate. We're talking about the new way to engage. There's two distinct tracks right here. Yes, the security track facility. We want to be involved in the design process and the RFP reviewing process and the interview process. We've done that before in Monterey County because the architects are very important. We want to be part of that process. It can be done. We've done it before. Um, also, yeah, throughout the whole course of it, like, you know, there's different ways that we think about it. Now, another thing is the ranch camp. Obviously, we need to be thinking and we want to put on record what does ranch look like outside in the community that's community-based? I obviously believe in rethinking about how to be efficient with our budget. Let's shift those resources. Let's do it in a way that's smart. If it comes down and you guys say, hey, well, we got to do it right now, okay. But we are going to be talking with probation. We will have a hell of conversations about like, 
How do we do that? How do we build the capacity? And if nobody has said it. Milpa, myself, Byron Sunil's others are saying, yes, we will take those young people, but we need resources to help build that capacity if it takes two, three, or five years. But I want to put that for the Rexer to maximize collaboration, innovations, and implementation overall impact. Thank you, gentlemen. Alara. Now, my first time at the mic. Those of you who don't know me, I'm a full-time organizer, homeless, but I got good ideas. I'm going to give one thing to you. You remember where we met on 17th Street way back when? Yes or no? Okay, so me too. I got Alzheimer's. I don't know if you see this, but I've handed out more stuff than most people know. The good news, 100%, not that you don't need money, but to my homies. Because I believe in that elder, I didn't know he had so many grandkids. The solution is grandmas and grandpas and family and the youth. So I do have a name. I do have ideas. One is one particular staff person on city council that I respect one to one. And crime A can put 100% back to the community, the one of many organizations, Barash and Edis, but many work together. So my last name is Lewis. If anybody knows Bob and Jack, Lewis Volkswagen, why would I want to be poor and still at 88? Think what I did back, but look at Robert Froggy came from San Quentin in 29 minutes and Crime Inc. To all of you, watch what that gift put 100% of End Crime Inc. in our county back to these young people. And you can't ask for if the close in 15 seconds, if you don't know, Victory Outreach, Santa Cruz, Victory Outreach, and you must know he's going into our prisons now. Jerry Morales, so there's much more, but I'm gonna give this only one before I go, your invitation to have a turnkey. And for you, come on Sunday to Victory Outreach and see what the third wave of young people can do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public here in person would like to speak, I'd like to see if there's any members of the public online who'd like to address us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have a caller. Karina, your microphone is now available. Hi, buenas tardes. My name is Karina Moreno. Um, live in Watsonville. I'm a Santa Cruz County Commissioner. I work with Milpa, and I'm back working with the county um, to address some of the, the the recommendations that we brought to you last year. So, working with the with Liz and Nicole and and Juliet to address the inequity of youth voices and, and working with the youth task force. And I say that because I'm really excited. I'm really honored about that. A lot of the work that I get to do, I'm, I'm honored to work with youth and, and I'm honored to work with their families to address a lot of the inequities in my community. Um, and it's amazing. Like I, I'm very excited for that to come up and for you to see because there's so many youth who are so excited and who want a voice and, and they're such stakeholders in this. And when I learned about the SYTF and, and the camp that's coming up, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about it, but a lot of the work, a lot of the youth that I do get to work with, I'm hearing that what they want and what they need, especially in this population is training and vocational and, and being able to stay close to home and, and with their families. And they thrive, you know, working with the orgs and, and staying close. And so I ask you, because I don't personally know a lot about, about these camps and NSYTFs, but the more that I tried to learn about it, the more I learned that this is actually kind of rushed. Um, there's a whole commission on this, and a lot of them are, are amazing stakeholders too, and they're very knowledgeable about it, but they're also not being consulted, and they're not also being given a chance to voice their opinions and all of the different solutions that there are to keep them home and, and keep their futures in mind. And so I ask that you don't rush this process, you know, open it to the community, open it to all the stakeholders and learn about all the different options that there are like Rancho Cielo, which is right here in our neighboring county. Um, but thank you for your time. Appreciate it. 
Ronnie, your microphone is now available. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. My name is Veronica Ronnie Miramontes. I'm the finance and policy manager at Milpa. I'm also the first elected and appointed Latina, Chicano, Indigenous individual for the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District and in the city of Monterey. I'm also a former delegate assembly for Region 9B for the California School Board Association and the current director at large for the California Latino School Board Association. I wanted to address this item to really discuss the McKinney Vento data for our students in this state. And note that Santa Cruz County's homeless student population is about 45% higher than the statewide average. So it's really important to note that there are a lot of conversations happening across the table and a lot of things intersect with what we're doing here, including, including the juvenile hall and probation. So just wanted to note that we go far alone, but further together, community engagement and letting those to those that are impacted and have experience lead these conversations is very important so that we're able to have those there to make be a part of the decisions and allowing us to have conversations, including cost analysis and families having the opportunity to see what this could look like. So we also encourage or I also encourage to, you know, delay the process, allow community to be involved, allow us to have an opportunity to talk about how we see our future to be made. And I'll yield the rest of my time. I also have another individual, if it's okay to pass it over to her. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. My name is Kayla Mathis. I'm a youth programs director for an organization in urban peace um, called Urban Peace Movement in Oakland. Um, I'm just, I see firsthand in Alameda County what it looks like when communities not being heard when, when we talk about what's going to happen to our young folks. And, and I just really want to see Santa Cruz be the leading force and actually listen to the community. Don't rush and make a decision. Actually hear folks out. Um, you know, my movement family, Milpa, they, they have great solutions. You know, they, they have done a lot of great work with young folks. Um, just hear community out, you know, and just don't make a brash decision. Um, take your time. Don't, don't, don't decide on anything today. Um, hear community. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone who uh, is here to comment on this really important item. I'd like to bring it back to staff first to see if you have any response to some of the comments around the process yeah, uh, that you heard today. Yes, definitely. Uh, this has been an uh, open process. Uh, SBA 23 created a Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council uh, subcommittee, which community members are part of. Some of those folks are here. Um, and that uh, we are actually meeting again in October. Uh, I did announce to the to the committee, uh, or actually the uh, Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council, I think it was probably early uh, July or June, that I had this idea to do this, but I couldn't really begin uh, too much planning until I actually came to the board and, and got your authority. So um, now I also, we also had a convening, and uh, during the early stages of COVID, it was uh, uh, around this, what the issue of what we're struggling with in terms of what a lot of folks mentioned, what's what's been missing is a like a, a community-based program. So I, I plea with a lot of the, the commissioners, they, they asked me, what can we do? And I've said, we need a least restrictive placement. So I mean, I want that to be there for the record. Um, absent that though, um, a ranch camp and the institution will can can provide those services. I don't. I'm hoping that we don't have to utilize that or the SYTF. That that would be the ideal for all of us, right? That we have fewer and fewer young people in our detention, and we're diverting as many people uh, as we can to come out. Um, so, um, and I we are hosting. A lot of folks here are aware of this. Uh, November eighth, we're actually putting together a convening, uh, specifically around juvenile justice, where we will have family members and young people who actually have been at the table as we've started talk, talking about what we want to do. We have young people as a, uh, who are advising us around who've been to uh, ranch camp, who've been in, uh, actually to Sonoma, who we're talking to our young people in the hall. That's where the actually the name Redwoods Coastal Academy uh, kind of you know came out, taking a survey of the young people about the programs. Obviously, we can do no, more, but uh, I don't know the exact date. But there is an open and public meeting coming up at the end of this month. Uh, is is uh, it depends on what the outcome of today is, um, but depending on that, we'll we begin a lot of discussion going down the road. So I'm I'm just I'm very happy to partner 
with the community. We have, uh, we just actually sat down with Milpa uh, a couple months ago. Uh, they, they started working locally. Uh, I did say this is what, what our plan was as well, a ranch camp and SYTF. So I just want to clear the record that I have, I have talked about this and I'm open to that. And I, I, we welcome community partnerships as we have historically. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez. And I see the slide with the recommended actions. I think one of them had a timeline or a day. I'm not sure if it was recommended actions or uh, this one, but, uh, but October 21st. What was? Yeah, that, that's the for the ordinance. So, in order to uh, to do an SYTF, um, I really I needed the Board of State and Community Corrections approval, but I wanted, of course, the board's approval as well. But to do a ranch camp, there's definitely we need an ordinance to be approved to establish a ranch camp. So that's that. Um, ordinance to direct the clerk to place the ordinance on the October 29th, 2024 agenda for final adoption. And then there's a uh, item number four, a recommendation there, you see, with another date. So that's what that's about. Just Would that one be can. set in stone or could we do a November one for that one? You know, I don't know how the, the timelines work or, you know, what the appropriate. Uh, uh, I'm just saying we we'll there be yeah. open to, to open it, opening up a meeting beforehand because I know this is a concept ordinance so the bill oh, sure. that yeah none of that has been discussed the build out none of that but if we can have like a community meeting that brings in um service providers uh partners stakeholders um you know one in south county maybe and you know and continue the one in november that you're talking yeah. about if, but, if my staff is here they may know the next date of the community meeting that we're having is uh do you know well the reason why the ordinance is for that date is because legally we have to publish it before our before the ordinance gets approved hence the october 21st date directing the clerk of the board to publish it in a newspaper right. the, and then the next meeting would be the adoption of the ordinance if the, your board um approves it to go for, forward at this meeting. As far as the next community meeting goes. The juvenile justice yeah. subcommittee meeting is a date is set and that's yes. the next community meeting that we were gonna talk about, you know, assuming we're, you know, if we move, are able to move forward with this to start, you know, deeper planning and uh, with folks. Is that one in South County? It, I, yeah, I I believe you're right. Halloween. Yes, it's, oh, oh, it's okay. yeah. Well, it's on Halloween. <laughs> Okay. I'm yeah, not I'm sure talking about a, a county. I'm talking about a meeting yeah. that's, that's just specific to some of the folks who are addressing today, just a meeting about this, right? Yes, so absolutely. Can give their absolutely. I think some of the folks here are actually members of that that commission. Um, okay. um or so they they've definitely obviously, but we'd be happy to change the location if that's possible to South County. I have no, no problem doing that to make it more accessible. Yeah, I think, or even a separate meeting, I think would be good. Yeah, absolutely, sure. Yeah, this right. this would be just be the be, the beginning of meetings. I mean, we've been, I know, commissioners, uh, uh, Reverend Brooke has been very eager to to start planning. Uh, I can say that, but I've told her hold off because I, I need to go before the board first to see if we can do this. And I've 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 told people that after pending approval, then we would definitely start the deep dive into what it, what does it look like? We've already started internal planning because there's just logistics and a right. facility that, that 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 we know about, but there isn't much, uh, we don't have to redesign uh, the, the facility, you know, absent a, an infusion of new dollars, I don't, uh, you know, that would be great, but um, yeah. we're going to do with, do with, use what we have. So that, that would, for me, that would be um, the ideal situation, right? This is an ordinance that gives you the green light for a concept plan, but if you bring in the partners to have more input, uh, absolutely, yeah, that is there. Yeah, we have to by statute actually we have to hold uh, these subcommittee meetings. Uh, I think now twice, at least twice a year. Those are those are Brown Act. Uh, there's appointed members, uh, and then you know the public is is welcome to go. Is we, we certainly would. You know, spread the news uh, far and wide. I, you know, I invited commissioners to come and speak, or a commissioner to today on behalf of the the proposal. So we're we're more than happy to to continue with you know welcoming community voice. And as I said, we have young people who are advising us already in this you know planning pro. What do you think about this idea and so on? And family members. And in our November eighth, we will also have a, a big summit around uh, these issues moving forward. Are you having some some in South County too? Yeah, the well the 
uh, we we could do that. Our November eighth is actually Twin Lakes Church. Our our com, uh, um, convening that we're having to talk about these issues and engage more. The 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 idea around that is to re-engage community members who are new in the community um, around what you know what juvenile justice looks like, what SBS SBA twenty three is, and and kind of looking for support. So you know, I want to engage you know a lot of the community partners, folks like that are not here today, like Casa and different folks like that too. Yeah, absolutely. We could work we could uh, I could work with folks that are here, and, and maybe they have some ideas around how to do a specific event in South County or a community forum. However, you know that's that's fine. Yeah, um, Supervisor Connor. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I just want to clarify something. I think my uh, my colleague, Supervisor Hernandez, was was asking around this, but there's no particular deadline, you know, why we need to get this done by the end of the year, right? I mean, we can uh, basically the, create... The, I'll, I'll tell you, I, the personal sense of urgency that I have or that we, is for our young people. We know we have uh, 11 people in our facility who potentially, a lot of them are on their way to a secure youth track, given that we only hold folks with 707B charges, the most serious charges. That's why we have... To 11 youth, whereas uh, just, you know, 20 years ago, we had 50, 50 youth. So we've done a lot of work with, with partners, those who are here to reduce those numbers with alternatives. But the deadline for me is, yeah, there's probably young people that will be sent perhaps this position and have to go to ranch, be sent away. And there's probably, we know, I think there's four or five youth who could uh, be going away to Sonoma County. Um, and if, if they were, if they went there, I'm not sure we'd want to just kind of bring people back and forth and back and forth, you know, so they're, so that's, that's the urgency for me. Got it. And so what, what does that time I look like? I mean, when our, 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 um, enrolled in a we don't have a, we, you know, we've, we're doing this, you know, uh, internally, no one's forced us to do this. Um, um, and so we wanted to start uh, ideally like January one, if that's possible as, as having a date. And that's considering some of the, some of the cases that are that are pending in our, our in our juvenile court, we'd, we'd love to keep those youth here than rather than have them yeah. go far away. That's that's the primary motivation for us, of course. And how much lead time would you need with like uh, you know this board passing an ordinance before you can um, roll out a program? Um, you know, I think is is a lot of things that we do. We're 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 we are going to be 80% ready and there's going to be, you know, things that we will figure out along the way is, is experience in a lot of counties in California as they're standing up their secure youth treatment facilities. Um, but we would be ready to, we wouldn't need a lot of lead time because we have a lot of programming. We have the space, um, you know, some of it obviously would be uh, enhancing the services that we have with our current existing partners and perhaps new partners, yeah. um, what they what they can offer. There's folks here that have, you know, obviously, stated that they there's a lot that they can do and um, we've met with them and we're like that sounds really good yeah. great well i, I want to thank everyone who came and spoke today um the five million plus that's in our county budget for uh juvenile hall is always frustrating to me i mean not because probation doesn't do good work but just because i it's difficult spending that much money every year incarcerating youth um, and I know there are certain requirements around having a, some kind of a facility, um, but it, it's still frustrating. And so it's really encouraging to see all of you come out and know that there's an active, organized, engaged community that cares so much about this topic and that wants to transform this system. Um, it's, it's really encouraging. Um, and I know that Chief Geraldo is trying to do the same thing, right? And from your perspective, um, I really appreciate that uh, you've identified this opportunity, right? To bring youth closer to home uh, and to expand programming options, right? I mean, you, you, you talked about many of the same things, which is getting uh, those youth back out into the community um, and and learning, um, learning trades and other skills uh, that are gonna help them become productive members of society. So um, I, I, you know, I like the concept. Um, I also think that this needs to be something that um, what I should say my, my one pause, and I think this was actually mentioned by member of the public was that like ranch camp, the, the idea of getting people outside is, you know, healthy. And like uh, there's a sort of a natural healing quality to being uh, in nature, putting that camp at juvenile hall is a bit of a contradiction in terms. Now, I mean, I understand there's sort of funding streams that we have to deal with, but um 
So, uh, you know, I like the idea and concept. Would like to see some approach to programming or long-term vision that is going to address this. And so um, I would suggest maybe we just continue this item to the first meeting in December, December 10th, uh, to give, I mean, I, I just, I don't want this to be something that we're doing to the impacted community. It needs to be something that we're doing together, right? And so to that extent, the ask that we simply, uh, you know, not make a decision today and that we have these meetings before making a decision, I think is, is meaningful. It's an important part of the process. Um, I think if we come back at the first uh, board meeting in December, December 10th, um, and you know have had these uh, this input um, that we can still get a program done potentially by the beginning of the year and hopefully um, address some of the immediate new needs of our incarcerated youth. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm I'm kind of surprised at uh, what I've heard today. Uh, I mean, when I heard this, I thought, oh, this is great. From humanistic, uh, we're going to have be able to keep more of our the the, the uh, people that are be going to these facilities at home and not going to Sonoma, and it's going to be less cost. That seemed like a win win to me. But evidently, there's there's not an agreement. And I really do appreciate the people coming out today to tell us uh, what they, what's on their minds. But I, I'm wondering in this uh, Senate Bill 823 that's often referred to, is there um, are, are, is there restrictions of what you can do or what you can offer that's been different from what we've done before? Um, and is there any flexibility? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you, you're doing what you have or you, you have limits of what you can do. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. um, you know, those those dollars are tied to actually the full continuum of prevention, you know, diversions programs um, all the way up through obviously commitment, you know, covering the cost of commitment and then the programming that is required in the in the facility. Um, and so, yeah, I, I understand the concerns actually, you know, thinking now it's worth we have a recommendations on the table, but. And I, I don't want to recommend, you know, I can understand the ranch camp, but I certainly would want to be able to start a secure youth track facility, green light on that and, and do, you know, pause on the on the ranch camp. I guess we we, we bundle these two together, I guess, for efficiency sake. Uh, okay. But I understand this ranch camp seems like overall approval for a secure youth facility track um, and not so much the ranch camp. So it, so I understand that uh, that maybe more discussion has to happen. Uh, I, ideally, like I said earlier, uh, we would have folks, you know, investor, private investors in a community come up and develop this least restrictive program in the community. Uh, someone mentioned Ranch of Cielo, which we've been to. It's not necessarily an option, but what, what a great program. Okay. Um, I mean, overall, with what Fernando said, should we do one and then hold off the other or... Um... I'm not sure where we want to go. Maybe to delay it till December 10th, it seems like one way or the other, but I'm going to, I'm going to make a couple comments since I haven't had a chance to weigh in that. Right. Um, I'll just say that one, I want to appreciate all the input we received today. Um, I do also want to appreciate the fact that, um, you know, when I first got here as a board member back in 2023, I met with representatives from the juvenile justice delinquency prevention commission and the number one thing that they have been having conversations about, we're trying to get our youth who are incarcerated back into Santa Cruz County because we have to spend so much money trying to get parents to be able to see their kids. They can only go if they have transportation. It's very far away for them to get to the kids. And the number one thing we're trying to do right now is get these kids back into our community and closer to family. And I think what's before us right now is the fact that um, and, and I will say, when I first started asking those questions, probation was like, we've looked into that, we can't do it. We've looked into it, we can't do it. And now here we are, and they have figured out a way to bring these kids back home so they can be close to their friends and their family. They can be in a community that shares the values of rehabilitation, education, trying to get them out of these facilities, and we have better oversight of our kids when they're closer to home. And so... Um, I don't, it doesn't seem like there's any commitment to the Redwood camp has to be this specific thing. That's not what's before us. It's really trying to give the green light to probation to begin moving forward with this. And part of that is the approval of this ordinance. And I think what may be beneficial is that we move forward today and we hear about the um, 
November November 8th convening. We get a report back December 10th. And then that way we can keep allowing probation to make progress. So we're not having more kids getting sent off in the next few months. And instead we're, you know, trying to, to, to move forward with what we said we wanted to do, which is get our kids back in our community. And I'd also point out that all the money that we're spending on this, we're spending in another community. So, you know, hopefully we can, you know, refine and figure out better ways to, um, you know, keep kids out of the, you know, um, institutions, which we've actually proven we've done since, I mean, it sounded like this summer we had been the five kids. We had 11, you know, we have 11 currently. There used to be upwards of 40, 50 kids in our facilities here locally. So I think, you know, I, I feel like probation has been really responsive. And if we pause right now, we're going to, we're going to put ourselves back, you know, a, a lot of ways from all the progress that we've been making on trying to um, really get kids back in our community. And so I would just suggest that we consider, you know, moving forward with the recommendations. Obviously, the community wants to be engaged. We've recognized that and we want to make sure that there's clear lines of communication and that we hear back on how this process develops. But I really just um don't want to see us pause on on keeping kids further away from their parents and further away from home when we can start that process of getting them back in our community. So thank you. And I just want to comment. Yeah, my our number one um, priority is the, creating a secure youth track facility. We can wait on the the ranch camp. We thought that absent the least restrictive program, that seemed like a a better option than sending young people. But if uh, I the, uh, the I could wait on the ranch camp. I hear I'm kind of hearing some pause on that, but the SYTF is really something that's urgent for us. So, you know, I I would be willing to move on the 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 YTF, the acronym that people's been using. Yeah. <laughs> what people the acronym that people have been using. You know, I noticed December 10th is actually our last meeting, not our first meeting in December. It's our only meeting. No. So November 19th. Oh, there is? Yeah. Okay. Well then that's fine. And moving the other one for December 10th, like uh, Supervisor Koenig said. Are you sure it's the first meeting? Not, we have a second meeting on the 24th? 17th. 17th, got it. Okay. Yes. Supervisor McPherson. Yes. Oh, yes, that's a motion. So I guess uh, I just want to clarify what that motion would be. So we'd move forward with the recommended actions. And then bring back the conversation on the Redwood camp yeah. on the for December 10th. Right. I think that's, that's well, clear. So approving recommended action one uh, and to return with the discussion uh, of a ranch camp on the December 10th agenda. Of course, after uh, further discussion and community meetings uh, with the impacted community. And some input as to what the community brought to, to the table. So it's all second at the motion. I want to make sure the clerk understands the motions. Okay, so it's 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 adopting staff recommendation one, not adopting staff recommendation two through five, and with additional direction to come back on December 10th to discuss actions two through five. Is that right? I believe so, but I have a question. So five, do we need to authorize the chief probation officer to sign documents from the state of California necessary to implement at least the 10 bed SYTF? <laughs> I would think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I need five. I see the So that's going to require a re, a, you know, a reimagining of the motion, right? So that's what you're trying to do. So item five as well too then. And then coming back with community input as well. So it would be a portion of item five because because uh, item five deals with two topics. Well, so just, yeah, just for the secure youth treatment facility, si signing for that as well. Okay, so so it's approval of recommended item one and approval of um, the SYTF related portion of recommended action five. Um, Rejection of the remaining staff recommendations with additional direction to come back at the first meeting in December to discuss the ordinance. Accurate? Accurate, but and with the input of the community too as well. And the five bed of branch camp 
item or the branch camp branch camp and concept. Because my understanding is that the, the secure youth treatment facility is the 10 beds. Yes. And then the, what they were recommending today was five bed ranch camp, but it sounds like there needs to be further discussion about the ranch camp options. And so that would come back on the December 10th. That's the ordinance yeah. that would come back on the on December 10th. And I guess I have another clarification because um, the Redwood Coastal Academy, I think that's the combination of the two. So would the entire ordinance need to come back then or would we be approving part of that today? The, the, that? The, the SYTF does not actually require an ordinance. So um, so you, you can go ahead and just approve the institution of the SYTF today and any actions surrounding the SYTF and get that portion started. Okay. And then the ordinance will come back. And I, I, I do believe in the ordinance, it has kind of um, combined the two um, mm -hmm. into one. There, this Redwoods Academy includes the facility. Is that not right? It, that is the name of the ranch camp. The Redwoods Academy is mm -hmm. the, the ranch camp that would exist in the facility. Okay. So it's they're one and the same. The ranch, it's not the secure youth track facility um, is, is what it is until we come up with another name for it. But we gave the ranch camp a name. Great. Okay. So I think I think I, I got the motions. <laughs> so moved by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Supervisor Koenig. Um, today we're going to approve the establishment of a secure youth treatment facility. Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall authorized the chief probation officer to sign documents from the state of California necessary to implement the TED bed um, secure youth treatment facility and bring back um, all remaining items for discussion at the December 10th meeting related to the ranch camp and engage with the community uh, and get community input prior to, to that coming back on December 10th. Great. With that, I'll ask the clerk for a roll call vote on the item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Fernandez? Aye. McPherson? Cummings? Aye. That passes um, with Supervisor Friend absent. And so with that, that concludes our regularly scheduled meeting for the day. We're going to go into closed session and have a late lunch, and uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you all for your input. I'd like to ask uh, County Council if there's anything to report out of closed session. Nothing today. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining today.